Vesuvius explodes. Italy's historic volcano bursts into the most fearsome and devastating eruption in 70 years. Over the fiery crater, a great pall of smoke and lava dust spirals into the sky. A giant specter of endless grief for the Italian people. Suffering under many years of brutal fascism, then German occupation, then Allied bombing, then the devastation of battle, now it is Vesuvius. At least once in every century of the Christian era, it is hurled disaster. The city of Pompeii was buried when the huge mountain first thundered into volcanic life in the year 79 AD. Thousands of Italians perished. Excavations have revealed their tragic story. On the 13th of March, 1944, the lonely volcano Vesuvius on the west coast of southern Italy began exhaling fumes, its peak still coated with winter snow. Seven months ago, on September 9, 1943, almost 200,000 Americans landed on the coast at Salerno in what was called Operation Avalanche, in tandem with the British 13th Corps of Operation Baytown, which landed simultaneously at the Reggio di Calabria on the tiptoe of Italy. Just two days prior, the Italian government had actually surrendered to the Allies, but German forces remained in strength with no intention of leaving. Less than a month later, on September 30th, as the Allies pressed northward, the American Fifth Army entered the city of Naples, establishing Allied control of the region, which include the inclines of Vesuvius. Up until that point, rumors circulated that they might carpet bomb the volcano one step ahead of their advance, jolting it to life as a weapon of war. No such scheme ever took place, and it won't be until a year and a half later that forces of volcanic proportions will be ignited over an axis power. For the troops now stationed around it, the volcano was merely a novelty. The Red Cross organized trips up to the peak. Soldiers enjoyed coffee from urns dipped into the lava crust to make it deliciously hot. Bread toasted in a similar fashion was popular as well. Ashtrays made from coins pressed into molten lava were a common souvenir. It had only been shortly before that the same vendors traded ashtrays stamped with Nazi insignia to German soldiers. Nonetheless, Italian and German fears of the volcano's potential as a war lackey were slightly vindicated when it erupted of its own will while behind British and American lines. Stationed nearby at the Pompeii airfield in Terzino were squadrons of the American 340th Bombardment Group. Their B-25 Mitchell medium bombers were arrayed among the runways when the first plumes of gas wafted up from the volcano. Giuseppe Imbo, director of the volcano's observatory, which the Allies had repurposed for a radio transmission tower, walked the many miles down and around to the Pompeii airfield to personally inform the military command that the cone in the center of the crater had collapsed and that their aircraft and personnel may soon be in danger. Per military judgment, it didn't look that bad, and he was ignored. Yet, even as the gas plumes blossomed into a major column of ash, the 1944 eruption does not seem to have interfered very much with the war effort. Allied bombing raids ran as scheduled, in full sight of Vesuvius' turmoil. As a result, we have absolutely fantastic aerial footage filmed from the bombers as they passed the raging volcano to and from their targets. Looking down and still up at the eruption column, towering high above their flight path. Joseph Gomer, a P-39 Air Cobra pilot of the 332nd Fighter Group, flew by from the more distant base at Salerno and would later say, I remember taking off that day and uh, swinging over the coast. I could see all that red lava just flowing down. It was a beautiful sight. However, the beauty of it belied the peril on the ground. Dr. Leonard Powers, stationed nearby, wrote on March 17th, four days after the initial smoke was spotted. While we were just finishing supper, someone called to say there were huge red streams of lava flowing down the sides of Mount Vesuvius. It was a sight to behold. Never had we seen such at night, usually a faint red glow at the most. As we watched the streams, 
like giant fingers flowing down the sides, we could see a glow in the sky. All during the night and Sunday, there were quakes of the earth and tremendous roars, similar to thunder, from Vesuvius. The windows rattled, and the entire building vibrated. Two days later, on Monday the 19th, Powers wrote, I learned that a stream of lava was flowing down the side toward Naples, so we rode over to see it. It was the most phenomenal thing I have ever witnessed. A huge mass of fiery coals, some 20 feet high and 200 yards wide, destroying everything in its path. There were many people evacuating their homes, which we saw destroyed as the lava pressed on. At night, the sky and countryside was bright for miles around. Flames were shooting into the sky for thousands of feet. Dana Craig of the 486th Bomb Squadron recalled that On the day prior, Vesuvius was belching smoke. It was an overcast sky with the threat of rain. About midnight, I went out of my billet to answer the call of nature. While outside, in a mild drizzle, I was hit on the head by what I thought was a small rock. Suspecting some sort of joke, I went inside for a flashlight. When I returned, the light revealed a layer of damp cinders on the ground. We began to feel the earth shake as though a bomb had gone off. After each quake, a few minutes would pass before debris blown out of the crater would start to hit the ground. About daylight, the rear of our building started to cave in. We then began to see the larger rocks coming down. By this time, everyone was wearing his steel helmet and heavy sheepskin jacket for protection from the falling material. It wasn't very long before we were loaded into trucks and evacuated to Naples. On March 20th, seven days after the eruption began, Norman Lewis, a British intelligence officer, was dispatched by his now worried command to see what he could glean from local experts. He sought out Professor Sadaseno, a leading seismologist living in the area, who told him the eruption could very well become a repeat of the Pompeii disaster. Lewis repaid his advice with a tin can of corned beef, which the professor happily accepted. The entries of a private diary written by a member of the 489th Bomb Squadron and published in the unit's official booklet begin on the same day Lewis went to see the seismologist. The writer records, As I sit in my tent just off the runway of the Pompeii Airdrome, which is situated a few miles from the foot of Mount Vesuvius, I can hear at four and ten second intervals the loud rumbling of the volcano. To look above the mountain tonight, one would think that the world was on fire. The thickly clouded sky glows like that above a huge forest fire. This is a feeble description. Would that I had words to really describe this occasion. On March 21st, he notes that he is scheduled for watch between 0100 and 0500 on the 22nd. He recalls that low storm clouds made the night very black. The mountain, although invisible, could be heard. Rumblings and explosions continued. Occasionally, fine black particles fell like rain. From time to time, the clouds would lift to partially reveal the volcano's cone. It was an eerie sight. Fifteen minutes after starting his watch, he reports that the mountain began to pant like a mighty giant gasping for breath. This continued for about a half hour and was followed by a continued deep rumbling. A huge black cloud in the exact shape of a great reclining bear completely hid the mountain so that its activity could not be observed. At 2 a.m., the volcano seemed to explode. Mighty roaring occurred and pieces of lava as large as golf balls began to fall around me, ten miles from the foot of the mountain. They beat upon the plains, setting up a racket in the black of that eventful night like hail on tin roofs. At 8 a.m., all hell broke loose. Black stones of all sizes, some as large as a football, fell in great quantity, completely covering the ground, breaking branches from trees, smashing through the tents to break up on their floors, tearing through metal, fabric, plexiglass of the airplanes. Soon all the tents were in tatters, with much of their contents destroyed by direct hits. Radios, and cots, and many other effects were severely damaged. A storm of lava and rain continued through the morning, piling up on the ground like snow, 
and multiplying the damage. Soldiers who ventured from shelter wore steel helmets. Civilians covered their heads with pans, boxes, and heavy baskets. At about noon, March 22nd, it was decided to evacuate the entire camp. All personal belongings were gathered, and amid much confusion, my truck finally got off at 3 p.m. The storm still raged. Small stones fell in quantity, and every 15 minutes or so, the heavens would open up with the big stuff. I say heavens instead of mountain, because that is the way it seemed. The stones were lobbed from the mountain, but dropped from the clouds, falling straight down with great force. As the clouds thinned out, the rocks fell from them as their weight became too great to be supported. Large stones fell close to the mountain, till at a great distance, fine black dust was falling. We evacuated through this fine dust, which was now over a foot deep. In fact, the fallout was dropping so thick and so far that the city of Salerno, some 17 miles away, was being buried under three feet of ash. Meanwhile, on the northern side of the mountain, Norman Lewis was again sent out on March 22nd, this time to get a situation report. He drove over to the town of San Sebastiano to witness the desolation for himself. He reported that the lava attacked the town in two ways. The more liquid lava poured into and around the buildings and molded them in its embrace. The more viscous, cooler lava piled up against each obstacle and crushed and pushed it down like a giant bulldozer. In either case, the progress of the flow was slow, unstoppable, and impeccable. It seemed to be digesting its prey like some enormous python. I had been prepared for rivers of fire, but there was no fire and no burning anywhere. Only the slow, deliberate suffocation of the town under millions of tons of clinkers. The lava was moving at a rate of only a few yards an hour, and it covered half the town to a depth of perhaps 30 feet. A complete undamaged cupola of a church, severed from the submerged building, jogged slowly towards us on its bed of cinders. The whole process was strangely quiet. The black slag heap shook, trembled, and jerked a little, and cinders rattled down its slope. A house, cautiously encircled, and then overwhelmed, disappeared from sight intact, and a faint, distant grinding sound followed as the lava began its digestion. As I watched, a tall building housing what was clearly the town's smart cafe took the pressure of the lava's movement. For perhaps 15 or 20 minutes, it resisted. Then the juddering, trembling spasm of the lava seemed to pass into its fabric, and it too began to tremble before its walls bulged and went down. Once the lava stalled to a walking pace, the townsfolk, who had returned to their homes mostly to salvage what possessions they could, as well as to guard against looting, begged the heavens for assistance against this impervious and tortuously slow onslaught. Lewis observed that, about fifty yards from the edge of this great slowly shifting slag heap, a crowd of several hundred people, mostly in black, knelt in prayer. Holy banners and church images were held aloft, and acolytes swung censers and sprinkled holy water in the direction of the cinders. Occasionally, a grief-stricken citizen would grab one of the banners and dash towards the wall of lava, shaking it angrily as if to warn off the malignant spirits of the eruption. The cinema was still there, protected now by a dozen young men who had formed a line and had advanced, brandishing crosses, to within a few yards of the lava. Apparently, even an image of the rival Saint Gennaro was brought in from Naples as backup, in the event that San Sebastiano, Saint Sebastian, could not prevail against Vesuvius. San Gennaro's image was kept hidden beneath a white sheet, so his presence would not offend anyone, especially Saint Sebastian, and he would only be revealed at the last moment if needed. Fortunately, it seems it never had to come to that. Mildred Gillers, an American-born broadcaster working for the Germans as a propagandist and affectionately called Axis Sally, or the Bitch of Berlin, by Allied troops, lauded the eruption over public radio. She may have exaggerated the volcano's damage a bit by stating that, we got the colonel, Vesuvius got the rest. 
as well as saying the 340th bomb group was no longer in operation. But for sure, it eliminated a significant number of aircraft belonging to the 340th. When the mountain finally abated, more planes were rendered unusable by Vesuvius than by the Luftwaffe during a remarkably successful air raid two months later when the 340th bomb group had moved and stationed near Alassani on the island of Corsica. That raid took out 75 grounded aircraft. However, according to Dr. Powers, Vesuvius alone ruined 78 B-25 bombers. The anonymous diary writer cites as many as 88 airplanes destroyed. Plexiglass on the aircraft were cracked, glazed, or melted, if not broken altogether. Cinders had burned the sensitive fabric control surfaces. Some of the airplanes were even tipped onto their tails by sheer weight of the ash. And there are photographs of Vermin using brooms to push the fallout off the wings and fuselage. Elsewhere, and more significantly, lava flows had destroyed the towns of San Sebastiano, Ottaviano, Massa di Somma, as well as sections of San Giorgio a Cremano. A British soldier looking at San Sebastiano wrote to his parents, Where it stood was nothing but a big slag heap of lava and a memory. Bombs make a terrific row and leave ruins. Lava makes no sound and leaves nothing. By March 30th, seven days after the first activity, and when it was finally clear that all was over, Dr. Powers concluded by observing that, Today the wind is blowing inland, and it appears that the cone is much lower than before. Vesuvius is definitely not dead after all these years of inactivity. By the end, the volcano had ejected lava to the amount of some 700 million cubic meters, or 185 billion liquid gallons. 26 civilians are recorded as having died in the maelstrom. No military force in the area took any deaths. Casualties were confined to a broken nose, a sprained wrist, and minor cuts and bruises. The saving grace may have been that the ash cloud poured out to the south, while the primary lava flows moved northward. Had they happened in the same direction, evacuation efforts would have been far more difficult, even perilous. Though it was an eruption of noticeable power, and the best documented in the volcano's history, it was not one of Vesuvius's deadlier events. A particularly forceful eruption in 1631, greater in power than the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption in Washington State, killed anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 Italians who failed to clear out in time. But overshadowing all of this, like a specter, haunting every eruption and never failing to be mentioned, is the Roman city of Pompeii. By the way, the ruins of Pompeii were bombed by the Allies earlier in 1943. Receiving reports that a German division was encamped among the ruins, the American 12th Bomber Command felt it had to treat the ancient city as a military target. A bombing raid was first conducted on August 24th, two weeks before the landings at Salerno, and, incidentally, on the traditional anniversary of the 79 AD eruption. Eight more raids would take place until September 16th. More than 150 bombs were dropped on Pompeii. Two struck the Temple of Hercules, another scoring the Temple of Jupiter, and the Temple of Apollo was severely mutilated. Multiple Roman houses were either damaged or destroyed altogether. One bomb left a crater inside the ring of the amphitheater. The director of the archaeological digs at the time, Amedio Maiori, desperately tried bringing as many of the smaller artifacts into an underground chamber as could be moved. He was wounded by shrapnel while cycling outside the excavations as the bombs fell. In actuality, the German division turned out to be a rumor. Their presence at Pompeii amounted to only a pair of anti-aircraft guns with a collection of trucks, far from division strength, and they weren't even inside the walls. It is evident that Allied command was unable to distinguish between the ancient city of Pompeii and its modern neighbor, where an enemy command post was indeed billeting inside a hotel. After the raids, 
some of the bombs that failed to explode would remain inside the city. It is currently believed that 7 to 10 undetonated ordinances may still exist within Pompeii, presumably in the unexcavated sections. This is based on the assumption that 8 to 10 percent of all bombs released during the war did not go off, and only 60 percent of those duds have been recovered throughout Italy to this day. Though the ones in Pompeii do not pose a threat to visiting tourists, they are a serious threat to archaeologists. One leftover exploded some 30 years ago. Archaeologist Antonio de Simone would recall his own encounter with these bombs in 1986. We were there with our chisels and shovels, slowly lifting a handful of earth at a time, and suddenly we found the bombs under our feet. One had already exploded and was reduced to fragments. The other, unfortunately, had not. It was perfectly intact. Today, scientists team up alongside military engineers, and though the methods of locating and defusing unexploded bombs clashes with the meticulous methods of archaeology, it is necessary work. We live on a planet that is still cooling. Only 1% of its entire volume has solidified, and the depth of this crust varies. It can be as thick as 10 miles or as thin as 3. So look down and visualize what little actually stands between you and annihilation. In some sense, we are living on the equivalent of an eggshell. Earth spent most of its history as a liquid mass, as did the other now solid surface planets of our solar system. Should the Earth somehow reliquify, and it may have done so at least once in deep time, it would be extinction for all. But this crust is a cracked eggshell, plate tectonics. The entire surface of the Earth is in constant motion, pulling, pushing, tearing, crushing, bumping, ramming, and floating on a ball of liquid. Right now you are riding along on this movement. Like the water of the oceans, the magma beneath us moves in what are called convection currents. As hotter fluids and gases rise up and away from the Earth's core, they slowly begin to cool until they eventually sink back down to the depths in a roughly circular travel path. Your refrigerator works on the same principle, and it's why the freezer is generally placed on top, to cool the warmer air rising up and thus help circulate it back to the bottom. As magma nears the surface of the earth, not only does it cool, but the pressure on it decreases, just as it feels if you traveled from the bottom of the ocean to the top, and the gases within the magma are freer to expand. This isn't normally a problem, except where there are weaknesses in the crust. If the weaknesses are great enough, fluid and gas breaks through, forming vents we call volcanoes. As you might guess, these normally appear around the cracks in the Earth's surface, the leading edges of the tectonic plates, where there is the least resistance. And the more easily these gases can escape, the more forceful is the eruption. It's like a soda bottle. The more you shake it up, the more carbon dioxide is generated, adding pressure and mixing the gas with the liquid proper, giving it that creamy color. When you unscrew the cap, the gas is force ejected through the bottleneck until all pressure is diminished. Altogether, these planetary vents, these volcanoes, push out nearly 200 million tons of carbon dioxide every year, as well as other gases along with that. At almost any given time, there is a volcano erupting somewhere in the world. Nearly 50 major eruptions happen every year, sometimes less and sometimes more, not to mention the minor eruptions. Every two years, a volcano awakes that had no previously known activity. Of the over 1,500 identified volcanoes, more than 500 of them have had eruptions just in recorded history. Like the Richter scale that quantifies the ferocity of an earthquake, volcanoes have a scale too. The size of an eruption is determined by two things. One, the amount in both volume and mass that is ejected. This is its magnitude. And second, the rate at which that magnitude is ejected, which is its intensity. Intensity is calculated not in hours, or even minutes, but in seconds. For example, Mount St. Helens in 1980 put out 10,000 cubic meters of material every second making it a magnitude 5. 
the eruption of Mount Pinatubo of the Philippines in 1991 put out five cubic kilometers every second, rising to a magnitude six and a half. Tambora of Indonesia in 1815 was a magnitude seven eruption, exhaling 45 cubic kilometers of material every second. It was an eruption so large that it almost certainly was the cause of global climate anomalies, and the following year would be remembered as the year without a summer, when there were frosts, snowfalls, and even water freezing to as thick as window panes in North America and Europe during the summer months, inducing regional famines. And then there's the Toba eruption on the island of Sumatra. Some 75,000 years ago, it lit up with a magnitude 9, throwing out 3,500 cubic kilometers of material every second. It is now a caldera 30 kilometers by 100 kilometers across, or 30 miles wide and 62 miles long. It affected the climate of large areas of the Earth, reducing temperatures by as much as 4 degrees over the next 10 years, a volcanic winter. This is recorded in the isotopes of the Arctic and Antarctic ice cores. By the way, a sustained drop of 4 degrees is enough to induce an ice age, although it is clear the Toba eruption did not start the last ice age, which was already underway by that time, but surely it didn't help. We know from Toba and other eruptions that volcanoes are fully capable of global consequence, and it doesn't come from some careening asteroid, it comes from under our feet. The Italian peninsula in particular lies over a subduction zone, where the continent of Africa is slipping beneath the European plate at roughly the same rate as the growth of a human fingernail. These are huge-scale movements of the Earth, slow, arduous, of incomprehensible size, and completely unstoppable. This means the region is prone to earthquakes and is littered with volcanoes, some active, others long extinct. This same action is what thrust up the Alps just north of Italy. In fact, Italy is the only country in Europe to have, and suffer from, active volcanoes. Among its most famous is Mount Etna on the island of Sicily. At 10,000 feet tall and 20 miles wide, Etna is classed as a shield volcano, the biggest kind of volcano there is. It also carries the title of Europe's largest volcano and erupts anywhere from once to several times a year, making it, in geologic time, something like a machine gun. Because it is so frequently active, its eruptions are fairly placid, tossing up lava in beautiful light shows of red and orange. This does not mean it isn't a danger to the surrounding area. Its magma flows have traveled as far as 45 miles from the crater. Another famous Italian volcano is Stromboli, on one of the Aeolian islands north of Sicily, after which, by the way, the puppet master in Walt Disney's Pinocchio is named, due to his explosive personality. Etna and Stromboli are only two of the 48 known volcanoes in Italy. There is also what's called the Campi Flagrei on the north side of the Bay of Naples. This is Italy's Yellowstone, a complex of both extinct and still brooding volcanoes that breathe out gas fields and leak hot springs. The Greeks and Romans believed it was the gateway to the underworld, whence the psychopomp Charon ferries the souls of the dead. Both the heroes Aeneas and Odysseus made their visit to Hades from the Campi Flagrei. Unknown to the ancients, some 30,000 years ago it used to be a giant single cone, but a massive eruption shotgunned the entire top off, leaving behind an eight mile wide caldera. The difference, by the way, between a crater and a caldera is merely the direction of motion. A crater is formed when material is exploded outward, as in a volcanic eruption, a meteor impact, or a bomb strike, while a caldera is an implosion of material and is not only uniquely volcanic, but often many times larger in scale than a crater. This is usually from the emptying of the magma chamber that lies beneath a volcano. For example, Crater Lake, in the state of Oregon, is not actually a crater. It's a caldera, formed during the eruption of what was once Mount Mazama almost 8,000 years ago. One so large, it spread ash across 350,000 square miles at a minimum, which includes eight states and three Canadian provinces. 
The eruption emptied the magma chamber below, and the mountain imploded over a surface area five miles by six miles wide. From its highest point to the lowest, the caldera is roughly 4,000 feet deep, with half of that filled up by rainwater and snowmelt. Just as Crater Lake would, the Campiflagre caldera continued to see volcanic activity, albeit on a smaller scale, creating a collection of mini-volcanoes inside the caldera. And like Yellowstone, we await the next big eruption from the greater Campiflagre, which isn't off the books. It is also prone to a phenomenon called Brady Sizism, which is when lava raises or lowers the entire land surface above it, sometimes by many feet. It is often an event that may warn of a coming eruption, as magma swells underground. But Italy's deadliest volcano at the moment, right next door to the Campiflagre, is the stratovolcano Vesuvius. It once stood sister with the Campiflagre volcano, but after that feature was eviscerated, Vesuvius now stands alone on the Neapolitan horizon. It lies on a vast lowland called Campania, like a real-life Mount Doom on the plain of Gorgoroth, and is easily identifiable on satellite images of Italy. In other words, it can be spotted from outer space. Vesuvius is in fact a double crater. The original crater ring, called Mount Soma, can be seen curving out toward the north, the remains of the original volcano that buried the Roman cities in 79 AD. The name Mount Vesuvius followed the newer crater, Il Cono Grande, as it formed inside the old one and gradually grew and shifted over centuries until it completely buried the southern half of the Soma Ring. In proper terms, the volcano should probably be called Soma Vesuvius. I had the pleasure of finally getting to visit it in the summer of 2019. When you fly into Naples, it is literally the first thing you notice. So massive is it that it completely dominates the skyline, alone and rising 6,000 feet above the heavily populated Campanian fields, which are itself ringed by more distant highlands. Only a few miles to the west is the Bay of Naples. What makes this Italy's, and therefore Europe's, deadliest volcano is not just its activity level, but the types of eruptions it has unlike the busier but comparatively benign Etna and Stromboli. Above all, it's completely surrounded by a major metropolitan area. I will share much more on this later. For now, it is noteworthy that once a volcano starts behaving violently, it usually gets into the habit of it. Though Vesuvius' activity goes back tens of thousands of years, likely the first to be witnessed by human eyes is the Avellino eruption of 1780 BC. It is so named for the town of Avellino, where principal deposits are now exposed, some 21 miles from the volcano. This massive eruption laid waste to the entire region, but an eruption that left behind one of the best preserved Bronze Age villages in the world, including footprints left by people, even animals, fleeing the devastation. This is a fully thousand years before Rome even existed as a fishing village on the river Tiber. The Avellino eruption, thus, is prehistoric, meaning it happened before record-keeping, at least in Italy, that dividing line between the historic and prehistoric in any given area. No one in the ancient historic world is aware this eruption ever happened, or that they are living atop its remains. The last major Vesuvian event seems to have been around 700 BC, and may have been witnessed by the early Greek settlers here. But if they did, they left no record nor memory of its happening. With irony, the volcano nurtures the very place it destroys, a giver of life as much a bringer of death. And across the centuries, people here will construct their homes on volcanic rock, using volcanic rock, and farm on the soil enriched by Vesuvius's ash. After 700 BC, or thereabout, Vesuvius goes completely quiet for the next 800 years, plenty of time for people to forget who she really is. Her next claim to fame would be during the slave uprising of the Third Servile War in 73 BC, when Vesuvius served as a rallying point, watchtower, and base of operations for Spartacus and his fellow slaves. A battle would take place here on the slopes of the mountain between the slave gladiators and the Roman militia. One, the rebels survived, but it forced them to vacate their defenses on Vesuvius. 
After their ultimate defeat and mass execution, two years later in 71 BC, people would long remember Vesuvius as the mountain of Spartacus, until newer, far more terrifying events replaced that. Despite its now known lethality, Vesuvius has long been a popular site to visit. There used to be a funicular railway which would trolley visitors up the steep slope to the top, and it's where we get the song Funiculi Funicula, the tune to which you probably know, about two lovers riding up to the peak of Vesuvius and written in celebration of the railway's opening in 1880. It had a double row of tracks and incorporated two rail carriages that counterbalanced each other using the same cable. While one goes up, the other comes down. The railway was finally destroyed in the eruption of 1944 and has never been rebuilt. Nowadays, buses will take you up to a stopping point at which you walk the remainder of the journey onto the lip of the crater. The sheer depth of it is astounding, some 1,000 feet deep and 2,000 feet across, nearly half a mile, representing the damage and erosion last left in 1944. One can still see the lava flow deposited that same year frozen in black between Mount Vesuvius and Mount Soma. Inside the huge Vesuvius crater are visible gases squeezing out from between the rocks, a small hint that this is no mere mountain. But that doesn't stop vendors from opening up shops at the peak or deter even the presence of a pub, where you can enjoy the local wine while looking out over the flat landscape beyond from 6,000 feet up. It's an astonishing view. To begin setting the stage for the events to come, I will do my best to put us in 79 AD and try to formulate an impression of what your life as a Roman in the greater Bay of Naples area would be like. But only barely. The excavations of the buried cities and properties have unearthed volumes upon volumes of knowledge that can never be sufficiently condensed. The amount that could be talked about is just overwhelming. Even what I share on this podcast, as long as it is, is only a pinch of all that can be learned. In the year 79, Titus is only a few months into his rule as emperor. His father, the emperor Vespasian, died that June after contracting an infection, which included debilitating bouts of diarrhea. According later to the historian Gaius Suetonius, who is this year only ten years old, Vespasian would apparently lament that an emperor ought to die standing. He passed away in his bed, among his caretakers, and the Senate would approve Titus to assume Vespasian's role immediately after. It is the first time a son has succeeded his biological father as emperor. Seventeen years earlier, in the year 62, a massive earthquake thrashed the Bay of Naples, causing immense devastation among the cities here. The memory of that earthquake has not faded, and older people wonder if something like it may happen again, telling stories of that terrible day to their children and grandchildren. Less than ten years ago, Roman armies under the leadership of Titus destroyed Jerusalem and its temple was burned to the ground. The destruction of that temple was said to be an accident. Whether it was or was not, only one wall of that temple remains, the Wailing Wall. Troops are still stationed in Judea, and it is likely you may have a friend, a brother, or cousin deployed there, as well as any other of the frontier zones in Central Europe, Northern Britain, and the deserts of North Africa. In Rome, the Colosseum is nearing completion, and will be dedicated by Titus next year, its construction financed largely by war loot from Judea. Josephus, a Jewish rebel fighter turned Roman citizen and historian, is just about to complete his grand historical work, The Jewish Wars. The Book of Revelation will also soon be completed. Hauntingly, it is possible, and some have argued it, that passages in the book are inspired by the awesome apocalyptic eruption of Vesuvius. In 79, no one knows it's a volcano, certainly none of the lay peoples of Campania. There does seem to be some scholarly acknowledgement at the time that the mountain had been on fire at some point in its history. Diodorus Siculus, writing in the first century BC, pointed out that it showed signs of ancient fires that might be comparable to Mount Etna. Vitruvius, almost 100 years later, at the beginning of the first century AD, said it had previously thrown up flames and left pumice on the ground. Strabo, at about the same time, 
and who may have made observations of Vesuvius firsthand, noted that the crest of the mountain was bare, flat, and has the color of ash. He also describes igneous rocks and infers there was a fire in former times. None of them, however, mention a crater or seem to believe the mountain will ignite again. Pliny the Elder doesn't even mention it among other known volcanoes in his natural histories. He describes Etna in Sicily, Chimera in southern Turkey, and Cofantus in far-off Bactria of Central Asia, but not Vesuvius of Italy. Seneca is also equally unaware in his own list of Italian volcanoes. There is in fact no equivalent word in Latin for volcano. Our own word descends from the Roman god of fire, Vulcan, probably better known nowadays by his Greek name, Hephaestus. What we know about the 79 eruption comes not just from the ruins themselves, but from studies of the rock strata found within the excavations, as well as from several quarries in the surrounding area. This is called stratigraphy. The eruption laid down a series of ascending geologic layers, appearing like horizontal stripes in a cross-section, easily distinguishable by eye alone when on site, and by analyzing their composition, it can be told not only what is what, but also roughly when in time they were laid down, almost to the minute. We also have the only surviving eyewitness account that we know of, written by Pliny the Younger, who watched the eruption from afar and was nearly killed by it himself. At around the first century AD mark, the Roman historian Tacitus had become aware of Pliny's experience and requested by letter for Pliny to describe what he had seen. Pliny's response would become one of the best pre-modern descriptions of a volcanic eruption. He had as sharp a mind as were his eyes, and it might be owed to training from his uncle, as we shall find out, that he nowhere forces a connection between the terrifying events and the gods, where myths would otherwise have provided explanatory power. In fact, Volcanologists have named the kind of eruption Pliny witnessed after him, in his honor, a plenary eruption, the worst of the worst. We shall hear much more of him later, but for now, by combining Pliny's testimony with studies of the local geology, we are able to reconstruct the series of events that strike Campania in 79. Looking at a map, the Bay of Naples cuts into the Italian coast like a deformed semicircle, roughly 10 miles wide east to west, and something like 20 miles from north to south, with its maximum radius pushing right toward the east, nearly to the slopes of Vesuvius. Around the volcano itself are the populated lowlands, of which Vesuvius is the presiding centerpiece. Other distant mountains and hills frame these lowlands like a huge crescent, with the upper and lowermost arms of that crescent reaching left into the Mediterranean Sea as peninsulas, marking the furthest boundaries of the Bay of Naples. On the northern upper peninsula is the port city of Mycenaeum. We will spend some time here because it will feature heavily during the eruption. It is the birthing site of the Classis Mycenensis, the Roman Tyrrhenian fleet responsible for patrolling the western half of the Mediterranean. This fleet's prominence is such that it has been granted Praetorian status, and is at the personal request of the Emperor. As a major military base, Mycenaeum is one of the more important sites on the western coast of Italy. It may have numbered only a few thousand permanent residents at most, but with the presence of the fleet, easily thousands of sailors and marines would have been stationed here as well. And like all cities with military bases, the nightlife is probably quite active. The fleet's shipyard is ironically on a lake inside an old volcanic crater, extinct but part of that Compuflagre volcanic complex. It is connected to the main civilian harbor by way of a canal just big enough for a ship to row through. The remnant of that canal still exists even in the 21st century, and I've seen it for myself. In Roman times, a bridge used to cross it just as one does nowadays, but I imagine the Roman version must have been a wooden drawbridge to allow the mass of warships through it, momentarily impeding cart and foot traffic. Very little will remain of the military shipyard, but since it serviced the bulk of the most important of the imperial fleets, it would have had huge piers, wharfs, and slipways for dry docking. Foundations of the Temple of the Deified Emperors on its shore still exist, as well as the gigantic underground cistern, the Piscina Mirabilis, 
the storage unit meant to supply water to the personnel of the Empire's premier naval base. Lined everywhere with waterproof cement, its 50-foot ceiling is supported by many rows of tall columns, and it can hold as much as 50,000 cubic feet of water. The western coast, just minutes walk from the lake, is nowadays reserved for recreational bathing, protected by breakwaters, and I've had the pleasure of swimming there. At the very tip of the Mycenaeum Peninsula, south of the military and civilian harbors, extends a thin cape on which a rocky hilltop rises some 500 feet above the Bay of Naples and falls away to the sea by way of cliffs on three sides. It has a commanding view in all directions. This is the site where Virgil has Mycenaeus challenge the god Triton to a musical duel in the Aeneid, one that cost Mycenaeus his life. It is also where Sextus Pompey, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and the future Augustus signed the Pact of Mycenaeum in 39 BC. By 79 AD, near 120 years later, the hilltop has become the private residence of the prefect, or admiral, of the classis Mycenaensis. That man currently is Gaius Plinius Secundus, or better known simply as Pliny the Elder, an important central figure in the coming drama. At the time of the eruption, he is about 55 years old, a little overweight these days, and apparently suffers from something like asthma. He was born in either the year 23 or 24 to an equestrian family in the northern Italian town of Comum. The equestrians, also loosely called knights, were the closest to an idea of nobility in the Roman era, though not quite the same as we understand nobles in the Middle Ages. They were wealthy families whose sons were expected to begin their careers in the military, often the cavalry, thus the association with knights. Some, however, would seek out safer and more comfortable routes through administrative and non-combative roles. But Pliny took his military obligation seriously. In his early 20s, Pliny served in Upper Germany, what is now considered the Netherlands, in the campaign against the Chaussey tribe. Later he served in Lower Germany as well. During his fourth tour of duty, he was a fellow officer with a man named Titus, with whom he grew close on campaign. They had no idea at the time that Titus would one day become emperor. After his military service, Pliny returned to Rome apparently to practice law, but during the bad old days of Nero, he decided to keep a low profile instead by devoting himself to the least controversial and incriminating work he could think of, that of rhetoric and grammar. In 69, he came out of obscurity to advocate for Vespasian, the father of his fellow former officer Titus, to become emperor. That advocacy won Pliny a line of procuratorships, or financial agency, first of southern France in the year 70, North Africa in 72, eastern Spain the following year, and Gallia Belgica in 75, near to his old stomping grounds of Upper Germany. Now in his 50s, Pliny was granted the admiralship of the classis Mycenaensis, so that by the time he came to Mycenaeum, Pliny was not just a combat veteran, but also well-traveled across the empire. His true passion, however, had always been the natural world, and his crowning achievement, which he has just published the year before, is still considered the world's first true encyclopedia, Natural Histories covering everything from cosmology, astronomy, zoology, geography, botany, agriculture, viticulture, drugs, medication, minerals, and more. A work of many years, it combines more than 20,000 facts from 2,000 volumes by at least 100 different authors, as well as Pliny's own observations during his travels in military service. It is a unique window into an understanding of the world 2,000 years ago, some of it is remarkably modern, that the Earth is a sphere, for example, slightly egg-shaped, that the moon is in fact reflecting the sun's light, and that light itself travels faster than sound, <coughs> while other bits are very antiquated, that earthquakes were the result of underground winds, and that the universe revolves around the Earth, to name a few, although he knew the sun to be much larger than the Earth. Just as interesting, Pliny seems to have also been something of an agnostic, at most a deist. It might be a bit dicey using these modern terms alongside someone from the ancient world. Nonetheless, he is snooty toward polytheism, and though he entertains the idea of one great god, he equates that idea 
with nature itself, that nature is God. If there is something like a person of God, he rejects the belief that this God is interested in human affairs. He was a naturalist through and through, believing that the mysteries of nature could be explained on their own merit. He hails the work of naturalists above the priests by writing an ode to them, and perhaps to himself by extension. He wrote, O great men, way above mortal estate, who, by your discovery of the laws that govern such great divinities, have freed the miserable mind of men from fear. Praise be to your intellect, you interpreters of the heavens, you who comprehend the universe, discoverers of a theory by which you have bound gods and men. Pliny, however, would have been very unique in the Roman world with this mindset, a mindset he likely tried his best to impart on at least one other individual, for he is not alone at his residence on the hilltop. Apart from the naval officers coming and going, and the secretaries and slaves that attend him, he has taken in his widowed sister, Plinia, and her teenaged son, who also happens to have the name Pliny, seems to run in the family. To distinguish the two, historians refer to the nephew as Pliny the Younger. It is not known what happened to Plinia's husband, but she and her son came to reside with Pliny the Elder a couple years ago, and have been with him ever since. Pliny the Elder has naturally taken over the younger's education and tutelage. A lifelong bachelor without children of his own, his nephew would have filled in very well as a son, evident also by the fact that he listed his nephew as a beneficiary in his will. In 79, the younger Pliny is 18 years old. He greatly respected and admired his uncle, so much so that he would use his uncle's family name instead of the family name of his biological father, and would forever live in the man's shadow and accomplishments. He would later write to Tacitus that, The fortunate man, in my opinion, is he to whom the gods have granted the power either to do something which is worth recording, or to write that which is worth reading. And most fortunate of all is the man who can do both. Such a man was my uncle. Pliny the Elder was absolutely tireless, or at least went on regardless of fatigue, he published over 100 volumes on a variety of subjects. He wrote in a very small script, often double-siding the pages in his notebooks. He apparently was an enthusiast of small handwriting, and noted fondly that Cicero had once known of an entire copy of the Iliad so tiny that it could be enclosed by the shell of a nut. This is probably where we get the phrase, in a nutshell. Rather than myself describing his quirks, I'll let his nephew do the describing. In a letter years later responding to Babius Macer, Pliny the Younger would write, You may wonder how such a busy man was able to complete so many volumes, but he combined a penetrating intellect with the amazing powers of concentration and the capacity to manage with the minimum of sleep. From the Feast of Vulcan onwards, he began to work by lamplight, not with any idea of making a propitious start, but to give himself more time for study, and would rise halfway through the night. In winter, it would often be at midnight or an hour later, and two at the latest. Admittedly, he fell asleep very easily, and would often doze and wake up again during his work. Before daybreak, he would visit the emperor, and then go to attend his official duties. On returning home, he devoted any spare time to his work, after something to eat, his meals during the day were light and simple in the old-fashioned way, he would often lie in the sun, and a book was read aloud while he made notes and extracts. He made extracts of everything he read, and always said that there was no book so bad that some good could not be got out of it. After his rest in the sun, he generally took a cold bath, and then ate something and had a short sleep, after which he worked till dinner time as if he had started on a new day, a book was read aloud during the meal, and he took rapid notes. I remember that one of his friends told a reader to go back and repeat a word he had mispronounced. "'Couldn't you understand him?' said my uncle. His friend admitted that he could. "'Then why make him go back? Your interpretation has lost us at least ten lines.' To such lengths did he carry his passion for saving time. In summer, he rose from dinner while it was still light. In winter as soon as darkness fell, as if some law compelled him. This was his routine in the midst of his public duties and the bustle of the city. 
In the country, the only time he took from his work was for his bath. And by bath, I mean his actual immersion. For while he was being rubbed down and dried, he had a book read to him or dictated notes. When traveling, he felt free from other responsibilities to give every minute to work. He kept a secretary at his side with book and notebook, and in winter saw that his hands were protected by long sleeves, so that even bitter weather should not rob him of a working hour. For the same reason, too, he used to be carried about Rome in a chair. I can uh, remember how he scolded me for walking. According to him, I need not have wasted those hours, for he thought any time wasted, which was not devoted to work. In fact, his official duties put every possible obstacle in his path, and yet there was nothing his energy could not surmount. So I cannot help smiling when anyone calls me studious, for compared with him, I am the idlest of men. Such was the person Pliny the Elder. Because the fleet will play a large role in the coming story as well, it is worth digging into naval life in Imperial Rome while we're here in Mycenaeum. At this time, there is almost no need for a fleet. The rival Carthage, the wars against which prompted Rome to commission a fleet in the first place, had been raised and then later rebuilt by Emperor Augustus as a Roman city. The Greek kingdoms in the east are gone too. The only occasional nuisance are bands of pirates, and the Roman fleet has gone from being a tool of war to a patrolling force, maintaining peace in the Mediterranean. Otherwise, the fleet remains idle though the Mediterranean itself is now anything but idle. More ships have been found at the bottom of the Mediterranean, dated from the Roman era between 200 BC and 200 AD, a 400 year period, than any other era until the 16th century. This isn't because of a low quality of ships, far from it, but from the high bustling traffic on the sea lanes. This is a time of immense commerce, travel and movement not matched until the early modern period free now to move within the gigantic protective enclave of the Roman Empire, the Pax Romana. In fact, Roman industrial work will be so great that residue from it will be preserved deep within the far-off ice caps of Greenland. I will speak more about the ships and their architecture later, but for now we'll cover life for their crew members who fill the barracks at Mycenaeum. It is a myth that Roman ships were rowed by teams of slaves shackled to one another as you will see in the 1959 film Ben-Hur, which otherwise is a decent depiction of the operation of Roman war vessels. Needless to say, it is not wise using unwilling people who not only are the ship's means of power, but also vastly outnumber your officers and marines. Naval crews were in actuality an entirely volunteer force. An enlistment in the Navy, just as it is in the Army Auxilia, is a 26-year commitment, hands down. They are recruited from all parts of the empire, excepting anyone between the ages of 17 and 35. So a crew would not only be varied in the ages of its servicemen, but could also be multi-ethnic, even multilingual. You did not have to be a Roman citizen either, whereas the army can keep its citizens inside the legion proper, separated from its non-citizen soldiers in the auxilia, it isn't possible to do so in the cramped quarters of the navy so crews would be comprised of mixed official statuses, with the exception of the officers, who have to be citizens. It isn't too bad of a gig, either, since at this time naval service is a relatively quiet experience, unlike in the army on the frontier zones. Cruising the Mediterranean is much more appealing than shivering away in Britannia or sweating it out in Judea, so the navy is never short on recruits. Of course, that's betting on you actually being stationed in the Mediterranean, which is likely, but some recruits may have found themselves in the river fleets of Germania or floating on the North Sea, suckered into service by the uh, sweet promises of recruiters. It's an age-old story. Upon joining, you're given a medical examination and assigned to a temporary land-based century, the basic unit of both the army and the navy. You may also receive an enlistment bonus, sometimes as much as three gold coins. Basic training includes how to swim, first aid, and the use of simple hand weapons. Rowing is practiced on land, the top files of benches, before at last trying it out at sea. Marines are trained in much the same way as soldiers, practicing a wider variety of weapons, such as swords, spears, javelins, and even slings. 
It's not known if archers and shipboard artillerymen are marines or their own special detachments, but training is required for men to operate these more sophisticated weapon systems as well. Hospital corpsmen are sent for education and training at one of the Navy's medical centers, and there are other places of training for any one of the specialties required on a ship. Though it is not known what the pay for naval personnel was, it may have been similar to the Army, which would make a sailor or Marine's pay 300 denarii per year, if you are a citizen. If you are not a citizen, it may be something like 100 denarii per year. These payments, of course, increase as you rise the ranks. Much like nowadays, deductions are taken from your salary to pay for clothing, rations, and equipment, as well as to contribute to the unit's funeral fund, which is also used to help support men medically separated, as well as the widows and orphans of deceased servicemen. Yet, even with this, a frugal sailor can save up a hefty amount for his retirement, and it seems a sailor can even afford to own a slave or more to help with the family at home while he is away. After your 26 years of service, you will be given a certificate of discharge and an award of citizenship, if you did not have that already, as well as permission to marry. All Roman servicemen were not officially allowed to wed, although many will have permanent relationships and even start families regardless. As is often the case nowadays, especially after a lifetime of knowing only the military, prior service members often find it hard adjusting to civilian life, and either voluntarily choose to remain in the fleet, working ancillary jobs, though not in an active duty capacity, or will settle in navy towns to open restaurants and taverns, as well as businesses connected to the servicing of the fleet. Many civilian residents at Mycenaeum are probably prior service. It should be noted that there seems to be no distinction between sailors and marines as there will be in modern militaries, and is merely a distinction in occupational specialty. All crew members even call themselves miles, or soldiers. But there are notable differences between Roman naval personnel and the legionnaires. For one, navy shoes are not studded with little knobs on the bottom, which, though they're useful for gripping the ground, will cut up the ship's decking over time, and so marines and sailors are not issued the same boots as soldiers. These boots don't have a front to them either, so the toes are open to the air like sandals. As for marines, they usually wield a short spear unique to the navy, rather than an army sword, and their helmet is a slightly shrunken version of the legionnaire's helmet. If they do have a sword, they wear it on the right side, which denotes their rank. Officers wear it on the left. They carry a smaller, ovular shield rather than the convex, rectangular version of the army. Neither do they wear chainmail nor the segmented armor called a lorica that is worn by the legionnaires. Instead, they wear a solid bronze cuirass on the torso in the old style. Their shins are also not protected by greaves. Such lighter armoring may have been arranged for the peculiarities of fighting at sea, but may also be to save money on a navy that really only has to combat piracy. Having checked out Mycenaeum and the navy, we begin traveling east along the coastline, and almost immediately encounter the luxury town of Baye. A little further along is the port city of Puteoli, and beyond that, what will later become Naples, though at this time is still called by its old Greek name, Neapolis, and has not yet gained the regional importance it will later have. Since these places have little significance in our story, except for maybe taking in refugees from farther south during the eruption, we won't linger here. But don't think they are negligible. Valle is a prominent resorting town, and apparently infamous for its Las Vegas-type allure, including beach parties and extended drinking soirees. Figures from Caesar to Augustus to Nero all had private homes here. Its state-of-the-art domed bathhouses were heated by hot springs from the surrounding Campi Flagre, and the mineral water produced here is considered medicinal. A large section of the city will eventually submerge in a sort of slow-motion Atlantean deluge caused by Brady seismic activity, and in the 21st century will be 15 to 20 feet below water. This sunken part of Baye is nowadays an archaeological park encompassing over 400 acres, complete with statuary, mosaics, and roads, all preserved by the Bay of Naples and viewable through scuba diving trips. Puteoli, a short distance away, is itself a major commercial port. 
20 years earlier, this is the place where St. Paul first arrived on his mission to Rome. In 79, the city is witnessing the construction of what will be the third largest amphitheater in Italy, with a seating capacity of nearly 50,000 spectators, outsized only by the amphitheater in Capua and, of course, the nearly finished Colosseum in Rome. The Puteoli Amphitheater can still be visited in our own time. Neapolis is also a seaport and is one of the few Greek-founded cities in Italy where the original language and culture remain prominent, even during the Imperial Age. Though relatively small at this time, it will eventually evolve into the premier metropolis of the region, but we're many centuries away from that. Moving still eastward and starting to head down the curve of the bay, it's a few miles gap before we arrive at the little seaside city of Herculaneum. We'll discuss the minutiae of Herculaneum in conjunction with Pompeii, but it's worth the time building our imagery of the place before we proceed. According to legend, Hercules himself had founded the settlement. True or not, Herculaneum has long joined the list of favored vacationing spots for the Roman aristocracy, looking to enjoy the local idyll, and many famous names had either been there or had connections with the quaint little city. According to Seneca, the Emperor Caligula had an estate there. A scribbling on the wall of the latrine in the gemstone house was apparently left by Emperor Titus's personal doctor, Apollinaris, hailing a wonderful bowel movement he had while visiting Herculaneum, suggesting not only that perhaps the emperor had been there himself only months before the eruption, since his personal physician would follow him everywhere, but also that the good doctor had a sense of humor, as well as the irreverence to deface the wall of his host. It can be wondered, too, if he was really talking about his own bowel movement, one cathartic enough to record for all time, or if he was cryptically telling us that it was really the emperor who had relieved himself. If the doctor was so joyed about it, maybe Titus was experiencing an episode of constipation, which a bowel movement would definitely relieve his doctor as much as himself. In ancient times, Herculaneum rests on a sea cliff facing the west, Along both its northern and southern sides, the city is wedged between two ravines cut into the ground by waterways that run parallel to each other from east to west, and empty into the Bay of Naples. The western bluff, overlooking the Mediterranean, had been walled up and one could access the small beach below by masonry staircase. On the beach are stone sheds and boathouses constructed into the wall itself, used to dry dock smaller fishing vessels. They look almost like large half-circle drainage openings at the bottom of the wall. There are also piers going out into the water for larger ships to tie up on. Another more private staircase descends from the suburban bathhouse as well, giving bathers access to the Mediterranean, but by now that option is likely turned down. The waves below the bathhouse have piled onto the sand, refuse, and garbage, probably thrown into the sea during reconstruction after the earthquake of 62. With few options to dispose of the debris, workers tossed it into the sea, thinking it would remain beneath the surface. Years later, it has been thrown back up and formed a dumping ground that, frankly, blemishes this part of the spa experience. Excavations of the city will reveal eight city blocks, but it is presumed to be much larger, possibly up to 55 acres. Within this live roughly 5,000 people. Although much smaller than nearby Pompeii, it still meets all the requirements of Roman civic life. There are two bathhouses, a gymnasium, a courthouse, and a stage theater. It is also possible there may be a small amphitheater somewhere nearby, hinted at by the finding of a gladiator's parade helmet, as well as a record found in one home with the names of gladiators who had fought in the amphitheater, including one named Herculanisi. Though no temples proper have been found, the nearest to one is the Shrine of the Augustales, a tall but relatively little structure devoted to overseeing the worship of the emperors. It is presumed there could be a temple somewhere for Hercules, the city's apparent founder, as well as a temple to Maya. There is also the partially excavated palaestra, or the open-air gymnasium, it is here that people come to exercise and compete in local athletics. The gymnasium has a street frontage 360 feet wide and 260 feet long, its boundaries defined by a wall of columns on three of its sides. 
The north side was enclosed with windows and a spacious gallery above from which officials and VIP guests could watch the games. Connected to it was a beautifully decorated meeting hall with a room capacity for hundreds of people. The playing field itself is large enough to showcase a row of trees. In the very center, a swimming pool has been installed in the shape of a cross, 160 feet long. The intersecting arm measures 100 feet. Jets at all ends maintain water circulation, and in the middle of the pool's intersection is a bronze sculpture of a tree with a five-headed python coiling around its branches. Each head spouts a fountain of water. If swimming was not today's workout routine or even competition, the gymnasium can host foot races, wrestling, boxing, discus throwing, javelin tosses, and even something like mixed martial arts, all of which are performed naked, by the way. Nearby is the Basilica, the nearest to our modern idea of a municipal courthouse. Though it is nowadays almost entirely underground, it will be estimated to measure 125 feet by 200 feet. Outside the city, on the other side of the northern ravine, is the Villa of the Papyri, a luxury estate possibly owned at one time by Julius Caesar's father-in-law, although that was long ago. The current owner is apparently a bookworm, and compiled a large private library of at least 1,800 volumes, much of which will be preserved to become the largest cache of classical literature in the world. Most of them are written in Greek and some in Latin. 2,000 years later, the villa will still be 70 feet underground, but extensive tunneling by the Swiss archaeologist Karl Weber in 1750 will not only procure hundreds of artifacts, including the library's precious contents, but also allow him to thoroughly map and chronicle the site. The villa itself is 800 feet long. It features an impressive garden measuring 330 feet by 120 feet. The garden features as many as 64 columns and over 90 pieces of bronze and marble sculpture. In the center is a fish pond, 200 feet long and over 20 feet wide, complete with jets and fountains. Concealed below is a subterranean aqueduct and the rather ingenious hydraulic system used to supply the house, the fountains, and the pond with water. The villa falls away on the cliff to a private beach below with its own docks, accessible by staircase leading down from this unbelievably lavish home. This is ancient opulence at its finest, and even relatively small towns, like Herculaneum, showcase the potential abundance to be had in the Roman Empire. By the way, a replica of the Villa of the Papyri exists on the east side of Malibu, California, built by the oil tycoon J.P. Getty in 1954 to house and display his impressive collection of antiquities. It is the only complete replica of a Roman villa in the world, and just like its inspiration and namesake, was built on a bluff overlooking the ocean to the west. With 44,000 items in its museum inventory, and 900,000 volumes in its research library. Moving several miles along the coast toward the southeast, the last stop before Pompeii is the city of Aplantis. It is estimated, like Herculaneum, to have a population somewhere around 5,000 residents. Though the city proper has not been excavated, a number of lavish residences associated with it have been found. One is the Villa of Popea Sabina, so called for an old jar found with her name inscribed on it. Epopea of the same name was the former wife of the Emperor Nero, who had the ill fate of being kicked to death by her aggravated husband. She was pregnant at the time. If this is indeed a private retreat of hers, it is clear it had already been abandoned by 79, and was well over 100 years old. The villa still has damage from the earthquake of 62, from which it never recovered. There are still dismantled columns from the entryway, stacked along the wall of another room during a half-hearted clean-up effort. That seems as far as it got, because the villa apparently never underwent renovations, nor has been sold off. Even as a vintage beachside residence of a former imperial family member, it appears to have never taken a buyer, suggesting even more luxurious homes are available elsewhere in the aftermath of the earthquake, and which will keep modern archaeologists salivating for what may yet be found. This villa, however, is no small matter. It is so large that no one has yet found the perimeter of the complex. 
what will be uncovered so far, is subdivided into 98 distinct spaces, including an almost 200-foot-long swimming pool. The north part of the complex is the abode of slaves, complete with its own altar room, a latrine, and two-storied sleeping quarters. There is also a tunnel that may have led out to the shoreline. A grand hallway, two stories tall and illuminated by ceiling windows, leads one from the slave area to the recreation wing that includes the swimming pool and three large entertainment rooms separated by open-air gardens. These are only parts of a wider villa that is hard to believe was for one person, but a wife of the emperor would certainly need room to wine and dine important guests, as well as house her staff and entourage that made it all possible. Just down the road, 1,000 feet away, is the villa of Lucius Crassus Tertius, a tongue-twister name given to the place because of a stamp seal that will be found there bearing the name of Tertius. It seems to be the site of a family-owned import-export business, which includes wine, given the discovery of over 400 cleaned jars that are lined up along the wall of the courtyard, intended for later reuse. They are turned upside down to dry out. Calling it a villa might not even be accurate, for the complex seems to be more of a distribution center or even a large retail store, lacking wall decorations and paintings. It is clearly not meant for leisure, unlike the Villa of Pompeia. Nonetheless, it is nearly as massive, with 70 rooms so far uncovered, both at ground level and one story up. The villa is separated on its northern side by a street from what appear to be two-storied townhouses. But what it lacks in artistry, it makes up for in other curiosities not found at the unoccupied Villa of Popea. Chief among them is a safe box, one that had probably fallen to the ground from an upper floor room. Inscribed on it is a stamp of manufacture reading, Pythonymus, Pythaeus, and Nicocrates, the workers of Heraclitus, made this, an ancient equivalent of Garcia and Sons. It has a locking system so intricate that similar designs would continue to be in use until the 19th century. Inside is a total of 200 coins, some as old as the late Republic, and others only minted more recently under Vespasian. Also within is the seal stamp with the name of Tertius. This would have been used in transactions, but Tertius might not be the owner of the villa. It could be the name of a manager who is overseeing the business dealings. As history would have it, his name is the one that will forever be associated with the villa, if you will, stamped on it, and possibly not the true owners. Traveling just three miles to the southeast, we finally arrive at Pompeii, itself five and a half miles from Vesuvius. From Rome, it is 240 kilometers, or 150 miles. A really hasty messenger might be able to reach it in a full day, but a more reasonable journey is about three days, up to a week if you take your jolly time. The city resides on a slanted plateau overlooking the junction where the river Sarno meets the Mediterranean Sea, and its own dockyards have long been established here. Even though Pompeii is considered by some to be a country town, it has all the amenities of a major city, and you would be as accommodated and comfortable walking Pompeii as you would be in any modern downtown. Estimates of its population vary from as few as 10,000 to as many as 30,000, but the general consensus is somewhere around 20,000 people, half of which, by the way, are slaves. The city walls, almost two miles long in circumference, encompass an area worth 170 acres. By this time, the walls are more decorative than practical. There is still damage from the stone balls thrown by catapults and ballistas from Sulla's army when the Romans besieged Pompeii during the Social War, more than 150 years earlier. Pompeii and presumably the other companion cities came under Roman power through unusual events. Ethnically and linguistically Oscan, Pompeii had long been allied to Rome, but joined up in rebellion with so many other allied cities across Italy. This wasn't necessarily because they wanted to break their allegiance with the Romans, although leaders of some cities favored and attempted this. Rather, most actually just wanted greater political integration, even citizens' rights, with the eternal city of the Seven Hills. If they had to offer up their sons for Roman wars, part of the alliance bargain in exchange for protection, 
they felt they should also have a right to Roman citizenship and participation in Roman government. Though the disaffected allies lost the war, and cities like Pompeii were conquered militarily, Rome appeased them by giving them what they wanted in the first place. It was ultimately a win-win situation. The specific events of Roman history are known only from written documents by historians and writers of the time. This is the means by which all history is known, either backed up with or fleshing out archaeological finds. It should be noted that most of the Roman writers were not of the lower classes, nor had ever been. Apart from what archaeology can tell us about the lower class, the common people, the vast bulk of the population are completely voiceless. We have to imagine what their lives were like based on what can be dug up from the earth or deciphered through tidbits and opinions about them from the upper class writers. But at Pompeii, we don't have to imagine. Well over 10,000 writings in the form of graffiti, of all things, whether painted or carved, have been found throughout the city, giving us an extremely rare, diverse, and abundant vision of daily life during the height of Imperial Rome, and we can see that these people were exactly like ourselves. Some of these writings may seem strange to us today, that someone would stop and take the time to scribble them, but when one remembers the writings we find on modern bathroom stalls, they don't read any differently. They can be found on street walls, public buildings, inside shops and homes, even on tombs, and express all kinds of emotions, from the mundane to the extreme. Most of them are written in Latin, uh, some in Oscan, others in Greek, and at least one in Hebrew. They include anything from appointment times, warnings to neighbors, and even missing person notices. And there is room for error, with words misspelled, scratched out, and attempted again. They are voices from the beyond. There are so many, in fact, that one exasperated Pompeian made his own addition to all the drivel at least three separate times. I am amazed, O Wall, that you have not collapsed and fallen, since you must bear the tedious stupidities of so many writers. When you walk Pompeii in the 21st century, you are in fact walking an entire Roman city, as if conjured through time, and it's the nearest I have been to time travel. You can very easily get lost. It is advisable to take one of the maps that are handed out, complete with names given to all the roads so you can better navigate them. Correlating street signs have been put up to assist this, because it really is just that big. Every house and building technically has its own address. Nowadays, we don't get much sense of the cramped nature of the city, its top half almost entirely missing, and many of the buildings reduced over time to less than half their original height. You get a better sense of this in Herculaneum, where more complete structures are preserved, where even the doors that remain still turn on their original bronze hinges. Pompeii, however, is nowadays a fairly open city burning under the sun. But in 79, these two-story buildings feel much closer together, and the roads far shadier. Most streets are only one way, large enough for a single cart to pass through, and archaeologists have undertaken painstaking efforts to figure out Pompeii's traffic flow. Some roads are even blocked off with stone barricades, fountains, or public shrines to prevent congestion. Sidewalks are raised as high as three feet in places above street level. Crosswalks at intersections are stepping stones of the same height as the nearby sidewalks, with enough space between them to accommodate the passage of cartwheels. So many of these wheels have rolled along the streets that they carved ruts into the cobblestone, like inverted railroad tracks. However, only the sidewalks in Pompeii are so tall. The sidewalks in Herculaneum are nearly street level. This could be because Pompeii's roads simultaneously act as water channels. The entire city is built on a slant. The Stabian Gate, for example, on the south wall, is over 100 feet lower than the Vesuvius Gate in the north. Rain or overflow would run like rivers down the street, hemmed in by the tall sidewalks, and help flush away any garbage on the road. With so many pack animals traveling daily around the city, it is necessary to wash away all the donkey and horse poop as well. How much human poop actually ended up on the roads can't be known, but with the population producing over 7,000 tons of bodily waste every year, it's possible that not all of it ended up in the sewer system. 
The fact that people did try to sneak, or maybe not sneak, a quick piss or a squat, is evident from the warning signs. Defecator, beware of the curse, or if you disregard it, you may have anger from Jupiter. Another has a more forgiving take. Defecator, may you thus prevail, so that you can leave this place. In other words, be done and be gone. Regardless, both Pompeii and Herculaneum have a vast and sophisticated network of sewage and water pipes underneath the road system like veins, anticipating modern plumbing systems. Running water, and in some cases even hot water, is available in the finer homes by faucet with bronze valves that work under the same mechanical principle as they do nowadays. And if it's not available in the house, it is accessible at public troughs, which are still in operation at Pompeii, albeit through a newer, non-lead piping system. There are so many of these troughs that there is one no more than a minute's walk from almost any given point. Multi-story water towers maintain pressure and are filtered by purification systems very similar to modern aeration. Among other surprising things, we find glass windows in places, and even glass sliding doors. Parts of the garden at the house of the Mosaic Atrium in Herculaneum are partitioned by glass dividers. A luxury piece for sure, but the skill to make and blow glass extends to more mundane items as well. The Romans of southern Italy could eat from glass spoons, rest by glass lamps, and store items in glass jars. The walls, especially within homes, otherwise drab and uninteresting, are elaborately decorated with paintings, which have an understanding of three dimensions that will not be seen again until at least the Renaissance. In fact, some even look like Renaissance paintings. Most of the artwork in these cities are frescoes, which are paintings made on plaster before it dries, giving a richness and preservation to their color that surpasses most ordinary means. Even the poor cough up money to have their homes painted, usually with cheaper geometric designs foreshadowing the wallpapers of mid-century America. More expensive homes even have interior heating systems for those cold winter days, working under an idea similar to modern geothermal heating through the floor. Same for the bathhouses, which are also heated by steam pipes inside the walls. A standard of living like this will not be matched until modern times, and in some cases, not until the last 100 years. The only thing that is missing are self-flushing toilets. Though they don't flush as ours do, at least 195 private toilets have been identified in various places around the city. By the way, they are more commonly found than kitchens, and those kitchens that are found often have the toilets in them. These lavatories do have channels leading to the city septic system, so that if they were flushed, so to speak, by pouring a pail of water into them, the waste is taken away from the residents. In Herculaneum, there are even lavatories on the second floor. If there isn't one installed at home, however, you have access to public restrooms, and if you can't make it in time, there's always a chamber pot you can use, or, as we have seen, the nearby alley for the less scrupulous. Overflow channels from the swimming pool in Pompeii's open-air gym lead straight to the sewer system to help cleanse it, speaking to the foresight and ingenuity of the builders and planned into the very architecture of the city. Similarly, the used water from the suburban bath in Herculaneum is recycled as flush water for the bathhouse's latrines. These public restrooms have no stalls and are not segregated, so that both men and women relieve themselves in the same facility and in full view of each other. Even the toilets in private homes do not have doors or curtains to block them. Roman standards of privacy were not as strict as our current expectations, nor were they as prudish. All athletics were performed naked. Many human statues in Pompeii and Herculaneum are nude. Even the emperors are sometimes portrayed in the buff, to no scandal whatsoever. The use of a fig leaf as a genital covering is a Renaissance sensibility, added to an otherwise borrowed style of Roman sculpting. In ancient times, however, it seems there is a general acceptance of nudity, even eroticism, most famously illustrated at the House of the Fawn, where an entire room is devoted to erotic paintings that show couples in various sexual positions. Don't forget that these had to be asked for and commissioned. Similar smut is found in the House of the Epigrams, the House of Vetii, the House of the Centenary, and even in the public baths. Certainly one thing hasn't changed about the human mind and its obsessions. 
only its willingness to be honest about them has changed. Pornographic images are not so shocking to the population as they are nowadays. A painting of the god Propius with his gargantuan member would be quickly plastered over after its rediscovery centuries later. But he refused to remain hidden when a rainfall in 1998 revealed him for all his glory once again. Other such depictions would be boarded up at various times across Pompeii's excavations. Fortunately, we've learned to live with the sleazier truths of Pompeian life, if not yet our own. Well, sort of. The so-called Gabinetto Segreto, or Secret Cabinet, a wing of the National Archaeological Museum in Naples, is entirely devoted to Pompeii's lewd mementos, much less as a focus of study as it is to keep the collection from tainting the rest of the museum. In 1819, when Francis I, then King of Naples, took his young wife and daughter to the museum, he was so aghast and embarrassed at the imagery, totally unprepared as he was, for his family to see such works as, say, a marble statue of a satyr performing anal sex on a goat, that he ordered the pieces locked away and accessible only to, as he put it, people of mature age and respected morals. This was presumably to mean scholars, but for the right price. Visiting men would bribe museum staff to see the bricked-off collection, which means that Francis, in the end, effectively created a popular peep show. It's what comes of making things forbidden. For over 180 years, the secret cabinet would go through a series of openings and mostly closings in a never-ending debate about what to do with, as anthropologist Christina Kilgrove once called, problematic genitalia. This problem finally achieved a permanent public display in 2005. Yet, even today, minors can only enter under guardianship or written permission. It is literally a room of hundreds of bronze and ceramic penises in glass cabinetry, on the walls, and upon pedestals. The image of the phallus is found throughout Herculaneum and Pompeii, taking form in anything from paintings and mosaics to street signs, and tables, oil lamps, and wind chimes. Penises are even carved into the very cobblestones of the street. For what purpose? Nobody now knows. It is still not conclusive why this image is almost everywhere, but it probably had nothing to do with some sort of licentiousness. To help explain this phenomenon, it has been guessed that the phallus was perceived as a lucky charm to ward off thievery or the evil eye, or maybe to induce fertility and wealth upon the home. In an age when giving birth often went hand in hand with the death of the mother, and when the infant mortality rate is anywhere between 30 to 50 percent, meaning that up to half of all babies born die, a statistic that remains true really until the 20th century, invoking favorable fertility would have had a high premium. In the end, however, we don't really know why. It is cultural knowledge now lost to us. But in 79, you wouldn't even bat an eye. You knew what it was all about. Though it is very obvious where the wealthy lived, their mansions often fill up entire city blocks, it is not so obvious to us nowadays where the more numerous lower class lived. As many as 1,300 potential habitable units have been identified in Pompeii, but by the looks of it, this means that most residents live in a small room above or next to their shop, with few to no amenities like indoor plumbing, heating, or even cooking. The aforementioned lack of kitchens is a puzzle, and it's hard to believe that so many people were living in Harry Potter circumstances. How they cook on a daily basis is a mystery, except maybe simple food toasted over a brazier, the same one that keeps them warm. This suggests that most common people ate out for their meals, in other words, Pompeii had something like a fast food culture. Most residents spend a great deal of time on the city streets anyways. This isn't so much a reflection of Mediterranean lifestyle, but because there really isn't anything else to do. This is a time before recorded music, televisions, certainly cell phones, even the printing of books. Everything to entertain you exists beyond your own home. Thus, there is always enough room for overspill of customers at restaurants and bars, or for those waiting for takeout. Tethering posts to tie up pack animals and carts are everywhere in the city, by the hundreds, still evident from the holes drilled in the stoneworks to prop them up. Private walkways or ramps for shipping have been added directly over the public pavement. 
The House of Julia Felix has such a walkway addition. The House of Epidius Rufus was given a loftier look with the addition of a terrace, and guard posts were added in front of the entrance to the House of the Vetii to ward off intrusive traffic, much like the posts in front of modern retail stores. Perhaps they had to get permission from the city to do this. Official notices on the outside of the amphitheater suggest vendors were granted certain rights to areas by the city council. Beneath one arch, you can faintly read, By permission of the Aedils, licensed to Caius Aninius Fortunatus. As is evident in both cities, there is a housing crisis. How do you fit an increasing population within a finite amount of space, physically enclosed by the old city walls? The Roman solution, like modern cities, is to build upward, though not quite the four to six story tall apartment blocks that exist in Rome itself, many properties in Pompeii and Herculaneum have a second floor, accessible by stairs from the street, if not from inside. Roman law ordained that ownership always went to ground level, so second floor rooms were not necessarily occupied, as it were, by the owner. Renting them, especially those accessible from the street, is common or otherwise reserved for the household servants and slaves. In order to quickly build additions, or even new buildings in their entirety, the Romans used a cheap light construction of square wooden frames filled in almost haphazardly with stones and mortar. Sometimes it was merely wattle and daub plastered over, much like the half-timbered work in much later England. This is called opus criticium, the prefab home of the ancient world. In Herculaneum, there survives such a structure, a two-family townhouse made entirely in this way. It was apparently too expensive to connect the place with the city water main, so a well was installed to be used by both families. Another solution was for the wealthy to sell or rent out parts of their own mansions, and most of the outer rooms of these homes have been repurposed and redirected toward the street for small businesses and residences. Rental ads are found throughout Pompeii. As just one example, the Arian Polyan apartment of Neus Alaius Nigidius Maius is for rent from July 1st. Shops with their own stalls and equestrian upper rooms and a house. A lessee should meet with Primus, the slave of Nius Maius. Even the upper floors of the Sarno bathhouse in the southeast of Pompeii are sublet as residential apartments. Despite window views of the river Sarno below and the baths immediately underfoot, they apparently did not have lavatories, and the baths themselves may have been more of a nuisance than a convenience. Seneca would write years later, while living in similar conditions in Rome, I uh, live over some bathhouses. Imagine the assortment of sounds which make me hate the very power of hearing. When the muscle boys are exercising and pumping the lead weights, when they are working out or pretending to, I hear their grunt. Finally, imagine the hair plucker with his strident, shrill voice, never holding it in, except when he's plucking someone else's armpit and making his client yelp instead. Unlike our city ordinances today, it is clear that Roman cities like Pompeii don't seem to have zoning areas as we understand them. No obvious distinctions between land, purpose, or even social classes. There's no Bronx, no Queens, no South Side or North Side, no Beverly Hills, no West Adams. The rich live among the poor, and the poor live among the rich. For example, the beautiful uppity house of the Vestals is right next door to some blacksmith shops, and its main entrance was surrounded by taverns. Though it tempts the egalitarian's heart, it may not be so ideal as at first hearing. It means the poor always live beside their more well-to-do neighbors, and neighborly squabbles may have been very common, especially if someone is trying to find peace in their private garden while listening to the banging of anvils. The courthouse may have been very busy with civil complaints. Over 400 stores have been excavated so far in Pompeii. From the evidence, there are at least more than 50 ways to make a living here. Anything from a baker and a pastry maker, to a hairstylist and barber, a painter, a tanner, laundry worker, carpenter, bronze and metalsmith, lamp maker, wine maker, perfumer, garland maker and florist, jeweler and gem maker, weaver, architect, and more. You can be a doctor and surgeon, evident from the very sophisticated and apparently standardized surgical kits found here. 
They include complex gynecological tools, extremely similar to modern ones, and demonstrate the intricate knowledge of Roman mechanical engineering as well as manufacturing ability. You can also work as a land surveyor, known by the only discovered groma from antiquity. On shop walls are written the tallies and charges recorded by their owners. Inside the suburban bathhouse in Herculaneum, someone has left the prices of what the Romans called ofele, what we call pizzas, purchased in town. Or maybe it signifies how many of them he and his friends ate. Of course, these little so-called pizzas, not unlike modern pizze napoletane, have no sauce on them. Tomatoes would not be introduced to European cuisine until the discovery of the Western Hemisphere 1,400 years later. Some other odd jobs, made known through auction records, include a freed woman named Nigella, who lived her free years as a public swineherd, and another named Faustilla, who works as a pawnbroker. At least 14 women are listed as sellers in Pompeian auction records. Poorer women were ironically more at liberty to make their own fortunes than their elite female neighbors, who often, if not always, had to resign into the life of housewife, breeder, and homekeeper, though a job notably far more luxurious in its trappings and conveniences. These are the trade-offs. All of these jobs were done by people both inside and outside the city. Therefore, something like the Yellow Pages is scattered throughout Pompeii. One notification says, Lucius paints, and another says that Cornelius Faventinus cuts hair. Perhaps a proud or even tired bakery worker wrote, On April 19th, I baked bread. In Herculaneum, bread has been discovered with the branding Made by Sailor, the slave of Quintus Granius Verus. Stamps of manufacture are not uncommon, as we saw with the mark of the safe makers in Aplantis. Roof tiles on Herculaneum's suburban bath are stamped with the name Marcus Accius Ampliatus. Evidence of goods from the same artist exist in both cities. For example, two large and very elaborate oil lamps of bronze, one found in Pompeii, the other in Herculaneum, are nearly identical, and probably came from the same craftsman and his workshop somewhere in the area. Pompeii in particular was famous for its fish sauce called Garum. The most famous producer is a man named Aulus Ambricius Scarus, and we know he lives in a very nice house in the southwest corner of the city, overlooking the junction of the Mediterranean and Sarno River. He decorated his home with mosaics of Garum jars bearing his name. They read, Scarus's best fish sauce, mackerel based, from Scarus's manufactory. Best fish sauce. And fish sauce, grade one from Scarus' manufactory. Labels found on actual such jars throughout the area suggest he owns as much as a third of the regional supply. He may very well have been a self-made man, living now on the fruits of his labors. You can also be something like a banker. There are no true bankers in the Roman world, or at least we know them now. They are an odd combination of a moneylender, auctioneer, and middleman, serving all three purposes and possibly more. In the house of Cecilius Jacundus, we find 153 wax tablets fixed together in pages like books, recording transactions made by both the aforementioned and by some of his forebears. They reveal that Jacundus oversaw auctions, rented out various properties, including farming properties, and collected taxes for a time as a private contractor with the city. His particular responsibilities were the market tax and the animal grazing tax. He also recorded the witnesses of financial exchanges, which include the names of slaves owned by the public, revealing that not only could slaves be owned by the government at large as city workers, but slaves could, more surprisingly, act as legal witnesses right alongside the members of the elite families. Jacundus himself may have been descended of slaves. For further example, inside the furnace that warmed a set of baths will be found tablets, along with some silverware, recording the handing over of two slaves owned by Popea Notte, a former slave herself, to another woman named Decidia Magadus, as assurance of repayment for a loan given to Popea by Decidia. The slaves would be returned once the loan was paid off, and it shows that humans could be used as financial guarantees. 
Beyond the city and the surrounding countryside, nearly 150 properties have been discovered, and as many as twice the number of people live here as do in Pompeii itself, spread out across the boonies. They partake in the city's government and elections just the same, making Pompeii, in a sense, something like a modern county that includes its rural population with its much more urban center. That slave labor is a considerable asset on the farmsteads is evident from a number of leg irons found in several of these properties, including one large enough to secure 14 people. At the villa of the mosaic columns outside Pompeii, shackles still biting around human leg bones will be unearthed. The surrounding farmland is used for multiple purposes, from agriculture to stock raising. For one, the Villa Regina, near modern Basco Reale, north of Pompeii, is clearly a wine production farm, with its own wine press and up to 18 semi-subterranean jars, which, altogether, can hold more than 2,500 gallons of wine. Another nearby farmstead has 72 such jars on its property. Excavations of the Villa Regina have exposed roots, showing that not only grapevines were grown here, but as many as 80 other species of edible plant were harvested between them, including almonds, figs, walnuts, peaches, apricots, and olives. Farming was much more mixed than it is nowadays. Yet cultivation takes place inside Pompeii as well. As much as 10% of the city is reserved for it. For example, about an acre near the amphitheater is walled off for grapevines, fruit trees, and possibly other foods. It can produce hundreds of gallons of wine, is easily accessible to customers coming from the amphitheater, and has a ready bar on the street leading thence. Some private gardens evidently are used as much for food as for a relaxing stroll. Countless gardening tools have been found inside Pompeii, as likely to be used inside the city as outside for a day job, since many of the wealthier citizens own farming property beyond the walls. As for Herculaneum, it seems to be even more of a center of craftsmanship than Pompeii, including metalworks, gem-cutting shops, and painting studios. Nonetheless, the city's primary economy is still apparently fishing, given the large amount of fishermen's nets and tools discovered in near pristine condition 2,000 years later. The webbing layout of these nets is exactly the same as their modern counterparts. Even the ovens in the bakeries are nearly identical to the domed charcoal pizza ovens used by Neapolitans nowadays, complete with iron doors. The only thing not to have survived are the large wooden pallets to insert and remove the bread, pastries, and pizzas. In one Herculaneum cloth maker's shop is found a cloth press that works on a sophisticated worm screw and is so similar in design to the printing press invented 1400 years later that, with just a little innovation, ancient Rome was conceivably a hair's length away from having printing capabilities. For some reason, this never happens, a technological breakthrough that could potentially have brought the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution an entire millennium earlier. If only Pliny the Elder had known how near he was to the means of spreading ideas and knowledge and mass. There are commodities, however, which are noticeably missing. For the working person, there are no vacations. Only the wealthy can get away with retreating to lavish holiday villas. The notion of vacationing as we understand it is a modern one, as is retirement which has shown up only in the last 100 years. Living in 79, you don't expect anything like a time when you won't have to work. You know you must do so until you're too old, at which point you will be cared for and supported by family, probably your children. There is no such thing as nursing homes. Growing up, you likely had grandma and grandpa living in the house too. There are no weekends either, or at least no culture like we have, where a couple days a week are not worked. Mediterranean paganism doesn't have a Sabbath. You live each day as they come, always expecting to conduct business as you did the day before. The sun rises and falls in an endless continuum, broken only by the change of seasons. Days might be gauged by what you call the festi, when the courts and public offices are open and in session, and the nefesti, when they are closed for business. The thing to look forward to 
were any number of religious festivals, some of which did mean having a day off work. Whether on such a day or during what free time you do have, there is always the easy respite found in the taverns. 118 of them have been identified in Pompeii, and like all taverns, they are as much a place in which to unwind as they are scenes of buffoonery. Painted on the wall of one pub is a subtitled recreation of two men about to receive a drink, but they're much too eager. One calls out to the waitress, Over here, he says. No, it's mine, retorts his friend. The flustered waitress then declares, Whoever wants it shall get it. She then agitates the dispute by asking a third party to join in. Oceanus, come drink. The next segment depicts a couple patrons playing a game of dice, one that is similar to backgammon, but an argument has ensued. I've won, one of the players declares, while the other quickly accuses him of cheating. It's not a three, it's a two. By the final scene, the argument has turned into a brawl. One shouts, You scum! I had the three! I won! To which the other says, No, come on, cocksucker! I did! The bartender, however, has had enough, and he orders, If you want to fight, go outside. Elsewhere in Pompeii, a drunk patron still had clarity of mind to write on the wall, Give me some cold water. Maybe the staff was slow that day. On Herculaneum's main street, outside a wine shop, is a painting of the god Bacchus, surrounded by samples of wine. The names of the samples are listed for the viewer, and next to them, a slogan. Come to the sign of the bulls. On the front wall of one bar in Pompeii is painted a large elephant with two pygmies. Next to it is written, Sitius restored the elephant which could refer to either the painting or the entire establishment. Sidious himself may have been the owner or the landlord. The best translation of his name is, go figure, Mr. Thirsty, which, if he is the owner, is absolutely perfect. Another bar with its own little vineyard near the amphitheater has a phoenix painted on its exterior with the slogan, The phoenix is happy, and so can you be. Establishments like the Sign of the Bulls the elephant and the phoenix were all places you could go for some daytime or evening reprieve. For the wealthy, however, there is no need to visit the pubs. You can host your own parties. That doesn't mean they are any less wild as events in the pubs. In the dining room of the so-called House of the Moralist, with its stone sofas along the walls padded with cushions, the owner wrote out a code of conduct to help contain his guests. Keep your lascivious looks and bedroom eyes away from another man's wife. Maintain a semblance of decency on your face. Be sociable, and put aside, if you can, annoying quarrels. If you can't, go back to your own home. It seems politics could sour a party as much as it does in modern times, no matter how intriguing the environment. One party room in the House of the Golden Bracelet is so elaborate it doesn't even have a floor. Instead, the masonry sofas are surrounded at their feet by a pool, with little niches carved out just above the water line for candles. A water feature of twelve cascading steps covered in mosaic made of glass and seashells allowed the trickling sound of a waterfall to delight the guests. But don't let the stereotype of Romans reclining in lavish dinners fool you. The reality is probably that such manner of eating is rare just as it might get uncomfortable for us today to lean on an elbow for an hour or two, so does it eventually get in ancient times. Eating while reclining is for the most special of occasions, and most everyone, even the rich, usually eat by other means. Sitting is a fair guess. Another option to you, and entirely free, is visiting one of the bathhouses. The Romans put a high premium on bathing, to the point that these structures are often the most sophisticated in terms of engineering. As we've seen, there are multiple bathhouses in both Herculaneum and Pompeii. Some are publicly run, while others appear to have private owners. Pompeii has four bathhouses. The so-called Stabian Baths are the oldest such facility here, built almost 200 years earlier. The engineers hoped to trap heat in the building by limiting the number of windows and keeping them small, thus forcing bathers to bring their own lamps. 
The central baths, however, which are still under construction in 79, illustrate a shift in these building codes, with many large windows made to allow maximum amount of sunlight while not ruining the bathing experience. Unlike the public restrooms, Prudence does seem to begin taking sway here. In the public baths of both Herculaneum and Pompeii, where men and women once bathed together in the nude, the facilities have by now been subdivided into male and female quarters, and the two sexes will not reunite until fully dressed. In bathhouses with limiting bathing rooms, this is managed by dedicating certain hours of the day to women and other hours to men. Male or female, in all of these facilities, even the wealthy wade with the poor, since washing rooms don't exist in any home. Although, inside the house of the stags in Herculaneum, we do find a rare object, a bronze bathtub. It's an extremely marked exception, however. It should also be noted that Roman bathhouses have multiple purposes, and alongside the pools, the hot tubs, and sauna rooms, they additionally serve as arcades with ballparks, game rooms, even libraries. Next to the forums, they are centers of public gathering where all levels of society intermingle directly and without choice. Yet, even larger sporting facilities exist in both cities. These are the palestras, the open-air gymnasiums built for large-scale exercise and athletic competitions. Just like Herculaneum, more metropolitan Pompeii also has an open-air gym, and notably larger. Enclosed by gated walls and featuring rows of trees and columns on three sides, it is 450 feet square with a swimming pool in its center, measuring 75 feet by 115 feet. No doubt, Seneca's grunting muscle boys could be heard here too. And of course, immediately next to the gymnasium, there's the amphitheater. Though not nearly as large as the one being constructed in nearby Puteoli, and still dwarfed by the nearly finished Colosseum in Rome, amazingly, there are enough seats in the Pompeii amphitheater to host the entire population of the city, all 20,000 of them. It has been strategically and wisely built in the far west corner of Pompeii, right up along the wall, so that the crowds don't congest the downtown area at showtime. One of the failings of modern depictions of ancient Rome is the sense that everything revolved either around legionnaires or gladiators. It would be like cinema 2,000 years from now, showing life in the United States as only having to do with the NFL or the U.S. military. The daily grind is much more preoccupied with other things, as it is in the ancient world, and just like our time, most people are not in the armed forces. Historian Mary Beard estimates that, judging from the advertisements, only 20 days of the year ever saw a sword play at Pompeii's amphitheater. For the rest of the time, the other 345 days, it sat empty, or used for other purposes. Gladiatorial combats were a side entertainment, as are modern sporting venues, but like modern sporting venues, it was also big business, and big news when there was going to be a show, like the excitement of a circus coming to town. Never before, not even in the post-Alexander Hellenistic world, are people so free to engage in entertaining pastimes. This won't reappear until our own era. You can go to the races, which are often no less violent and spectacular as the gladiatorial games. Although there are no race courses, called hippodromes, in southern Italy, so it's not an option in Pompeii, Herculaneum, or anywhere else nearby, there is a race course in Rome, which can hold 150,000 people as opposed to the Colosseum just down the road, which will have a 50,000-seat capacity. The Colosseum, in its final stages of construction, also promises the luxury of being canopied, which can be withdrawn or unfurled as needed. But this is to be expected. Pompeii's amphitheater also has retractable canopies over its wood and stone seats, serving the same purpose as retractable domes above modern stadiums, and it speaks to the conveniences these venues offer, one convenience, however, is frightfully missing to modern eyes. There are no restrooms here. In Pompeii, we can see old advertisements for upcoming attractions. The company of gladiators, owned by Aulus Suetius Certus, 
The Adil will fight at Pompeii on May 31st. There will also be a wild beast fight. Awnings will be provided. Another from the same man who put up a rental ad reads, Gnaeus Elaius Nigidius the Elder, Quinquinalis, presents 20 pairs of gladiators and, if necessary, the replacements to fight at Pompeii at no expense to the public purse. And still another, 20 pairs of gladiators sponsored by Decimus Lucretius Satrius Valens, lifetime priest of Nero Caesar, and 10 pairs of gladiators sponsored by Decimus Lucretius Valens, his son, will fight in Pompeii on April 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. There will also be a suitable wild animal hunt. The awnings will be used. Emilius Sailor wrote this, all alone, in the moonlight. Emilius Sailor seems to have been a professional advertiser living in Pompeii at the time of the eruption, one with personality, who frequented the walls even for himself. He identifies his own home with, Emilius Sailor lives here. He also wrote a contribution to a friend's political campaign, and with a little bit of attitude to boot. His neighbors urge you to elect Lucius Statius Receptus Doivir with judicial power. He deserves the position. Emilio Sailor, his neighbor, wrote this. If you spitefully deface this sign, may you become very ill. It seems his threat to ward off vandals from the opposition party worked, for the sign is still visible. We have the names of as many as 30 such men working as graphic artists, including a man named Mustius, who did advertising as a side gig adjacent his full-time job of working a laundromat. He signs off with, Mustius the Fuller did the whitewashing. Not only are there advertisements, but there are numerous doodles of gladiators in combat as well, including one pair of combatants surrounded and outnumbered by the members of the amphitheater's band nearly playing in their ears, and reminding us just how noisy these events can be. Also preserved on the walls are scorecards. One reads, Oceanus, a freedman, winner of 13 matches, won. Erasintus, a freedman, winner of 9 matches, lost. And another, Severus, a freedman, winner of 13 matches, lost. Albanus, a freedman of Scarus, winner of 19 matches, won. That so many were former slaves, now free men, fighting in the arena, may indicate that they had fought as slaves and were continuing on with the only work they really knew, or took it up as a job after their manumission. That an individual lost doesn't necessarily mean they died. A National Geographic article in 2021 stresses that the combat sports of Rome were not actually the sanguinary events that have both so appalled and fascinated us. Deaths do happen, as should be expected when using real weapons, but it isn't the point. There are referees on the ground who monitor the fighters, enforce the rules, judge points, and declare winners, just like in UFC and boxing matches. What those rules were, we don't know. There is yet no surviving rule book or description, probably because it was simply common knowledge. Nobody today writes down lengthy descriptions of soccer or American football to their friends. You don't have to. And if you do, you'd probably just tell them. The gladiators of Pompeii, whether they be permanent fighters or only passing through as a traveling ensemble, were originally billeted in a sizable mansion on the north side of the city, converted into a barracks and practice ground. By 79, however, they have already been moved into a larger colonnaded park behind the stage theaters, modified like the mansion before it, into a training complex with sleeping quarters. Though the names of gladiators have long been forgotten, we do have some at Pompeii, and we can see these guys have a considerable fan base. On one wall reads, Saladus, the Thracian, makes all the girls sigh. And another, Crescens, the net fighter, holds the hearts of all the girls. It appears that gladiators aren't the only ones to get the ladies either. Soldiers are present as well, whether on leave or on duty. One legionnaire writes about himself in the third person. Florinius the fucker, soldier of the seventh legion, was here, but not many women got to know him, except a few, and there were six. Six still doesn't seem so few, 
but either more action was hoped for, or he means to say that many others missed out on him. Another writes, Gaius Valerius Venustus, soldier of the first Praetorian cohort in the century of Rufus, the greatest fucker of all. By the way, the F-bomb in Latin is futuo, and one who does it is a futuluro. We find this obscenity throughout Pompeii. For example, I fucked many girls here, and Salemnus fucks well. We are also told that Orphacris fucked well with Drauca for a denarius. One man named Restitutus begs the following. Restituta, take off the tunic. I ask, will you give us back your hairy Venus? It doesn't seem, however, that Restitutus was the sort of man to submit to, evident by his plea that Restituta come back to him. He had a reputation, and Restituta seems to have learned the lesson, because elsewhere someone alerts us to his guile. Restitutus has deceived many girls many times. Rufus, the uh, so-called greatest fucker of all, is actually sketched out on one wall, looking more like Elmer Fudd than a military officer, indicated by the laurel wreath on his head. Is this also the same Rufus who owned a very nice house near the dockyards in the southwest part of the city? A bronze plaque at the doorway to this house reads, Lucius Satrius Rufus, Imperial Secretary, Retired. A Praetorian presence, and thus maybe an imperial presence at Pompeii, has been intensified by the discovery of signatures on graves at the cemetery just outside Pompeii's south wall, which include some very high-ranking individuals who had no problem defacing private monuments. There is also a tomb in the same graveyard belonging to a junior Praetorian soldier who died young, only 20 years old. Intercourse, uh, it should be said, is not limited to heterosexuality. The Romans, nor the Greeks for that matter, made any distinctions in sexuality as we do nowadays. No clearly defined terms or categories, though there were preferences just the same. Someone confesses, I have sodomized men. Another does the confessing for someone else. Secundus has sodomized boys. One writer not only exposes an associate, but also lets this associate know, and thereby everyone else, that he has done the exposing. Ampliatus, Icarus sodomizes you. Salvius wrote this. In Herculaneum's suburban baths, a lover named Sternus wrote, And willingly we perform the act to which the permissive Longinus consented with pleasure. Quick, carnal union. Some words of advice are also offered, like... He who sodomizes the inflamed burns his penis. Inside a Herculaneum snack bar, someone drew a phallus and wrote beside it, Handle with care. Vigorous sexual activity could be as much a nuisance as it is today. One person, perhaps a neighbor, writes, Theopolis, don't perform anal sex on girls against the wall like a dog. Scribbled here and there are the ancient parallels of leaving a phone number. In Pompey's municipal courthouse, where so much graffiti is written, is found the memo, If anyone is looking for some tender love in this town, keep in mind that here all the girls are very friendly. Good to know. In another place, prices are even noted. Athenaeus, two copper coins. Sabina, two copper coins. The house slave Logos, eight copper coins. And Meridimus licks your vulva for four copper coins. He is ready to serve virgins as well. This speaks to a presence of prostitution in the city, but it's not some underground sex ring. In fact, in the Roman world, prostitution is not only legal, but also regulated. Found in both Pompeii and Herculaneum are references to one Novelia Primagenia. A fan of hers writes in Pompeii, With what joy of the eyes have we admitted Primagenia? Another person scrawls, Here's to Primagenia, most sweet, most lovable, hail! And, to Primagenia, would that I become the gem in your finger ring for no more than an hour, so that as you use it to seal a letter, I might kiss your lips. These are only a few that have been found about her. One inscription in the house of Menander even gives her address, apparently in the nearby town of Nuceria to the east. In Nuceria, look for Novelia Primagenia, near the Roman Gate in the Prostitutes District. 
We don't know exactly what this fine lady did to earn this, but it was well enough to bring her regional celebrity status. It doesn't seem to matter that an apparent caricature of her, drawn on the wall of the suburban bath in Herculaneum, reveals a bulbous head with a long witchy-poo nose. Just like the taverns, seeking out prostitutes is usually for the poor and is not the rich man's pastime. His reality, and it is reality, is that he has his pick of slaves to satisfy him if he so chooses, and their service, whether given gleefully or not, is free of charge. Though no red light district has yet been found in Herculaneum, there are up to 35 brothels, possibly even whorehouses, identified in Pompeii. One particularly famous establishment, called the Lupinar, is located at the intersection of two alleyways. A compact, two-story tall building, it's well known for the erotic paintings above the doorways of the upper floor, perhaps to indicate the speciality of each room. The Lupinar is apparently run by a pair of pimps named Victor and Africanus on this eve of the eruption, assumed from some of the graffiti inside. The writings include good reviews from happy customers, sexual boasting, jealousy between the girls, and amorous declarations of love. Not that prostitution was considered a respectable occupation, far from it. For Romans, it was on the same despicable level as actors and bankrollers. But even in areas of social taboo, there is no shortage of takers. Their attitude for these occupations, I suspect, might be similar to our modern attitude toward working at, say, a fast food chain. You can do it, but it's generally not seen as prestigious, even if it isn't outright scorned. In our time, acting has a romantic and adventuresome edge to it, and is among our wealthiest and largest industries. Though acting in the Roman world is not regarded as respectable work, Romans of all stripes nonetheless enjoy stage plays. One famous actor, Caius Norbanus Sorex, is so widely regarded for his talent that at least two bronze statues were made of him in Pompeii. Another actor by the name of Actius Anacetus, who is probably a member of a traveling performance troupe, is lauded on a tomb. Actius, star of the stage. One fan begs him for an encore. Here's to Actius. Come back to your people soon. He is mentioned again alongside another member of the troop. Here's to Actius. Here's to Horus. Pompey has two theaters adjacent to one another in the southern district of the city, both cut into the side of a bluff. The largest of these two has a 4,000-seat capacity, so these are no small venues. Herculaneum, too, has a theater, completely freestanding, and events were just as frequent and well attended at these stage houses as are the combat sports. By this time, the old dramas are phasing out, and instead mime and pantomime performances are the box office hits. Mimes, not to be confused with modern silent mimes, are actors who play only individual characters. A pantomime, however, plays all the parts, distinguishing characters with a variety of masks and movements. Stage plays are likely the primary means by which people learn the old myths and classical literature, since there are no scriptures for Greek and Roman paganism, and the priests do not preach or proselytize as do, say, the Abrahamic religions. There is no creed or code of conduct either, so you're not going to be bothered by how the gods judge you or how well you follow divine rules. There are no divine rules. Many people probably identify with one deity or another, making personal offerings in little ad hoc shrines at home. But, in fact, Roman religion is by now more concerned about the community's good standing with the gods rather than individual standing, and religious ritual is largely overseen by the state. In fact, political figures often double as priests, and vice versa. That this was a public matter is demonstrated by the fact that none of the temples have their altars inside an inner sanctum, but rather outside at the foot of the temple. This allowed everyone to witness the sacrifices made on behalf of the people as a whole, sparing you from having to do it yourself. For example, the impressive Temple of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva on the north side of the Forum still has its original outdoor altar 2,000 years later 
in what remains one of the city's most public areas. Inside the temple, although removed by later excavators, is a larger-than-life statue of the storm god Jupiter, as well as ones depicting Juno and Minerva. When the temple was uncovered, the easily identifiable head of Jupiter was discovered inside, magnificently bearded and maned, but without a body. Despite what you may think, the gargantuan statues of Mediterranean pagan temples were not actually made out of solid marble or stone. The reality is that this is very impractical. Even the monolithic Abraham Lincoln in his memorial building is not a single object, but a composite of 28 separate pieces. Yet, even if a dissected Lincoln was a shortcut, in the ancient world there are even cheaper and less time-consuming ways to personify the deities. It is easier to build a wood framework, hide it beneath oversized robes or some other material, and only the exposed parts, like the hands, feet, and head, would be sculpted from marble. Pieces of an adjacent statue to Jupiter were also found, but it isn't certain if it was the goddess Juno or Minerva. Minerva, by the way, was originally an Etruscan goddess. Roman religion is very live and let live, even inclusive. Gods of other faiths could be brought into the fold, as demonstrated by the increasing worship of the Egyptian goddess Isis and her modest temple in Pompeii. Found in the sanctuary of magical rites is a bronze hand meant to be placed on top of a pole that displays the attributes of the sky god Sabazius from modern Turkey and Bulgaria, with the fingers posed a lot like the Manopantea, or the sign of the cross, in Catholicism. Even more shocking is the discovery in Herculaneum of a little statue of the Buddha, forcing us to re-examine Rome's connections with the East. Further trade links are demonstrated by a little statue of the Indian goddess Lakshmi, found in Pompeii and made of ivory, as well as the remains of black pepper from India mixed in the poop lining Herculaneum's sewers. In Pompeii were found the bones of a monkey, perhaps a pet or trained animal for street performance. Monkeys are not native to the greater Mediterranean area. This creature came from afar. Discovered with the body of a Pompeian woman was a small figurine made entirely from amber, and the nearest source for amber is the Baltic, just south of Scandinavia. It has come many hundreds of miles to be in southern Italy. We also find throughout Pompeii political ads. We can see new ones for the year 79, old ones that have been painted over with newer campaigns, and some older ones that have been left untouched, like out-of-date political bumper stickers. The two most notable public positions in Pompeii were the Aedil and the two Duaviri. An Aedil is something like a city works manager with a touch of civic cultural responsibility. A Duomvir is a city judge, and there are always two judges serving together, the Duaviri. By carefully going through the campaign ads, historians deduce that the candidates for a deal in the spring of 79 were Marcus Sabellius Modestus, alongside his running mate, Neus Helvius Sabinus, and Lucius Popidius Secundus, in partnership with Caius Cuspius Pansa. Running that year for the office of Duomvir were Caius Gavius Rufus and Marcus Hoconius Priscus who actually won these campaigns by July of 79 isn't known, but the victorious individuals are only several months into their office when the eruption occurs. Unlike our modern Western elections, these campaign posters don't try to sell the candidate by emphasizing what they're going to do for you. Instead, it seems that persuasion is based simply on who can demonstrate the most support, either by friendship, personal connections, or family loyalty. In other words, he who has the most friends must be the most qualified. Some efforts at persuasion do exist. For example, Marcus Caselius Marcellus is a good adil and a great games giver. We are told that Brutius Balbus was not going to squander the city's treasury and that the local bigwig, Caius Julius Polybius, brings good bread, which can either refer to his success at owning several bakeries or maybe to a free handout. In fact, Julius Polybius is so well known in local politics that he is often referred to by his initials alone, C.I.P. What we translate as J is in fact the letter I in Latin. 
We can see mock posters in his own house, tokens of pride for a career in politics. It is estimated that the size of the electorate inside Pompeii is about 2,500 voters. A further 5,000 live outside the city. Roman election demographics are tiny, down to just the free citizen men of the population. Though women, even free women, are barred from political activity, it seems they still have a small hand they can play by demonstrating their support of a particular candidate, even if they don't actually vote for the person. At least 50 political writings directly name a woman or a group of women. One grandmother, by the name of Tadia Secunda, put up an ad for her grandson, Lucius Popidius Secundus, that she might help his running for the office of Adil. In such a small electorate, no larger than the body of a modern high school, questions of voter fraud come down not to any modern notions of hard identification. Nobody has IDs, social security numbers, or even birth certificates. It simply comes down to social recognition. The electorate know most of each other and can point out slaves or foreigners trying to sneak in their vote. Election Day may have been very interesting. Former slaves, however, can vote a means of integration unknown in other slave societies at the time, or even thereafter. But freedmen cannot actually run for office, although their sons and grandsons will be able to. From the posters, it seems too that various guilds, or something like guilds, vote among themselves in a sort of primary to consolidate their votes and make the count easier on voting day, just as modern trade unions will support political campaigns. Many posters hint at this by mentioning support for a candidate from an entire group of people, including support from such groups as the goldsmiths, the carpenters, farmers, bakers, innkeepers, fishermen, millers, barbers, and down to even more specialty trades such as the fruit sellers, the mat makers, the grape pickers, and chicken sellers. One school teacher has written, Saturninus and his pupils urge you to elect Caius Cuspius Pansa a dill. He is a worthy candidate for our government. An athlete urges ball players everywhere to vote for Aulus Vettius Firmus. Religious congregations could also lend their support, as it was declared that all the worshippers of Isis urge you to elect Gnaeus Helvius Sabinus a dill. Even the pimps of the Lupinar left their political support. Africanus and Victor are canvassing for Marcus Serenius to be Aedil. Sometimes particular voters were invoked by name. Please elect Lucius Popidius Ampliatus, the son of Lucius, as Aedil, and that means you, Trebius and Soterichus. Bald-faced political favors are announced too. For example, Proculus, make Sabinus Aedil, and he will make you Aedil. And another, Rufinus, Support Popidius Secundus for a deal, and he will do the same for you. One voter demands, Proculus, give up your office to Fronto. And another writes with contempt, Let anyone who opposes the election of Quintius go sit by an ass. Political smearing is no different than it is nowadays. Marcus Serenius Vatii, who had once run for a deal, seems to have been outpaced by his own opposition, who put up signs claiming his backers were the town's degenerates. One says he is supported by the late drinkers, another by the petty thieves, and yet another by the late sleepers. Even women might be used to discredit a candidate. One ad declaring support from the Woman's Marina for CIP has been blotted out, hinting at the defacement that the advertiser, Amelia Saylor, warned us against. In this instant, only her name has been defaced. Maybe Marina's ad was actually made by the political opposition to hurt CIP's campaign, trying to use Marina's negative reputation against him, and a member of CIP's campaign sought to undo the damage by erasing it, but leaving the candidate's name for all to see nonetheless. It could still prove useful, free advertising with a few adjustments. Vandalism isn't the only criminal activity. One sign alerts would-be crooks, Burglar, watch out! We find a shop owner who has put up a reward poster for lost inventory. A copper pot is missing from this shop. I offer a reward of 65 sesterces for its return, 
and a reward of 20 sesterces for information leading to the capture of the thief. Maybe it's the same petty culprit snitched on another wall. Ampliatus Padania is a thief. In one Herculaneum snack bar is found the spy hole drilled into one wall so the owner could keep an eye on his shop. Apparently, he is having trouble with thieves, maybe some mischievous boys, snatching up his goods when he isn't looking. One shopkeeper expresses their frustration with loitering. This is no place for idlers. On your way, loafer. After the sun sets, nighttime brings near total darkness even inside the city. There are no street lamps, and the only light could be the dim glow from the occasional window or from the door of a tavern open late. Beneath the starlight, before modern electric grids would muffle their visibility, the maze of streets can be dicey to walk, if not at least for those tall sidewalks. This isn't necessarily the hour of criminal deeds, for much of Pompeii would have been shut down and boarded up. But getting mugged, or worse, is definitely a risk. There is no professional police force, in fact, anywhere in the pre-modern world. The first such institution won't appear until at least 1829 with the Bobbies of London. If Pompeii was garrisoned, the soldiers might be expected to maintain the peace and snag up petty criminals. Some cities hire so-called patrolmen for this purpose, but it's merely for security and is still far from the concept of modern law enforcement, let alone criminal investigation. Keeping order really amounts to something like a neighborhood watch. If your home is invaded during the day, it was up to you and your neighbors to capture the hoodlum and bring him before a judge. And if the intrusion happens at night, you are legally free to kill him or her without repercussion, according to Roman law. There is no public prosecution in the empire either, no pro bono, and it's up to victims of crime to arrange a prosecution. Most interestingly, there are no jails. In the capital city itself, there is only one prison, the Mamertine prison, used mostly for political dissidents. No jail has been identified in Pompeii, nor in Herculaneum, except we do find in Herculaneum a man in his mid-twenties apparently held captive in the shrine of the Augustales. A temporary holding pen has been raised inside with the same materials as the nearby prefab townhouse. The door to this new room has a little window with bars to peer through, and the interior has been lightly furnished with a bed and coffee table. Author Joseph Dace suspects he may be a political opponent held here for safekeeping, but there's no way to know exactly why he is behind bars. The door was still locked when it's found 2,000 years later, with the body of its prisoner still inside. Yet, even with graffiti, we still can't quite see nowadays what's exactly going on in the austere spaces of these buildings. They are voices without bodies. Fortunately, we do get some documentary images of daily life. One of the most wonderful windows into that life is a series of painted friezes in the house of Julia Felix. If the graffiti hasn't shown us yet just how little people have really changed across 2,000 years, paintings like this help add motion and flesh to the ghosts of Pompeii. It shows vendors and peddlers in the forum, not unlike the Schlockmeisters, and I finally get to use this word, the Schlockmeisters who still populate Italian piazzas. The columns we see are decorated with garlands, while the spaces between some of them are temporarily blocked off by wooden partitions and gates, perhaps for market day, to create kiosks. A graffito found outside a large shop lists the cycles of the flea market for fish sauce. Saturn's Day at Pompeii and Nuceria. Sun's Day at Atella and Nola. Moon's Day at Cume. And so on. In the paintings, we see a cobbler making a sales pitch to four women whom he has invited to sit on a pair of benches he has set out just for this purpose. Behind him, hanging from one of the partitions, are the collection of shoes he hopes to sell today. Nearby sits an ironmonger, a dealer in hardware. In front of him, on top and around a small table, are the metal tools and jars he has wrought. It doesn't seem he has had much luck today, and he apparently dozed off. Yet, someone bothers to tap him awake, for luck is arriving at last and his booth is approached by a man and a boy interested in what he has to offer. The man has a shopping basket tucked in the bend of his arm. 
Similarly, another man also accompanied by his young son negotiates with a pottery maker. Behind them, a baker sells a loaf of bread. Another entrepreneur has set up a cooking brazier to sell hot beverages and munchies, an ancient hot dog stand. We see ladies out shopping, and they carefully inspect fabrics held aloft for them by eager salesmen. Elsewhere, people gather to read a lengthy public notice, written on a scroll, or maybe a board, spread out between statues of the Forum. In one precinct, perhaps in the nearby courthouse, three judges listen to a woman making her case, and she brings their attention to a tablet held up for them by her young daughter. We see children playing hide-and-seek around the columns of the Forum. A toddler pleads with his mother to pick him up, arms outstretched. A woman, followed by a child or possibly a slave, hands a shabby-looking beggar some spare coins. Maybe her sympathy has been won not so much by his bearded, haggard face as by his little pet dog. This same painting also gives us a clue as to what's happening in the education sector. There are evidently no schoolhouses in Pompeii and Herculaneum, or at least as we understand places of learning, brick and mortar buildings where people gather for tutelage. But there are hints that, though there is no Department of Education or School Board, education is indeed going on by teachers for hire. Wealthy families would be able to pay for a private tutor, or even purchase an educated slave, probably from Greece, to do the teaching. In Herculaneum, for example, practice words are written for a school child on the wall of the house of Neptune. The reality for larger, less wealthy classroom settings is that schoolmasters probably took their assigned pupils to any convenient open location around town. In this case, the Felix paintings show a class going on among the columns of the Forum. In fact, on the side of a column in the gymnasium across town, a thankful teacher has written, May those who have paid me their school fees get what they want from the gods. The Felix paintings go so far as to show us a young troublemaker receiving a whooping with reeds on his bare behind, while his classmates dare not to look, pretending to be absorbed with the tablets on their laps, lest the schoolmaster take his wrath out on them too. Coming back around, just as the paintings give life to the graffiti, the graffiti again give voice to the paintings. We have to remember that these are words actually written down by real people, and we get to enjoy them, albeit in a different language. But nonetheless, the emotion and the feelings behind them are still there. We see that many of them take the form of old Kilroy doodles, 1800 years before Kilroy was ever drawn. One says, Satura was here on September 3rd. And another, Gaius Julius Primogenius was here. Why are you late? Others make declarations of various kinds. Marcus loves Spendusa. On the opposite end, Serena hates Isidore. A warning to a man named Tyus. Tyus, don't love Fortunatus. And when a friendship or romance is gone awry, Saura, you're not acting very nicely, leaving me all alone. A man named Vibius wrote, Vibius Restitutus slept here, alone, and longed for his Urbana. Urbana was clearly someone special to the apparently homeless Vibius. We don't know what came between them, nor why Vibius was sleeping on the street. A man named Epaphra seems to have it tough. Someone declares, Epaphra, you are a bad ball player. Elsewhere is written, Epaphra, you are bald. Other judgments are recorded. Stronius is a know-nothing. And... Albanus is a bugger. One person seems to be angry with someone. Woe befall you. Another demonstrates his dislike regarding someone named Chius. Chius, they say, I wish it so that your hemorrhoids rub together to such an extent that they burn more than they have before. And Samius wrote warmly to Cornelius, Go hang yourself. There was no problem exposing each other's secrets either. Someone heartlessly wrote, Valeros is a eunuch. Another person trolls the reader with a made you look. He who reads this is being fucked up the ass. Conversely, someone, perhaps a boyfriend or even a doting father, wrote, Anyone who does not see Venus, he should gaze upon such as my darling. Someone urged with fondness, Remember the dances we enjoyed together. 
and one close friendship was recorded for all time. We were here, two dear friends, comrades forever. If you want to know our names, they are Gaius and Aulus. Words of wisdom are left in Pompeii by people separated from us only in time. A smallest problem becomes the greatest when ignored. And lovers, like bees, lead a honeyed life. One person expresses their frustration with judgment. Let him who loves prosper. Let him who loves not perish. And let him who forbids others to love perish twice over. Another person similarly calls out the haters. Let him who chastises lovers try to fetter the winds and block the endless flow of water from a spring. Looking toward an even bigger issue, one writes, Learn this well. While I'm alive, you are my enemy, death. And similarly, when you are dead, you are nothing. Even children left evidence on the walls. Apart from the attempts to write out the alphabet in various places of the city, in one home, a toddler must have angered her parents after she used a couple of coins to make over 70 impressions on the wet plaster of a remodeled entryway. It seems the terrible twos were hard to contain even then. That her parents never had it fixed could suggest she had done it soon before or even the day of the eruption. On one wall of the Sarno bathhouse, children kept themselves busy drawing stick figures while waiting for their parents to finish up. In Herculaneum, boys have written their names on various walls. Rufus, Marcus, Florus, Julius, Manius, Sabinus, and David, a name we still use, and this example could be evidence of a Jewish family in Herculaneum, or perhaps Christian. Hints at the banality of daily life are everywhere. Someone complains, I have a head cold. At least two people rooming at an inn leave a bad review. Hosts, we urinated in the bed. I confess we did wrong. If you want to know why, there was no chamber pot. At the front entrance of the house of the tragic poet lies a warning on the floor, illustrated through mosaic in such a way as to look like an attempt at 3D art. We see a grim black dog, slightly larger than life, secured at the neck by chain, standing poised to bite. Just below his paws are the words, Cave Canum, Beware of the Dog. Perhaps most human of all is one inscription measuring seven feet in length, written by someone in a moment of reflection, someone many of us might relate to, whoever this person is. You failed eight times, but you could have failed sixteen times. You drifted from job to job, innkeeper, baker, farmer, book finder, parts seller, junk dealer. You've done it all. Now you're a part maker's hand. Where are you headed? The traditional date of the eruption is August 24th. This comes from Pliny the Younger, but recent evidence has been suggesting a much later date, including thick winter clothing on bodies, thick by Italian standards anyway, like trousers, a style borrowed from the Celtic and Germanic tribes of northern Europe. There is also the existence of pomegranates, walnuts, and newly fermented wine to consider, all of which are normally harvested in the autumn. Braziers, too, have been placed strategically in rooms where they will best provide heat. A coin found in Pompeii could not have been made before September of that year. Moreover, in 2018, excavations revealed an inscription on a wall in charcoal, probably written by a Roman construction worker during renovation. Its exact meaning is unclear, largely because it uses a shorthand, but it could read either as, On October 17th, he ate it in an excessive manner. Or as one lecturer suggests, On October 17th, they took it in the oil pantry. Whatever that means. The only thing that is certain is the date. Thus, when combining it with Pliny's original claim, the real day of the eruption is probably more like October 24th, just a week after the inscription was made. As for how Pliny got the date, even the season wrong is not known. He was recalling it some twenty years after the event, but Pliny was much too observant and sharp for a lapse of memory to that degree, and it is likely that the error is scribal. Before the printing press, 
all works of literature were distributed by laborious rewriting of the original texts or their copies. It's likely that a scribe miscopied Pliny's letter at some point in history, and this mistake would be recopied again and again by others. Pliny's original letter to Tacitus may well have said October, not August, and so it's looking like the real date at the earliest is in fact October 24th, 79 AD. On this day, the sun rises to a cool autumn morning. It is a clear sky, as is typical of southern Italy, with maybe the barest clouds. At a time before alarm clocks, visual cues are what wakes you up, or a really good body clock. Life is organized around the position of the sun and the length of shadows, rather than an hour hand or a digital number, unless, of course, you are wealthy enough, like the owners of the House of the Gem in Herculaneum, to afford a clock powered by water. The simplest variety worked like an hourglass, while more sophisticated models have dials with a pointer to specify the hour. Nonetheless, with the appearance of daylight, life in Campania awakes to repeat its daily drudgery. Smoke starts to rise from bakeries preparing fresh product, shops open their doors and set up their goods before the arrival of customers. Tradesmen get to work, hammering and tinkering in smithies. Fishermen, among the earliest risers, have already been preparing their boats and nets at the dockyards. Managers look over paperwork and manifests to start orchestrating the day's business. In the countryside, slaves begin tending to autumnal tasks around the agricultural estates, perhaps finalizing the harvests. Nobody knows that 24 hours from now, everything around them will have been turned into a moonscape. Pliny the Younger testifies that minor convulsions of the earth had been happening in the days prior. This is demonstrated by all the renovation projects that will soon be cut short. These projects were earlier attributed by archaeologists and historians to damage from the earthquake of 62. But why it took nearly 17 years to complete, even start these projects, evaded explanation. The cracked walls and other light damage to buildings are better explained by Vesuvian activity in the days, even weeks, before the eruption. Because tremors are a common feature of Campania, nobody was particularly alarmed. Certainly, no one associates them with the mountain. The terrifying earthquake of 62 itself may possibly have been a result of lava movements beneath Vesuvius, but an interval of almost two decades is much too great for anyone to connect those dots. Foresight for such an event isn't even possible. The knowledge just isn't there. Natural phenomena are regarded as singularities. This is still a time when it's not understood how storms are created or why the seasons change or what causes disease. Myths and legends serve to fill these gaps and, among most people anyways, continue to dominate the best efforts of Greek and Roman thinkers to explain otherwise. Throughout the morning of October 24th, small quakes are felt, vibrating desks, rooftops, wobbling jars and tableware as huge volumes of material move deep down below, shoving, hauling, wrenching, and tearing underfoot. Few people give any heed to these earth-rupturing forces, because by the time the seismic waves have traveled through the crust, they are muted into seemingly inconsequential shivers. Along the shore, gas bubbles trickle to the surface of the water, something you can see even nowadays in the Bay of Naples, but possibly exacerbated by the mounting pressure below. If any fishermen or sailors were concerned, we cannot say for sure, but no warning seems to have been raised. No one is going to panic over bubbles. But two to four miles below them, lava has been pressurizing inside a well three miles cubed and starting to push up toward the surface as cracks rupture in the thin nozzle leading to the tip of Vesuvius. The forces crushing it are so great that rock, already melted into a liquid, is now turning into something like foam. At that depth too, deep earth water, no matter how hot it becomes, does not boil. Even natural gases, like hydrogen, are pressed into a thick, oily fluid. As the frothy lava crawls through the crust, 
The low pressure of the outside air surrounding Vesuvius acts as a vacuum, coaxing out the contents already being heaved up from below. Yet, people go about their business oblivious to the strange chemical and physical events at work just beneath their feet over an enormous surface area. By 10 a.m., the hot volcanic suds has risen high enough to begin boiling rainwater saturated in the soil above. Plumes of pressurized steam burst at the top and sides of the mountain, weakening the two-mile-deep cork that is already failing to hold the force below. With this phreatomagmatic phase, Vesuvius is beginning to wake from 800 years of slumber. The explosions cause the ground to reel around the volcano. Directly on its slope is the fine estate of a wealthy woman named Rectina. Pliny the Younger says she is married to a man named Bassus, who may possibly be the Roman lyric poet Gaius Cecius Bassus, and who is said to have died in the forthcoming eruption. But other translations give his name as Tascius or Tascus. Both Rectina and her husband start to fear for their safety as the villa shakes and shudders. The earthquakes here are fiercer than anything in at least two decades. From their proximity to the mountain, they have a better sense of the potential danger than the city's miles away as the couple look up at the growing steam cloud, which drifts off lazily to the east, away from the Bay of Naples. They don't understand what is happening, but they have seen enough to decide it's time to clear out. The pair quickly organize their slaves to begin gathering their prized possessions. Rectina also decides to send word for help. She spends a few nervous minutes to write, perhaps through dictation, to a friend of both her and her husband. That friend is Admiral Pliny the Elder. We don't know the means by which she would dispatch this letter, but it is likely she sends a rider on horseback with the letter to either make the route by land or to head down to the coast and commandeer a boat to sail across the bay. The latter is presumably the swiftest course, making a beeline on the water for Mycenum versus following the long roads around the bay. Even still, it will be a few hours before this courier can reach Rectina's powerful friend and not a moment more can be wasted. Why she and her husband don't go in this manner themselves is unknown, but maybe they sought to oversee the collection and transportation of their wealth, risking their own lives and the lives of their slaves, to keep a hold on all that made their life influential and pleasurable, urging the slaves to be careful with this and to not break that. Perhaps carts are loaded up with valuables. We don't know either exactly where Rectina intends to meet up with Pliny the Elder. His nephew doesn't say, but seeing as she is making an overture to the commander of the fleet, she clearly intends to rendezvous with him somewhere along the coast, perhaps at Aplantis, and flee by water. Unfortunately, we will never learn what becomes of her or her husband, but the letter she sends puts into motion important decisions that will affect the lives of many people. While Rectina is packing up amid her teetering home and her messenger is embarking on his journey, further afield, the steam cloud may have caught the attention of a few curious onlookers in the various cities of Campania. It probably looks like a large, pale weather cloud surrounding the summit of Vesuvius, or like a fog on its slopes. Even fewer may have drawn a connection between this strange plume on the mountain and the morning's tremors. And so business goes on as usual, but with something new to make small talk about. It is not abnormal in the moments before an earthquake or a tsunami for animals to sense the danger before their human counterparts. You can find plenty of videos of it. Perhaps in those final seconds, a jittery horse or a dog bolting off down the street or through the house may have caught the attention of confused owners and passers-by. The last visible warning of what is about to happen. At around noon, just as housewives or servants are fixing lunch and restaurants preparing for hungry customers, foam magma breaches the cap of Vesuvius's throat and the mountain erupts, releasing a thermal energy worth 100,000 atomic bombs. If you just so happened to be looking toward it at that very moment, you would likely have seen a spire of ash blossom forcefully and, at this distance, quietly from the peak, then stalled to lift slowly on the air. But most people are probably not looking. Their first impression would be the shockwave.
The explosion has ripped apart a crater more than half a mile wide. Vesuvius is now a direct and open link to the Earth's core. In the age before gunpowder, no one has heard anything like it. The concussion, that shockwave, is no doubt heard, perhaps even felt, in nearby Herculaneum. Young athletes either working out or competing in the open-air gym drop the five-pound stone weights they were hurling, never to pick them up again. In the villa of the papyri, a person in the exit hall from the garden drops a gathering of scrolls belonging to the library. A groundskeeper at the forum baths is so spooked he lets go of the iron prod he was using to stoke the furnace that warms the hot tubs. Just around the corner in the same building, a woman, perhaps a young girl, was scratching the Latin alphabet on the wall of the ladies' waiting room. She was interrupted at the letter Q. The shockwave may have also been audible in more distant to Plantis and Pompeii like a ferocious thunder. Inside a large home in Pompeii, a team of three or four painters are halfway complete with a commission when they are startled enough that one of them knocks their scaffolding and a bucket of paint splashes against the wall. Shaken and alarmed, people peer out of their homes, glance around in open markets. Within minutes, some point out a towering column of dense gray-white smoke rising from the mountain, pushing through the few clouds into the sky. People begin to congregate in the forums, intersections, balconies, north and westbound streets, wherever the sight might be visible, gawking and marveling with each other, wondering what it is all about and if it's connected to the explosion they heard. Some may even be feeling a sense of danger, not knowing quite what danger it poses, but thinking this can't be good. It is likely, however, that some people, after taking in this latest view and exchanging the curiosity with each other, still continue with their daily routines. At the crater, the column of ash rises to two miles high, steadily pushing to five miles, eight, twelve, up to sixteen miles, reaching the stratosphere, almost halfway to outer space as defined by the Kármán line. The volcano now acts like a jet engine. Not only is all the pressure that has been building below it firing material upward, it is intensified by the weight of the volcano itself as gravity heaves some two miles diameter of mountain down against the magma well, adding to the ejection force. The low pressure of the surrounding atmosphere, as mentioned before, helps to suck out the contents underground. Vesuvius quakes and rumbles as she starts to put out 1,000 tons of deep earth material every second, rocketing at twice the speed of sound for at least the first two miles above the crater rim. This will continue for the next 24 hours. You can do the math, an unbelievable amount of solid exhaust at incomprehensible force. However, the sum you get is the barest minimum, because, as we shall see, this thrust is only a tenth of the ejection mass and volume to come. We're only getting started. And it all needs to go somewhere. Just as gravity helps jettison the magma pool, it also works against the eruption column. As the column reaches 18 miles into the sky, 19 miles, possibly up to 21 miles, or 33 kilometers, the thin air can no longer hold up all that material against the press of gravity and the column begins to fan out at the top like a table. Had this happened just a couple months earlier, the breeze would have pushed it west across the Bay of Naples. But today, in mid-autumn, the high-altitude stratospheric winds instead guide it directly south, rolling out high over the Campanian countryside, straight for Aplantis, Pompeii, and the highlands of the Amalfi beyond. Across the bay, Pliny the Elder is sitting at his desk, barefooted and penning more notes. Perhaps his original copy of Natural Histories is resting nearby, no doubt a token of pride. He doesn't seem to have bothered this morning to entertain an unnamed friend visiting him from Spain, perhaps giving the man space to relax for a time in the Campania Nadil. Instead, he had spent the early hours of the day going through his normal routine, 
warming in the sun, recovering in a cold bath, and lounging while he ate what was probably a light early lunch. Now engrossed in the work in his office, he hears footsteps on the stone floor. A slave enters the room and announces that Pliny's sister, Plinia, is requesting his presence. Perhaps annoyed at being broken from his focus, he sets his pen down and calls for his sandals to see what this is all about. When he finds her, she is standing with her son, Pliny the Younger. Both of them are staring in wonder beyond the columns, and Pliny appoints the elder's attention east across the bay. He must have been awestruck. A strong mirage appears to have developed in the heat of midday, because the sight isn't crystal clear, and much of what can be seen is obscured in bluish atmospheric haze. He can observe what appears to be a gigantic tower of thick smoke spreading out at the top, as his nephew would later describe, like an umbrella pine. Just as during the 1944 eruption, metaphors of animals and other objects, often personified as if the volcano has a mind and will of its own, seem to be the only way people can describe what they're seeing. And Pliny the Younger picked the image of an umbrella pine tree, which could not be more accurate. If you've ever seen one, and you will if you visit southern Italy, an umbrella pine is an exceedingly tall tree, perhaps 50 or 60 feet, with a bare trunk that extends straight up until topping out with a broad fan of pine branches, looking like, well, an umbrella. Both the younger Pliny and his mother had been trying to figure out where the smoke was coming from exactly. At this angle, their vantage point looks almost directly along the coastline, so there are many hills, smaller peninsulas, even islands between them and the volcano. But Pliny the Elder suspects right away it must be coming from distant Vesuvius. Though he has never seen a volcanic eruption himself, he has read enough to know exactly what it is, and now he gets to witness one himself. He is one of the few people, perhaps the only person in the entire area, who can say with some certainty what's happening. His irritability immediately turns to boyish excitement. His nephew tells us that he springs into action. He calls for a ship to be readied so he can make closer observations, perhaps to add in some future revision of natural histories, which he must be frustrated now to have published before today's sighting and the revelations just waiting to be found therein. That he wants to get closer may speak to an inner daredevil, but maybe even he, too, was completely misjudging the danger, not realizing the revelations that really would be waiting for him. In his natural histories, he stressed that the gifts of nature exist to benefit man. Today, he will see that nature's gifts can be of a different kind. He is so unaware that he even asks his young nephew if he wants to go with him. A normal 18-year-old would have jumped at the opportunity for such an adventure, but Pliny the Younger says he declined the offer, opting instead to stay home and continue with his studies of Livy's Roman history, which his uncle had assigned to him. In other words, he would rather do homework than explore a volcanic eruption. Uncle Pliny must have been irked and confused by his nephew's timidity, and annoyed further still by his sister's possible reassurance of her son's good judgment, a mother's concern, but it does not deter him from going forward in organizing his scientific expedition. Meanwhile, the cloud continues to spread toward the south. It is so dense that it blots out the sun entirely, and as its reach slowly extends over the landscape, day becomes as night. This is still a time of omens, and when a solar eclipse, or an earthquake, or even the mere flight pattern of a bird could be a message from the beyond, a sight so spectacular as this must be the voice of the gods. Indeed, loud booms can be heard rumbling across Campania, seemingly from everywhere. Just as terrifying are the bolts of blue and purple volcanic lightning, as if from Jupiter himself, that streak the eruption column. As material is pushed into the atmosphere, every single particle, millions of tons worth by now, creates a static charge as it hits and rubs the others next to it on its 21-mile hike into the sky. Occasionally, there's a discharge, and electricity flashes bright from one end to the other. As the world slowly darkens, 
Ash begins falling from the cloud above, blanketing rooftops and streets in a thin coat of snowy-looking substance. Volcanic ash, however, is not the same as dust or the cinders from a campfire. It is sharp, fragmentary bits of glass and crystals, like fiberglass and home insulation. And just like home insulation, you don't want to breathe it in. This is knowledge, however, the ancients don't have. Nonetheless, most people in Pompeii and Aplantis decide they had better not stay, lest the gods have more in mind. This experience is terrifying enough. 5,000 people in Aplantis and 20,000 people in Pompeii suddenly have to decide what they're going to do, not to mention the tens of thousands across the countryside. If they leave, how will they do it? By boat? Perhaps on foot? Where should they go? The nearest city is miles away. Where is it even safe? To the east? To the north? The south? What should they take with them? And how long will it last? They have to consider their families, their children, who are already asking questions they can't answer. They may have extended family in the city too, as well as close friends and neighbors. How are we going to move grandma and grandpa? They are slow to walk, if not in direct need of assistance. The kids are worried too about the dog. Fleeing the city is a big decision for many. The buildings already provide shelter, and there is no telling what the cloud will bring, which has by now made traveling the same as traveling at night. If you are a slave, the decision is no less dicey. You're terrified of what you don't understand. Nobody else seems to understand it either. In fact, they don't. Will you follow your master's decision, hoping it's good judgment, and remain with what you know? Or will you try to run for it, to risk discovery and the punishment to follow, in exchange for safety from Vesuvius? What will happen if you do run away? Let alone, where can a slave go at all? No doubt, some people try their luck and hurry out on foot, passing through the city gates laden with personal possessions and family, or even none at all. Carts are wheeled through the streets, trying to navigate people as they hurry to link up with relatives or friends, ignoring normal traffic patterns. One delivery cart full of wine jars is abandoned at the shipping and receiving entrance of the house of Menander. Apparently, the horses pulling it were untethered and presumably mounted for a quicker escape, the riders completely giving up their valuable inventory. One woman heads to the Nola gate on the north wall, urging her male slave to keep up. It wouldn't be so tough if his legs were freed of their shackles. Someone leaves dirty gardening tools in an elaborate dining room, perhaps in the mayhem of trying to figure out what to bring with them. A baker named Marcus, or so the sign says outside his shop, apparently leaves in such haste that he doesn't even bother to put out his ovens, which are cooking some 81 loaves of bread. They will be found centuries later, very burnt, but still intact, with Marcus nowhere to be found. Maybe he went to join other people collecting on the docks at Pompey's port, just as they are at the port of Aplantis, hoping to barter for a ride out of town. Shipmasters and fishermen may have required no fee on this fearsome day, themselves eager to leave, but maybe some of them saw a lucrative business opportunity. Given that the wind is blowing south, however, their only real course is to sail in that direction, around the lower lip of the bay and the island of Capri. What little sunlight still can be seen is to the west. There um, is a terrifying video filmed by hiker Dave Crockett during the Mount St. Helens eruption. It is so dark, you can't even see the trees beside him or the road at his feet, and it is no different than if he had just left the lens cap on. The only visible light comes from the distant edge of St. Helens exhaust, looking like a small whitish oval on the horizon, and giving the illusion that it's shrinking, which it may have been. Crockett's narration in the video might very well stand in for the thoughts of the people of Pompeii and Aplantis, especially those trying to escape by land, so I'll play it for you. Well, dear God, whoever finds this, I don't know, oh, you can't see this, I'm sure it's, it's too dark. I've left the car behind. Rest of the gear, we got one magazine. And as you can tell probably from this picture, I'm walking towards the only light I can see on top of a ridge. 
can hear the mountain behind me rumbling. It's an enormous mud and water, so I came down and washed out the road. I never really thought I'd believe this or, or say this, but at this moment, I honest to God believe I'm dead. There's really no, no way to describe those feelings. I feel the ash now in my eyes. It's getting very hard to breathe. Burns to breathe. I'm having trouble talking. It's burns to breathe. It burns my eyes. Oh dear God. My God, this is hell. I just can't describe it. It's pitch black. Just pitch black. This is, this is hell on earth I'm walking through. Yeah, I got the wrong attitude here. Man, this would be something to tell my grandchildren about. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Torches and lamps light the way. Some of the residents may have sought out solace in religion. People render an offering at their household shrine or stop by the temples to see what sense the priests make of all of this. No doubt, the priesthood is busy invoking the gods and giving what answers they can to the endless questions. The priests at the Temple of Isis have had to abandon the meal they were making just an hour or two earlier. The city Adil and the Dwaviri must have been pestered for what direction and instructions they could give everyone, all the while trying to figure it out for themselves and their own families. Suddenly, rocks begin to fall. People quickly duck beneath awnings, the eaves of rooftops, or any other nearby shelter. Some individuals too far from cover are bonked on their heads, but, to their surprise, feel almost nothing. They pick up one or two in their hands as the stones accumulate on the ground around their feet. Despite being anywhere from the size of acorns to bird eggs, there is almost no weight to them, but they indeed look like white-colored rocks. Even more startling, they can be seen floating in the public water troughs, fountains, and private pools, creating little to no splash on impact. Some people may <laughs> even laugh at themselves for having panicked at first. Later signs will give such stones a name, pumice, a honeycombed lightweight stone and the only stone in the world that is known to float, as if made of styrofoam. So when a peasant in the film Monty Python and the Holy Grail suggests very small rocks, to Sir Bedivere's question, what else flutes in water, he's not entirely incorrect. Technically, these rocks are more akin to glass. When the lava was turned into a fizzy mess beneath Vesuvius and then force ejected, the raging hot fizz rapidly cools on its escape and is turned into billions of little pieces of volcanic glass. Of course, the Romans don't know this and it must have been a strange sign indeed that it's raining rocks, and rocks that seem almost magical. And then there's a crash, another, and then another, as heavier, more dense rocks begin joining the otherwise harmless hailstorm of popcorn. Anyone still outside hurries for the nearest building. Terracotta roof shingles are cracked and splintered. Thuds are heard overhead. Household fountains and ponds burst with sporadic impact as these new lithics strike down at terminal velocity about 150 miles per hour or 220 feet per second. Fortunately, they make up only 10% of the fallout, but residents stare out of their windows and open doorways, goggling fearfully at this strange phenomenon. To venture out now is clearly dangerous. Some people lie unconscious or even dead in the street. Just outside the Nola Gate on the north wall at Pompeii, one man is struck and collapses, but the terror of joining his fate is so much that the people huddling just a few feet from him next to the tomb of Asquilia Polia don't even try to pull him out from under the barrage. Another man only makes it 100 feet beyond the gate before he is killed beside the stele of Suedius Clemens. He was heading straight for Vesuvius, perhaps demonstrating how hard it is to tell where you are going even so early in the eruption. Those residents that still remain are reconsidering any effort to leave, watching the pumice slowly bury the bodies on the street. We know that at least a couple thousand in Pompeii do choose to wait it out and stay home. 
They may have been the wiser, for the thousands more who have left the city now find themselves caught out in the open, far from cover. We might imagine refugees desperately pressing up against the strongest trees, or fighting for space beneath someone else's wagon. As for the people sheltering inside Pompeii and Aplantis, they may exhibit what author Charles Pellegrino has called the Edith Russell response, where, in the face of peril or even death, some people go on cool and collected, as if there is nothing to fear, and soothe themselves with familiar tasks and settings. In other words, it's no big deal, you're just being a worry wart. Edith Russell, or more accurately Edith Rosenbaum, who changed her last name during post-war anti-German sentiment in the 1920s, was a well-known fashion designer who was on the Titanic. She famously returned to her suite to tidy up, where she took her time making the bed, folding clothes in the drawers and closet, and locking up trunks while the ship was already heavy with water and tilting toward the bow. She also placed a glass on the mantelpiece, which would be found in later deep-sea explorations of the ship, miraculously right where she left it. Historian Walter Lord, a personal friend of Edith's, had no doubt the glass contained a few shots of whiskey moments before she set it down. Edith would go back out and eventually get into Lifeboat 11, where she consoled frightened children with a music box shaped like a little pig. Another example from the same night is the friend of Helen Candy, who went back down to his bed, never to be seen again. So too is the even more famous case of American businessman Benjamin Guggenheim, who, along with his valet Victor Giglio, went to help board women and children into the lifeboats, and then returned to their suite to put on tuxedos. When found wandering the interior of the ship, he responded to worried questioners, We've dressed in our best, and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. The bodies of Guggenheim and Giglio were never recovered. As Pompeii settles down to endure the bombardment from above, Herculaneum, meanwhile, remains in total daylight. Located by chance beyond the fallout, it has been spared the volcanic hailstorm. Some of the ash is blowing into the city, but only as if it were lightly snowing amid the glare of the sun, very lightly, and even 12 hours of this will only create a layer no deeper than half an inch or one centimeter. But what the city lacks in fallout, it makes up for with a stunning, breathtaking front row seat to Vesuvius. Only seven kilometers, or four miles from the volcano, people have to crane back their heads to gaze up at the dark pillar of shrugging and billowing ash to the west of their homes. What they probably took to be the smoke of some great unfathomable fire, as best a guess as any of them could give at the time. Turning to the right, facing south, the atmosphere is black as night, and probably looked like the long, wispy curtains of rain from a gigantic thunderstorm as ash and pumice plunge from the menacing overhang. The Amalfi Mountains are no longer visible, except for the very end of the hilly peninsula that juts into the sea toward the island of Capri, both of which are illuminated by the sun, at least for now. If the raging column isn't enough of a portent, perhaps the soft fall of ash here, combined with the overpowering vision of an exploding mountain, is enough to understand that it will not be good to linger. Even though they have no idea what is happening in the cities to the south, the residents of Herculaneum struggle with the same question of departure. Being closer to Neapolis to the north, however, the thought of an overland hike is not so worrisome as it is in the southern cities. An accountant who had been earlier carefully balancing merchandise on a scale in one of the shops abandons the items on the scale, never to come back. A painter also chooses to flee, leaving behind some unfinished works in his studio. Whether they traveled over land or not, we cannot know. But, as we will find out later, it seems a large number of people still opt for an escape by sea, gathering on the docks just below the suburban bathhouse and in front of the boathouses. Across the bay at Mycenaeum, Pliny the Elder has prepared a Liburnia for his expedition. Compared to the other vessels berthed in the military harbor, the Liburnia is a small ship, almost like a skiff, able to maneuver quickly and travel at speed. It is just over 100 feet long and 12 feet wide, so a very narrow vessel. It has a maximum crew of 144 rowers, split up to work two oars per bench file. 
There's also 10 or more sailors for duties around the ship, and up to 20 marines, although the admiral may not have called upon them since this is not a military venture. The crew is getting ready to leave, with Pliny overseeing the last of the preparations, when Rectina's letter finally arrives. It has made the long but surprisingly rapid journey from the foot of the mountain. Pliny breaks the seal and reads it over. Perhaps he looks west toward Vesuvius, whence the letter came. Presumably, Rectina is still there now. He weighs her frantic words with what he can see for himself. It now dawns on him just how severe the situation actually is. It speaks to the fact that, even for an educated man like Pliny, so little is yet understood about volcanoes in his time. At this point, he could have left with the Liburnia and raced toward the opposite shore for Rectina, but he realizes the scale of the crisis. Pliny turns to and orders that the warships be readied as fast as possible. What started out as a scientific expedition has now become a rescue operation, and Pliny knows that if Rectina is imperiled, so too is the entire population of the coastline. He must be ready to take up civilians. As his nephew would later write, he now saw his expedition in a new light. What he had begun in the spirit of a scientist, he carried on as a hero. We do not know how many ships he mustered, whether it was the whole fleet or a select quantity. Given that it is mid-autumn, some of them may have already been dry docked in preparation for winter, but still available to Pliny are three types of ships, the triremes, quadriremes, and quinqueremes. The word reem, spelled R-E-M-E, comes from the Latin word for oar, remus, and thus a trireme is three oar, a quadrireme is four oar, and a quinquireme is five oar. However, not to confuse you much, this is not actually a reference to how many oars are operated by a file of rowers, but is the number of rowers themselves on a single oar. Typically, all Roman warships had three oars to a file, the small Liburnia being the exception, with only two, making it a bireme. The design of a warship at this time is nearly universal, with each class just a larger version than the next. They are long and narrow ships with covered breezeways that overhang the main hull like wings on both port and starboard sides through which the uppermost oars pass down to the water. These are meant to shelter the rowers and also allow for better ventilation below deck. The rowers sit on a staggered file of benches, one above and behind the other like an inclined ladder, and facing aft, so that the rowers work by pulling with their backs. On deck at the center of the ship is the large, slightly rectangular mainsail, while a smaller secondary sail called the artemon hangs at an angle over the bow. At the bow, just below or above the waterline, depending on the design, is an ironclad battering ram that is an extension of the keel itself, meant to puncture or split the hull of an enemy ship in a frontal collision against its broadside. Such damage fills the enemy vessel with water and makes it impossible to maneuver. Also on the bow is the ornamentation, which include a stem post at the top curving backwards in the Roman fashion, and the oculus, a large eyeball on both the port and starboard sides that is either painted on or made of other material like marble secured to the hull. In the superstition that has pervaded sailing throughout history, the oculus was meant to help the ship see its way home. Divination is important in the navy, and a small shrine is set up at the stern, whereby sailors would acknowledge it upon boarding, a tradition that remains nowadays in the form of saluting an officer one by one when coming aboard. The shrine may be a statue of Neptune, Oceanus, Isis, Istarat, Mithras, any one of the deified emperors, or the Dioscuri, the duo of Castor and Pollux, who may be seen manifested in the form of St. Elmo's fire that plays around the sails during a thunderstorm, a sign of good luck. Also at the stern is a command tent underneath the rear stem post, which points forward toward the bow. From such a place, they can give swift orders to the pair of helmsmen who turn the large paddle-like rudders on both port and starboard side, as well as the timekeeper just below deck, the man who beats rhythm on a drum with mallets to keep the oarsmen synchronized. There is a small platform too which serves as a latrine overhanging the water, so that whatever may come, 
falls into the ship's wake and is carried off. Despite being near the command tent, it is a necessary location. At the very bottom of the vessel, below the rower's deck, are twin piston water pumps that can circulate water on the up and down motion of a handle and are excellent for draining bilges. Also below it is a hypozomata, a version of a Spanish windlass that was connected by rope to the bow and stern of the ship. When tightened, it would help prevent the hull from hogging or sagging. Rocks, sometimes sand or gravel, are piled along the keel for ballast. The ship also carries anchors that look no different from modern anchors. The crew of each ship includes a captain, his first mate, a rowing officer, and a bow officer. As mentioned before, there were the two helmsmen who together turned the pair of independent rudders. Included were a ship's doctor, a carpenter, as well as an engineer, one or more cooks, the ship's clerk, and a musician to play the oversized skinny Roman tuba called a cornu that sounded orders on ship as well as to maintain communication with friendly vessels. This communication is reinforced with the work of signalers who fan the smoke from braziers for long-distance messaging. There was also a navy diver called, don't laugh, a urinator, or urinator, from the Latin word for dive, and of course, the drum-beating timekeeper. The majority of the crew, however, were the rowers. The most senior oarsmen would sit at the uppermost level of benches near the center of the ship, and was responsible for organizing the two or three junior sailors below him as a unified rowing team, and would relay orders down the line. There are ten or more additional sailors on the ship to man the rigging and take care of other duties on deck, and of course an attachment of armed marines. The first on the list of Roman warships is the Trireme. At 130 feet long, it is a medium-class warship. It has 90 oars on each side, powered by 180 rowers. There is an additional troop of 20 to 40 marines. The crew in total is about 250 people. There may or may not have been a top deck, depending on the model, but many Roman triremes are decked at this time. The Quadrireme is another medium-class warship, at about 60 tons, but one with four oarsmen in a file, and therefore slightly larger than the Trireme. Though they also have 90 oars to a side, the additional oarsmen brings the rowing crew to a total of 240 people, and the marine attachment could be as many as 70 strong. This brings the roster to almost 350 personnel. The Quinquireem is the heavy battleship of the Roman Navy. They are typically over 150 feet long and almost 30 feet wide, with the top deck about 9 feet above the waterline. Though they were the pride of the fleet for centuries, by this time in the early empire, their numbers are beginning to dwindle, relics of the old glory days. With no real enemies on the Mediterranean, there is no longer a reason to maintain these huge ships, and one by one they are gradually decommissioned. New ones are only ever built to keep the knowledge and skill of their construction alive, you know, just in case. Those few still remaining primarily serve as ceremonial ships, and we know a handful were still listed on the roster of the classes Misonensis for quite some time. By their name, they have five rowers on the tri-oar setup. With up to 90 oars on each side, they are powered by as many as 300 rowers, and an additional troop of marines numbering 70 to 120 men. With the officers and other sailors tallied in, the crew for a quinquereme could be over 450 people. The ship is large enough for two removable towers covered in canvas, one fore and the other aft, that can each hold as many as six archers, and sometimes painted to look like stone masonry. The ship can also carry small artillery pieces like dart-throwing ballistas on its deck, mounted along the gunwales. The ballista looks like a giant crossbow on a tripod. It is worked by three operators, and by this time, had metal spring carrier assemblies that generate the force needed to launch various sizes of bolts, unlike the now antiquated torsion system of tightly corded animal sinew. What ships Pliny called upon is not known, but one would guess he scrambles any and all available vessels, especially the quinquereams for their carrying capacity. The order is spread to the sailors, and Pliny calls for his armor. He is helped into a muscled cuirass of iron on the front and back of his torso, 
usually with a raised detail in the center of the chest, perhaps the head of Medusa. It is held together by doubler flaps over the shoulders, connected with bronze clasps. Leather strips with tassels fall away at the bottom of the kiras and at the top around the shoulders. A small sash or ribbon is ornately tied around his midsection to signify his rank, if the purple cape he wears isn't obvious enough. A helmet is secured to his head, with colored horsehair falling away at the top. He carries an elaborate sword, probably with an eagle-headed pommel, on the left side of his waist, held beside him by a leather strap that hangs across from his right shoulder down to his left hip. His boots are the open-toed footwear typical of the navy. Once adorned in full panoply, he then gathers up his officers to coordinate a plan of action. It takes a few hours to get everything underway. Crews are rallied and formed up, ships are prepared, barrels of drinking water and stores of provisions are brought aboard, and one must of course undergo the ceremony of saluting the ship's patron deity before going below. It's plausible that an animal sacrifice is made at the nearby temple of the god emperors to encourage their blessing upon the mission. By 3 p.m., the fleet is rowing away from the piers and slipways, not for war this time, but for a humanitarian mission. The ships crawl across the military harbor toward the canal, oars sweeping the water, timekeepers beating rhythm below deck. Maybe people had already congregated on the docks and streets around the civilian harbor for a glimpse of the volcano, but certainly now to see the fleet passing through the canal one ship at a time, the drawbridge raised, and into the wider harbor. It has probably been a long time since they've seen it moving at strength, if ever. One by one, the ships form up in the bay outside the harbor. Unfortunately, Pliny the Younger relays only a few details to us, and there is much we would like to know about the proceedings of the mission, so we have to rely on some imagination and speculation in order to flesh out the picture. Once out on the open water, sails are lowered, oars withdrawn, and the ships begin moving out across the Bay of Naples under wind power, looking straight at the enormous wall of ash at the other end. They're going in, and every man on these ships feels the uncertainty of the outcome. They know the mission and the commander's intent, to gather up as many people as possible, get them out of there, and keep going until it is over. The late afternoon sun behind them in the west may have cast all sorts of yellows and pinks and oranges upon the volcanic fallout. Pliny the Younger, perhaps watching high up from his uncle's estate on the hilltop, reports to us that the water was unusually turbulent, jostled by tremors and earthquakes on the seabed. No doubt, the helmsman, holding fast to the rudder handles, had a difficult time muscling the ships along a straight route, fighting the surge of the seawater. Roman warships can travel at about 8 knots, or just less than 10 miles per hour. With Herculaneum 22 kilometers, or 13 miles as the crow flies, and Aplantis as much as 17 miles away, it will take a couple of hours for the fleet to reach the other side of the bay. Pliny the Younger doesn't seem to have watched the departure of the fleet for very long. He returns to his homework, since that was the reason he says he chose to stay anyways. He knows he'll certainly hear all about the mission when his uncle returns. At about the same time as the fleet is rallying under a clear sky, in pitch black Pompeii, the pumice has reached a meter deep at least, or about three feet, maybe more. Opening doors to the outside is next to impossible. Those people still inside the city shelter within rooms illuminated by oil lamps, which flicker painfully as the air thickens and loses its oxygen content. Breathing is becoming difficult and laborious. Just as critically, Roman roofs are not meant to bear heavy loads, certainly no more than the terracotta shingles. Modern building codes require residential roofs to support something like 40 pounds per square foot, dead and live loads combined, while commercial roofs may have to support as much as 250 pounds per square feet. The pumice has already exceeded those tolerances and is not stopping. Rafters groan under the weight of the fallout. People underneath start to doubt their choice of room, wondering if there is a safer place inside the building. Perhaps they change places, 
taking their oil lamps with them and hurrying each other along. Suddenly, there is a crash as one of the rooms collapses, blowing out ash into adjoining chambers. Pumice starts falling into the house. The city is caving in. Larger buildings like temples and courthouses with their strong brick columns may hold out longer, but residential and commercial structures are not so tough. At the house of the fawn, a wealthy mistress is gathering up all her jewelry. She and her treasure are suddenly crushed by the roof overhead. In the house of Trebius Valens, four people crouch in a last-ditch effort to brace themselves against the home as it implodes. At the house of Publius Paculius Proculus, seven children, seeking shelter in a second-floor room, are killed when it collapses to ground level. Similarly, in the house of Quintus Popeius, a man and his ten slaves suffer the same fate, while still holding a lamp made of bronze and glass. Under the moaning of wood beams and the squeezing of walls, 34 people in a warehouse who had been up on the second floor decide to move down to the wine vault. They bring with them bread and fruit they hope is enough to last them through the storm. The basement proves to be no safer. In another house, part of the roof crashes down on its inhabitant. In the second before impact, he lifts his hands in a feeble attempt to thwart the oncoming material. His arms are completely smashed and his body flattened. Near him on a wall, possibly written by him shortly before, is scratched in Latin. Nothing in the world can last forever. Out on the bay, Pliny the Elder remains at the head of the formation in his Liburnia, perhaps flying a sail dyed in red to signify the Admiral's presence on board. He is no doubt busy dictating his scientific observations to a scribe who might be having difficulty keeping a steady hand on the rough surf. Pliny is not one to waste an opportunity to jot down notes for later writings. It appears he decided to move straight for the worst of the fallout zone where people would need help the most, and perhaps where Rectina said she and her husband would rendezvous with him. Since Herculaneum is hardly touched, the fleet seems to have ignored it. Without telescopic aid, Pliny may not have even seen the people gathered on the shore, though they would likely have spotted the large warships out on the water, waving frantically and crying out, but probably going unheard. If Pliny did send vessels to Herculaneum, it has not been recorded. Within an hour or so, as the sun creeps toward the horizon behind them, casting longer and longer shadows, the fleet finally moves under the ash umbrella and into the heart of darkness, as if night had suddenly fallen upon them. We can only imagine what the sailors and marines may have thought looking up at this thick, fearsome overcast high above, or what they said to each other. The sailors below deck on the benches, their oars at rest in their laps, would have been more ignorant of the progress of their journey. Those closest to the oar holes in the hull and breezeways may have peered through them, trying to understand what they were seeing, their fellow sailors nudging them to find out more for themselves. It's probably a rough ride too, with the ships rocking heavily against the surge of the waves. Perhaps water spills onto the bow with every plunge. If so, the pumps below deck would be very busy. At around 5 or 6 p.m., as they draw near to Aplantis and Pompeii, ash and rocks begin falling onto the ships. We can imagine sailors and marines ducking for cover. The helmsmen, otherwise exposed and much too important to leave their post at the rudders, must have been aided by some of their comrades who form a roof above them with their shields. Maybe some of the heavier stones rip through the sails. Even more frightening, the ash is hot enough in places that the crew begin to wonder if the ships will light on fire. It starts to collect on the decks. 
perhaps there was an effort to keep the ships clear, as the added weight would threaten the ability to float, as well as the balance of the vessels in the water. At almost the same moment, the ships confront another unforeseen obstacle. They grind to a complete and sudden stop. Pumice stones have gathered in such quantity on the surface of the bay that they have formed a vast floating carpet several miles wide, possibly ebbing the waves to almost a standstill, and it would have looked as though the coastline had extended itself into the sea, like a broad field of plowed dirt. In the darkness, there could be no telling how far or near they were from the real shore, and thus from the cities. Certainly, Pliny would have had his scribe record this bizarre phenomenon as the admiral peers over the gunwale at what now lies all around the prow. A video of a sailing vessel traveling through such a pumice field as far as the eye can see near the Tonga Islands in 2019 illustrates this excellently, as well as the alien sound of billions of little rocks grinding against each other, hissing with every suppressed undulation of the sea. Though it may not have been very thick vertically, horizontally, the pumice is so dense that even the great imperial warships are unable to cut through it. The sheet might as well be pack ice. Maybe some of the captains had the oars lowered and attempted to pierce it by manpower. Hundreds of men on just a single ship heave under tremendous strain, but despite this combined strength, there is no progress. With the fallout still threatening the well-being of the ships, this new obstacle prompts some of Pliny's officers to urge him to order a withdrawal. He now has many hundreds, up to several thousand people, caught out on the open water. But as his nephew later tells us, Pliny insists they not give up just yet, despite the danger. He reminds them of an old Latin proverb, inquit fortuna vivat, Pampanianum pete. Fortune favors the bold. Head for Pampanianus. Just exactly who Pampanianus was is not known. Pliny the Younger does not state how his uncle knows the man, but he apparently owns a villa in the town of Stabiae, and was the first person that Pliny the Elder thought of when reconsidering his plans. Stabiae is a luxury settlement on the lower wing of the bay. Just west of it, the Sorrentine Peninsula continues until it ends reaching for the island of Capri a favored vacationing spot of the emperors, as it still is nowadays for tourists. During the Social War, Stabiae had been demolished by Roman forces under Sulla. Though the city proper never fully recovered, it did spawn a new resorting community, stretching several miles of expensive homes staircased above each other on the sea bluffs. With the prevailing wind pushing south, Pliny has no choice but to continue in that direction, making Stabiae the nearest place with shipping docks that may yet be accessible. It is at this point we lose mention of the fleet. We do not know if Pliny lapped some of the ships to continue the struggle against the pumice sheet, and whether they succeeded in breaking through, or if the fleet, either in part or in whole, remained with him. All we know is that Pliny had his Liburnia steered towards Stabiae, where he makes landfall at last, sometime in the late evening. He is greeted by a nervous Pompanianus at the docks, who is already arranging his own evacuation and packing up a boat with his valuables in case the wind changes for the better. He was certainly relieved by his friend's unexpected arrival. Pliny the Elder, however, stepping onto the pier in full military regalia, wants to stay. He does his best to calm his friend and perhaps takes advantage of the need to be hospitable to a Roman admiral. They go up to the house of Pomponianus, who no doubt is pressing Pliny for information. To soothe his frightened hosts, Pliny the Elder assumes a cool, untroubled demeanor and begins making himself at home. The Edith Russell response. He is helped out of his armor so he can relax. He even takes a bath and eats an after meal while distant Vesuvius rumbles somewhere in the darkness beyond. Pomponianus and others question how he can be so calm at a time like this, but he remained, as his nephew describes, uh, quite cheerful, or at any rate he pretended to be, which was no less courageous. Around 8 or 9 o'clock at night, the nature of the eruption changes. 
The volcano has emptied enough of the magma well to start ejecting deep earth material, and the color of the pumice falling on the landscape now turns from pale white to a harsh gray. Not only that, but they increase in size, and the eruption column is forced even higher. Ash and pumice now begin to fall on Stabie. At about one o'clock in the morning, 15 hours into the eruption and five hours into the gray pumice fall, the narrow thrust that is keeping the column aloft suddenly loses its power, possibly from a widening of the crater wall itself by erosion or by cave-in. The air molecules that initially lifted that output into the stratosphere can no longer hold the immense weight as it loses support at the base, and the ash column collapses under its own tonnage. Recalling the image of the Twin Tower collapses of September 11, 2001 is exactly what this looks like. As it falls, every single debris particle creates a slipstream around it, increasing the force of the downblast. When the Twin Towers collapsed, the downblasts were each worth nearly an eighth of the power of the atomic bomb. The weight of those buildings, a combined one million tons, is a trifle in comparison to the sheer mass of the eruption column. When it returns to the mouth of Vesuvius, its downblast is many magnitudes greater, and it rages down the volcano's western slope far more powerful than a tidal wave, gushing out toward the west and southwest. It is heading straight for the bay and for Herculaneum. It forms what in volcanology is called a Nouée Ardente, or, as translated from the French, a glowing cloud. Nouée Ardentes have two components. At the bottom is the pyroclastic flow, which is dense, deeply concentrated material with laminar flow behavior like liquid water. In other words, something like a mudslide. Above it, looking like a menacing cloud, is the pyroclastic surge, which has much less drag and rides above and ahead of the flow below it. Though it may look like a cloud rolling over the landscape, it is in fact essentially an avalanche, and behaves as such, made up entirely of pulverized and atomized rock, magma, and other deep earth materials. The temperature of the surge is anywhere between 450 and 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, and plows down the mountainside between 75 and 200 miles per hour, which, at its fastest, is nearly the speed of a Formula One car. Even at its slowest, the cloud cannot be outraced, either on foot or by horse, illuminating the night in spurts of hot red and yellow. If you've seen the Disney movie Dinosaur, the surge created by the asteroid impact is a perfect cinematic recreation of a Nouvelle Ardente. It may have been seen as far away as Stabiae by Pliny the Elder's group inside the Pompanianus household. Even through the ash and pumice, they notice what look like distant fires. The Admiral peers into the darkness, but dismisses the site as bonfires lit by desperate peasants or by buildings that have been ignited, and he remains unimpressed. He even returns to his guest room, where he goes to sleep, perhaps a little earlier than usual for this habitual night owl. Had he been further north, however, he would have been anything but sleepy or unimpressed. Whomever is still traveling the roads passing Herculaneum toward Neapolis are instantly erased. Trees and shrubs, even those enormous umbrella pines, are wiped away. As it roars down the elevation, the surge fans out like an inverted mushroom cloud. It travels the four miles to Herculaneum in three to four minutes, possibly less. For a long time, it was believed almost everyone in Herculaneum had bailed out because so few bodies were found inside the city itself. But excavations in the 1980s around its old shoreline reveal that such isn't the case. We now know that at least 340 people are still gathered on the beach below the boathouses. Because only about 300 feet of the beachfront has been excavated, it is possible there are still more individuals to the north and south of the boathouses, all of which are empty of boats. It tells us that many people had evacuated by sea, but this crowd is still waiting, presumably for vessels to make the return journey and take them away. Maybe even a ship from the fleet had arrived, picked up whom it could, and promised to come back for more. Even if one had not, it is clear some kind of evacuation effort was underway at the Herculaneum docks well into midnight. Some of the lives of these people have been wonderfully illuminated by anthropologist Sarah Beisel, 
who pioneered archaeological forensics first at Herculaneum in the 1980s and 1990s. It is deeply unfortunate she never published her discoveries in a singular piece before her death in 1996. Most everything exists in spurts across her notes and observations, but some of her findings have made it into publication by others for us to glean. Among the crowd is a slave girl, about 14 years old. In her arms is a seven-month-old baby, but her pelvis will later show that she has never gone through childbirth. The baby is therefore likely the child of her mistress and was placed in her charge. Female slaves often served as nursemaids. Why she is alone, we don't know, but she appears to have been separated from her owners. Grooves in her teeth will reveal that she suffered from malnutrition when she herself was a baby, and periodically thereafter. The scarring on the bones of her shoulders come from a life of lifting objects much too heavy for her. Moreover, a reconstruction of her face based on her skull reveal that she is in fact quite beautiful, which probably added to her difficulties. There is a woman here too who has a lice infection, judging not just by the lice eggs that will miraculously survive to be preserved on her skull and found later by archaeologists, but also from grooves on her scalp from incessant scratching. There is a 16-year-old boy whose upper body is well developed and whose teeth on the right side of his mouth are worn deep into the enamel. Sarah Beisel believed these are telltale signs of a fisherman's apprentice, perhaps learning from his father, and who spent much of his youth rowing boats and biting down on fishing nets to mend them. With this crowd are several cripples and a dozen or so children under the age of three, including a two-year-old girl with silver earrings. Out on the beach is a 37-year-old soldier of some type. Maybe he is stationed here. Maybe he is on leave visiting family. At his side are a sword and dagger, though the dagger is missing from its sheath. Tied to his belt is a little purse of three gold coins and a few silver pieces. He is tall for a Roman, standing five foot eight inches, and the wear on his bones indicate well-developed muscles. The bulbous crest of his shoulder bone suggests he repeatedly hurled objects with a twisting motion, perhaps a pilum, the Roman throwing spear. He has a gash on his femur from a stab wound in earlier times, one that healed but formed a blood clot, albeit benign, and the muscle scarring on his thighs also show development consistent with horse riding. A reconstruction of his reassembled skull will reveal a tough, grisly-looking man with a big nose, made even more charming by the three front teeth that had been knocked out from his mouth, perhaps from the same impact that left a scar across it. But heroes need not look pretty, because it appears he was down at the beach helping organize the evacuation effort. Apparently helping him is a much shorter 55-year-old man clutching an oar. Muscle scars on his skeleton suggest he had spent many years rowing or working construction, and his teeth reveal he had suffered malnutrition throughout his life. Perhaps he is a slave, maybe a former slave, or just an unfortunate member of the lower class. There are also two riders on horseback, trotting back and forth along the sand to pass word between the evacuation volunteers. Looking down on all of them from the promontory above is a 48-year-old woman. From analysis of her bones, she is one of the few people in the city suffering from lead poisoning, probably from years of drinking cheap wine stored in lead-based jars to the point of alcoholism, and as a result, likely suffers neurotic mood swings, periods of rage, and chronic depression, the symptoms of lead poisoning. It appears to have hurt her social life, and thus she is alone that night, and may have fled her home when she noticed the approaching danger coming to a stop on the uppermost terrace overlooking the crowd below. Growing ever larger in view, the surge cloud glows like an apocalyptic vision, traveling faster than any horseman. When it finally descends on Herculaneum, the flow easily passes along the streets, being many times taller than the tallest rooftop. It sucks into buildings through windows and through doorways. Heavy pillars are tossed effortlessly aside, blown over like blades of grass. Roofs and upper stories are ripped off and dissected in mid-air to join the flood of volcanic fallout, arming it now with projectiles. It's so hot that wood door frames and rafters are turned to charcoal on contact, but they can't burn, because the ash also serves as a suffocating retardant. 
Inside the shrine of the Augustales, the prisoner in the prefab holding pen is overtaken while still lying in his bed, which ignites instantaneously. Parts of his brain are immediately turned to glass. Four men and a woman are killed in the men's waiting room of the forum baths, the strong vaulted ceilings of which they thought would protect them. In the nursery of the House of the Gem lies a baby in a crib, mysteriously alone. The surge carbonizes both the crib and the baby. It's possible her parents had not abandoned her, but had stepped outside to see what the horrible noise was, and were literally swept up and away by what they found. It also roasts the body of a young crippled boy, aged between 12 and 14, lying on a bed in the back of a street shop. Closer examination of his joints reveal he may have been suffering from polio, and was thus too fragile to move. Nearby, a young woman, maybe 18 or 19, and possibly his older sister, is nearly incinerated into a heap of blackened bone chips in something like a quarter of a second, next to a weaving loom which somehow survives, along with the chicken soup that had been prepared for the boy. Their guardians may have suffered the same fate as those of the baby in the crib some blocks away. Two donkeys are killed in one of the bakeries, the animals abandoned and still tied to the grain mills they were turning earlier that day. Several people die sheltering in the oven room of the House of Aristides. Another person in the later named House of the Skeleton is also killed, preserving as well the two chairs on either side of her. Two other people are catapulted 25 feet into the air from an upswell in the flow as it plows through city infrastructure. On reaching the suburban bathhouse, the cloud consumes a man and a woman seeking refuge in the men's quarter. It fills the chambers of the bathhouse with such force that a two-ton water vessel made of marble is thrown clear across the hot tub room, lodging itself and forever leaving an imprint on the opposite wall. Yet, Nue Ardance, for all their ferocity, are full of scientific mysteries. Through physics not yet fully understood, while they completely devastate the world in their path, at the same time, they can form little pockets of protection, shock cocoons. The surge cloud tears apart heavy columns like twigs, but just across the street, a meal still sits exactly where it has been set on the dining table, completely undisturbed by the forces all around. It chars wood throughout every corner of the city, in some cases to the core, yet a collection of wax tablets in a drawer goes unmelted. It even fails to incinerate the entire library at the Villa of the Papyri, a stroke of luck that cannot be understated, whereas the fish in the villa's garden pond have no such luck and are cooked while still alive, leaving behind scales and bones. Though the surge cloud dislodges three life-size statues of horses wrought of gilded bronze from the top of the courthouse, dismembers them in mid-air, and throws the pieces across a sixth of a mile, at the house of Neptune, it so barely disturbs the contents of one room that the original woodwork will be preserved with lamps still hanging from little chains, kitchenware arranged neatly on a table, and containers of fragile cereals held in storage, albeit now burnt. The surge blows off the entire wall of a second-floor apartment without so much as nudging the furniture inside. A section of the house of Telephus is blasted out to sea, while a salad with napkins remains undisturbed on a table in the same complex. In one home, a household shrine is roasted in totality to a deep black, but will keep safe behind its tiny doors a few items of food, frankincense, and a cup from which wine was apparently drank the last remnants of a family's bid for the favor of the gods before they left. To a more extreme degree, archaeologists will find a jar of walnuts so perfectly protected that the meat of the nuts will be edible almost 2,000 years later. But there will be no shock cocoon for the people on the beach. Everything that is about to happen will only take a handful of seconds, but I must slow things down for sake of description. Rewinding a bit, in the final minute before the surge cloud breaches the city, but visibly growing in sight, the crowd on the beachfront flees the dockyard and scrambles into the empty boathouses, cramming as tight as 40 individuals into each of them. They leave behind footprints in the sand. These footprints are only one way. Inside, the people press against the inner walls at the back. 
The teenage slave girl lies down on her side, bringing her face to the infant in her arms, and tries to soothe this child of another woman amid the commotion, though a child that clearly has become dear to her. Nearby, a frightened youngster clings to his puppy. One woman is heavily pregnant. The little bones of her unborn baby will later be found still curled between her hips and ribcage. A young boy looks to his mother for solace as they hug each other in a final embrace. At the last second, seeing the cloud glowing high overhead within the city, the two horsemen on the beach spur their animals into one of the boathouses, only adding to the chaos within. Just as the surge cloud is penetrating the suburban baths, it has also reached the terraced wall that falls away to the shoreline. It launches the lady, sick with lead poisoning, off the promontory, taking her in an arc three stories down to the beach below. She hits it with such force that it flattens her pelvis and throws back one of her legs so that the bones pierce her skull from behind. With the surge cloud flies roof tiles, sections of housing, and other debris. One of the tiles strikes a lady in the forehead as the surge cloud slams down on the waterfront. The grim soldier, who appears to have stepped away from the boathouses to check one last time how near the danger was, spins around to protect himself with his back facing the cloud. He is thrown forward with such velocity that his entire skeleton is completely crushed, breaking every single bone except those of his inner ears. He is not alone. More than a dozen other people are smashed by the pyroclastic surge outside the boathouses, including the 55-year-old oarsman, as well as a tall 45-year-old woman, dubbed the Ring Lady, for all the fine jewelry she has decorated herself with. Nearly all the victims directly on the beach are male, while most of the people sheltering inside the boathouses are women and children. They have a terrifying second more to live before the boathouses act as a vacuum and suck the lower part of the surge back into all 340 people. The temperature is nearly as hot as the thermal shock that burns shadow people onto the streets of Hiroshima. Blood is instantly brought to boiling point. Flesh is baked, if not vaporized. Bones are burned to a reddish gray. Even their DNA is destroyed. The molars of some people crack, even burst in their jaws. The inner wall of skulls are charred black from the sudden expansion of boiling brains. A few even explode, splintering the cranium. The skulls of both the slave girl and the baby burst outward at the top, as if from a bullet. The two horsemen and their animals are baked. Their bodies are so intermixed with the other people that no one can now tell exactly who were the riders. In a few hundredths of a second, before nerve ends evaporate, muscles contract from the heat and twist some of the bodies into an appearance of agony. But it all happens faster than the neurons can register pain. Because the human body is more than 70% water, the victims release a burst of steam into the cloud which exchanges heat. Two seconds after contact, the volcanic material inside the boathouses has dropped down to some 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 80% lower than the rest of it outside, and, in a further three seconds, fuses the sediment around the bones of the last people of Herculaneum in the same process as one makes glass. When the cloud touches the sea only 20 or so feet away, water is flash-boiled on contact, and the beach explodes forcefully in plumes of superheated steam. Following the pyroclastic surge is the flow proper. Having a more viscous quality like a mudslide, much of it travels through the natural topography and into the ravines on either side of Herculaneum. The two halves come around the coastal cliffs below the city to merge once again at the boathouses. One of the halves pushes with it a 25-foot-long fishing boat from further along the beach, laying it ironically near the body of the older man with the oar. The surge suddenly comes to a halt, leaving Herculaneum partially buried, wafting in a huge cloud of volcanic ash, and its beach, once the allure of the city, now a steamy cauldron. However, the surge cloud has spread as far south as Aplantis, and shortly after it has glassed Herculaneum, its lower radius reaches the expensive estates of the southern city. It washes through the abandoned villa of Popea, its chambers already empty for the last 17 years, 
But in the nearby warehouses of Lucius Tertius, 54 people are sheltering in one of the rooms. It is a mixed crowd of young and old, male and female. Most of them are blood relatives, perhaps one extended family or several families that have come together. Among them are children and pregnant women, including one who is nearing term and another starting her third trimester. Most of the poorer people, without wealth or jewelry, have been forced to the back of the room, while the wealthier individuals are near the door, presumably to be the first to leave if help arrives. One man has as much as 10,000 sesterces with him, possibly his entire life savings. But the surge cloud pays no heed to class distinctions, nor age, or sex, and all are instantly buried when it fills the room. Oplantis is the last stop of the pyroclastic surge before it finally peters out. It has killed everyone within four to six miles west of the mountain. Any trees that remain stubbornly erect are no more than smoking, carbonized stems. Ponds, rivers, and creeks billow with hot steam, if not wholly evaporated. Yet, the eruption only gets worse. It starts to intensify, recovering more than fully from the downspell that produced its first Nue Ardom. Vesuvius is now ejecting some 10,000 tons of material every second, ten times the power than what it began with. This intensification is apparent because the volcano will produce several more pyroclastic currents of increasing strength, each one larger and more far-flung than the one before it. There will be no mercy as Vesuvius begins the process of completely erasing the landscape and redrawing the map. Not even the gods have this kind of power. Those who knew about the initial surge are dead. Everybody else has no idea what has just happened, nor what will soon find them too. All they know is the growing accumulation of new earth on their rooftops. No one can be sure how much longer it will go on. This could very well be the end of the world, and for most, if not all of them, it is. An hour after the first surge, at roughly 2 a.m., the eruption column collapses again, creating a pyroclastic surge three times greater in volume than the first and even hotter in temperature. It mushrooms out in all directions. Not only does it travel to the west and south like the first, it also moves to the north and east of the volcano, hitherto untouched by surge activity. It lays a deposit similar to the one left by Mount St. Helens in 1980, and is therefore fanning out at 200 to 450 miles per hour. In other words, 300 to 600 feet every second. If the faster speed, it is halfway to Mach 1. Two country vineyards near modern Terzino, on the east side of Vesuvius, are buried by the surge. The southernmost villa had earlier imploded under the falling pumice. It's already been abandoned. The villa north of it, however, has withstood the pileup and is still occupied when the second surge reaches it. In another villa, a pig has wandered from its pen into one of the rooms. A guard dog has also been left behind. Toward the west, roads leading to Neapolis have already been wiped clean of any refugees. Only the strongest trees have been able to resist, albeit charred and greenless stumps. It's a smooth ride toward the bay, where it again reaches Herculaneum. The city, however, is extinct, bereft of all life, as is the surge cloud's other destination, Aplantis. There is no one alive to experience it. The cloud has only half-buried buildings to further damage or destroy. It fills the boathouses even further, thickening the layer of sediment that lies around and above the skeletons of the people who had been trapped there. The second surge is followed by a colossal pyroclastic flow that rolls out along the northern and western radius, although for some reason it does not retrace the surge's path toward the south. Meanwhile, those inside Pompeii are still totally unaware of the violence just north of the city. Nearly sealed in their homes and shops, their primary fear is the collapse of their shelter. They are now more than 14 hours into the eruption. It is likely no one has slept. Oil lamps are failing as their fuel depletes. Some people may already be waiting in darkness, breathing with difficulty in the dense air, suffocating. 
at the house of Menander, a family that has become separated in opposite rooms, tries to use whatever makeshift tools they can to batter at the wall which divides them in a desperate attempt to reunite. Similarly, at the house of Julius Polybius, the politician who goes by the initials CIP, a pregnant woman in her late teens is surrounded by her family, which include two men in their 60s, one of whom is possibly her father. It may even be Julius Polybius himself. Both men are suffering from osteoporosis. There is also a man in his late 20s, perhaps her husband, a 45-year-old woman, possibly her mother, and three or four young children who could be siblings or cousins. But in the room next door is an older female, a young male, and a three-year-old boy. It is not possible to know exactly how this scenario came about, but authors Alex Butterworth and Ray Lawrence have suggested that at some point, a toddler possibly scampered off to see what was happening outside. The terrified woman hurried after him, and the young male soon followed up to fetch them. When the pumice fall intensified, they were forced to make for the nearest room before they could get back. Now separated, the two groups try to knock and hear for each other's muffled voices through the wall. Trapped in their homes, shops, and temples, the people of Pompeii can only hope and pray the sun will return again. It will, but not before the work is done. At Mycenaeum, the young Pliny is trying to sleep in his bedroom, but it hasn't been easy. Though miles from the volcano, even Mycenaeum has not been left untroubled. Tremors have rattled the ground, growing fiercer with each passing hour, so much so, as Pliny describes, that everything felt as if it were not only shaken, but overturned. Perhaps his bed, dressers, and any other furniture bounce around the floor. A particularly violent quake stirs him from his sleep, and he starts to rise to check up on his mother. She was apparently of the same mind, and they encounter one another before Pliny can leave his room. They decide it is much too dangerous to stay indoors, and so they retreat into the open forecourt where they sit together, looking out over the bay toward the smoke screen of Vesuvius, barely visible in the early morning darkness. Reflecting years later on his time in the courtyard, Pliny recalls, I know not whether to describe my behavior at this dangerous juncture as courage or folly, but I called for a volume of Livy and began to read and even continued my notations from it as if nothing were the matter. The Edith Russell response. There is seemingly just enough light from the sun, still cloaked behind the colossal ash wall to the east, that Pliny is able to read, though he describes it as exceedingly faint and doubtful. He would have been squinting over the letters. They are soon found by Pliny the Elder's friend visiting from Spain, no more able to sleep than they are. He is clearly a nervous wreck because he scolds Plinia and her son for their apparent calm. Still, he chooses to remain in the safety of their company. For several hours, nothing more happens. Though daylight should be coming, there is no sunrise this morning. The world for miles around Vesuvius is still black as night. Any sense of time is long gone. There is no clock by which to judge the hour, and it has probably felt longer than has actually been. For all anyone knows in Pompeii, it could still be the night of October 24th, and not the morning of the 25th. But as judged by later sediments, at about 6.30 a.m., the volcano unleashes a third pyroclastic surge. Again, it rolls over Herculaneum. The stage theater is now the only structure still protruding above the deposits. All else is underground. The cloud also barrels across the plain south toward Pompeii, five miles from the volcano. Before it awaits the city's walls, some 20 feet high. Though they have fallen out of use for over 150 years now, tonight they will defend Pompeii one last time. The third surge, already losing its momentum after the five-mile dash, is too weak to push beyond the stone barrier, and it stalls at the bulwarks. This was a close call. Probably few, if any, had even seen it, but maybe they heard its terrible approach, mistaking the noise for a grumbling of the mountain or an earthquake. The release of the surge temporarily, but conveniently dissipates the amount of pumice falling from the sky as the eruption column is forced to rebuild itself. 
Additionally, the surge may have intensified the ambient temperature of North Pompeii, since a zone of high heat is known to exist at the distal ends of pyroclastic surges, as evidenced by Mount St. Helens in 1980, as well as the eruption of El Chichon two years later. Overheating in the darkness of their homes, terrified by the mysterious distant roar, yet encouraged by the apparent subsiding of pumice tumbling outside, these factors are enough to convince some people that now is the time to try making a run for it. But the long trek is still deeply perilous. They must walk on streets of pumice six feet deep or more. It's firm enough to get a footing, like walking on a pile of gravel, but buildings may implode from the press of the fallout all around them, threatening to suck in any passers-by. Roman oil lamps produce no more light than do candles, and navigating roads otherwise familiar on the ground can get tricky in the dark, let alone from almost one story up. You can nearly look into second floor windows. Additionally, pumice and ash totally obscure your visibility beyond a short distance. Nonetheless, some build up the courage to take their chances in the open, either to make it out from under the fallout, wherever that is, or to find better shelter. But an hour later, at 7.30 a.m., a fourth Nue Ardolf roars down the slopes of the volcano. What happened to Herculaneum and Aplantis is now headed toward Pompeii. Along the way, it loses much of its heat, and by the time it reaches the city, it is not nearly as hot as the first two surges to hit Herculaneum. But to say, not as hot, is to say it's still twice the boiling point of water. The cloud rolls over the wide sheet laid down by its immediate predecessor. This time, however, the city's walls will be of no defense. The debris left by the third surge cloud has piled so high along the fortification that it has made a ramp for the oncoming fourth surge, which will find some 2,000 people, maybe more, still inside the city. Wandering near the Nola Gate on the north side of Pompeii is an eight-year-old girl. No other bodies have been found with her, and it is assumed she has become separated from her guardians. In her grip is an object with a little head made of wood, female in shape, and she clutches it protectively to her chest. When it's found still with her 1900 years later, it was originally thought to be a religious object, but a further investigation on the small head revealed almost microscopic remnants of stuffing at the base of the neck. She isn't hugging an icon, it's her toy doll. Walking the hellish roads all alone, probably looking for her parents or guardians, she and her doll are instantly buried as the surge cloud jumps the ramp on the other side of the wall. It pours into the city like a tsunami. Down the road, a man is killed as he struggles to convince his goat to move along. Behind him is a woman, perhaps his wife, carrying an infant. She is felled with two small girls beside her as well, one of them still clinging to the edge of her gown. A short distance away are another 33 people, some of them carrying the keys to their homes, coins, other tokens, and at least two with oil lamps to pitifully light the way. They had unknowingly been walking straight toward the surge cloud. A family who barricaded themselves in the Villa of Diomedes, surrounded by their valuables and enough food to last, decided it was time to leave, perhaps mistaking the roar of the surge cloud for an earthquake. A man, presumably the head of the family, is just stepping out of the building, key in hand, when the surge reaches them. At the house of Postumius Modestus, a woman is killed. In a box next to her are the tickets she had bought for yesterday's show at the theater. Inside another house, it bakes to death two young boys trying to hide in a corner. They die holding each other's hand. As volcanologist Harald Sigerson describes, In an ash storm, you can't breathe. The inside of your mouth is burned. You hear your hair sizzle, but your clothes are hardly scorched. It's like a burn from a microwave oven. 
The fourth pyroclastic surge pushes through every object in its path and picks up material along the way. Wood, thatch, and stones carried from the countryside mix with bricks, pieces of marble, and roof tiles. Because the pumice fell vertically from the sky, no such debris is found at those layers. But the layers left by the flows are filled with debris, like wicked gusts of wind from a tornado firing everything horizontally. It is here, too, that we find the bodies. A 33-year-old man limping from an infection in his leg is smashed beneath a large, heavy piece of stone thrust violently out of place and onto its victim's upper body, decapitating him. His head has never been found. Another two are wiped out by a stone slag riding along with the surge. When the cloud reaches the forum, it smashes the huge colonnade of the Temple of Jupiter, which crush a pair of priests. Or maybe they were worshippers who came here to plead for the gods' intervention. Bulldozing through to the south side, a group of nine men and two slaves are just leaving a house under guidance of lamplight, pillows strapped above their heads to guard against pumice when they are killed. They apparently decided their lives were not worth trying to save a stash of 118 pieces of silverware that they hid away in the restroom. Maybe they figured they would come back for it. The surge cloud catches up with and asphyxiates a priest running down the street toward the gladiator barracks, trying to protect some of the treasury from the Temple of Isis. He had gotten only 50 meters from the temple. It overtakes the city's two stage theaters and arrives at the barracks behind them where it kills a total of some 60 gladiators that remain. Four of them lie in a secure room under the label Detention. A woman walking with a group of 18 people outside jumps into one of the barrack rooms at the very last moment and happens inside a chamber where some gladiators are already sheltering. At about that same time, in the courtyard of the public gym, a physician dies with his collection of surgical instruments. In the same complex is an athlete. He is killed still holding his bottle of cleaning oil. Maybe he had come back for it, or had never left the gym once the pumice began falling. On the road south near the harbor, dozens of people carrying their personal cash, jewelry, and fine silverware are able to dash into a row of shops at first sight of the cloud, but it makes no difference. The surge finally overtakes a line of some 13 people, young and old, children and adults. They were using the stone wall of a garden to guide them through the darkness, trying to keep up with the person in front when the surge cloud consumes them. But unlike the people at Herculaneum, death will not be instantaneous for them, or anyone in Pompeii for that matter. Their entire bodies are scalded on contact and they fall to the ground, coiling instinctively to protect themselves. The first breath fills their lungs with searing hot ash, those tiny shards of volcanic glass. The second breath solidifies it into a gooey liquid cement. There is no third breath. In that time, an older man at the front of the line makes the effort to rise up on one elbow, gasping for air, and apparently took one final look at a woman next to him with her child, perhaps his adult daughter and granddaughter, as the older woman desperately jams a cloth into her throat. Included in the group is a slave porter, already burdened under a heavy sack of provisions. The surge cloud presses on, and it's only seconds before it rolls over the southern wall, across the mass graveyard on the other side, and hisses to a stop just beyond Pompeii. The eruption column, however, has difficulty finding its footing, and just a few minutes after the fourth surge has finally stalled, the column implodes again for a fifth time at 7.45 a.m. It also reaches Pompeii, but there are little to no people left to kill, and it seals over the debris of the prior surge already filled with bodies. It surpasses the reach of its predecessor and begins clearing the way towards Stabiae. However, it falls short of the settlement and apparently went unnoticed by anyone sheltering inside the home of Pomponianus, including Pliny the Elder, who is fast asleep. Across the bay in Mycenum, the rising sun, still hidden behind the eruption fallout, is casting a soft morning glow. Despite this, it does not seem that either Pliny the Younger or his mother have seen the surge clouds, either in the night or by daybreak. Even if they could, their more immediate concern are the earthquakes. 
They have become so violent that mother and son are convinced they can no longer remain even in the ocean view courtyard. The surrounding structure is looking like it will collapse upon them. Clinia orders that some carriages be prepared, and they finally leave the prefectural estate, along with Pliny the Elder's friend from Spain, and any accompanying servants. As they head down the mount, they realize they need to leave the city altogether, lest any nearby structures crush them. On their way, they are joined up by an increasing crowd of people looking to act on someone else's decision. Pliny the Younger describes this behavior as a point in which fear looks like prudence. Now finding themselves leading an exodus, they stop in a clearing just outside the city. Though the ground appears to be level, they discover their carriages will not stop from rolling forward or back, even after the wheels were chucked. More frightening, Pliny notices the entire sea pulling away from the shore, leaving fish and other marine creatures flopping on bare sand. These are telltale signs of a tsunami, but he does not record one nor does geology have evidence for a tidal wave in any of the buried cities. It is therefore likely that what Pliny is witnessing is the ground being raised from below in the phenomena of Brady Sizism, wherein, if we recall, super-pressured lava and gases beneath the ground lift huge surface areas above them. It's as if a giant monster is rolling its shoulders up against the Earth's crust, preparing another belch for Vesuvius, 17 miles from Mycenaeum. The Romans observing this upswell, however, have no way of knowing what's happening below them. Unable to steady the carriages, they abandon them and proceed to move out on foot. Meanwhile, in Dark Stabiae, pumice has been coming down in such quantity that it is now knee-deep. The Admiral has been sleeping so soundly, he has been undisturbed by the hailstorm outside, even by earthquakes and snoring with such gusto that he can be heard above the rumblings of Vesuvius. Apparently, his host didn't think about the danger of the fallout accumulating in the courtyard to which the guest room opened, and it's good luck that Pliny seems to have stirred himself awake. He finds the doorway rapidly filling up, any longer, and he may have been trapped. The Admiral makes his way out and joins the worried party in another section of the villa, Pomponianus again begs that they leave. Even the house itself has been starting to sway to and fro. This time, Pliny agrees, his own imprisonment having been all too close for comfort. Before they leave the villa, they tie pillows to their heads, the only thing they can do to try protecting themselves against the larger rocks falling with the pumice. The group heads outside and starts making its way down to the shoreline. Around 8 in the morning, just as they are beginning their escape, Vesuvius unleashes a huge, breathtakingly massive Nuerdon. It's so large that perhaps the entire column has collapsed. At its furthest extent, it will measure some 18 miles long, 17 miles wide, and many hundreds of feet high, an unstoppable quilt of depth that cannot be dodged. It will cover a surface area that dwarfs the blast radius of the atomic bomb. This is the true rage of a plenary eruption. It rolls over Herculaneum, Aplantis, and Pompeii in a gigantic, terrifying sweep, but it doesn't stop there, barreling on with tireless energy out onto the water of the bay, racing towards Stabiae in the south and Mycenaeum in the north like a giant hand unfurling its fingers. At this time, Pliny the Elder and the others have navigated the streets and stairways by lamplight down to the coast unharmed. He and his companions head for the docks, where his Liburnia is hopefully still waiting for them, if any of the ships. They find that a sizable crowd has also come down to the piers. Apparently, Pliny's ship was still there at least, as well as the crew, but the prevailing wind is still against them and the sea much too violent for departure. Pliny orders a sailcloth laid down for him somewhere near the beach to await better conditions. In the meantime, he asks for a drink of water. But better conditions are not what come into view. There's just enough morning light to now spot the approaching surge cloud through the fallout. It sends people into a frenzy. Pomponianus must have fled with them, the fight or flight instinct kicking in. Pliny himself rises up, but he must have delayed, the inner naturalist overcoming the realist, 
to gaze for a moment at the awesome vision, a rolling wall almost a thousand feet high, streaked with purple bolts of volcanic lightning, moving toward them like something living. How wonderful this would make for his writings. A huge gust of putrid air like sulfur fills everyone's nostrils, pushed ahead by the surge cloud. It is then that Pliny suddenly becomes hard of breathing. We don't know exactly what it is. It could be poisonous fumes from the cloud, but it seems nobody else with him was being affected. Pliny was older and now out of shape. Perhaps the day's excitement and stress were now claiming him in the form of an asthma attack, maybe even a heart attack. Whatever it is, he collapses. Two loyal slaves, however, have stayed behind. They try to lift him, but he doesn't even have the strength to stand, heaving desperately for air. When he seems to pass out, the slaves frantically try to revive him, but it's now clear. He has died. With the cloud closing in, they have no choice but to abandon his body and run for cover. The scene at the docks may have been absolutely chaotic, with people frantically looking for places to hide or leaping for whatever ship, even warship, that may be trying to depart and brave the surf instead of waiting for the cloud. Moments thereafter, the body of Gaius Plinius Secundus is consumed by Vesuvius, along with at least 70 other people who failed to escape in time. Eighteen miles away at the opposite end of the bay, on the road beyond Mycenum, the Admiral's sister and nephew watch the same vision coming for them, pushing out over the entirety of the Bay of Naples like a dark, billowing electric curtain. They have no idea it has just taken his life, but they must be wondering what has happened to him over there. Free of any fallout, they have the clearest view of what is coming. Pliny describes the surge as a horrible black cloud ripped by sudden bursts of fire, writhing snake-like and revealing sudden flashes larger than lightning. The elder's Spanish friend urges the Pliny family to flee. He says to them, If your brother, if your uncle is still alive, he will want you both to be saved. If he is dead, he would want you to survive him. Why put off your escape? They reply by declaring, We would not think of considering our own safety as long as we were uncertain of his. Seeing that they were dead set in their resolve, he turns and hurries down the road. He came here for a vacation, not for this. In the bluish tint of early morning, the teenaged Pliny now watches the flow overtake the 500-foot-tall outcropping on which rests his uncle's estate, perhaps a mile from them. It engulfs the military harbor and shipyard, and quite possibly the cities of Puteoli and Baie. As it nears their own position and isn't stopping, the crowd panics. To avoid being trampled, Pliny pulls his mother off the road. There, she begs him to leave, to make a run for it. She has lived her life. She would hate to be the reason his comes to an early end. But Pliny refuses, despite her hysteria, and chooses to share in whatever fate will befall his mother. Maybe at the last moment, Pliny looks up at the enormous cloud, swallowing everything and everyone in its path. By this distance, the cloud has lost its heat index as well as its destructive power, but Pliny describes what happens next. We had scarcely sat down when night came upon us, not such as we have when the sky is cloudy or when there is no moon, but that of a sealed room without lights. You might hear the shrieks of women, the screams of children, and the shouts of men, some calling for their children, others for their parents, others for their husbands, and seeking to recognize each other by the voices that replied, one lamenting his own fate, another that of his family, some wishing to die from the very fear of dying, some lifting their hands to the gods, but the greater part convinced that there were now no gods at all, and the final endless night of which we have heard had come upon the world. Unable to see anything in the stifling, claustrophobic blackness, this is what Pliny and his mother have to listen to. They're inside the search cloud. 
It's as if the underworld has emerged to swallow them up. As time goes by, and as the cloud begins to settle, they must routinely brush off and unbury themselves from the ash building up around them. Endless though it may have felt, the night would come to an end. It eventually gives way to a dim gray daylight like an eclipse, as the ash and dust slowly disperse over the course of a few hours. But it hardly alleviates any fear. Dusted with ash, people must look as they did in the immediate aftermath of the Twin Tower collapse in 2001, a zombie land of powdered humans. People are truly shaken and frightened. Pliny recalls that, There were some who augmented the real terrors with others imaginary or willfully invented, I remember some who declared that one part of Mycenaeum had fallen, that another was on fire. It was false, but they found people to believe them. At one point, terror is renewed at the sight of distant fire glowing through the haze. Though Vesuvius is tiring out, stratigraphy will tell us that one, maybe two more minor pyroclastic surges will fall from the mountain, to no effect except to cement the devastation underneath. Pliny and the people at Mycenaeum may have seen these flows from afar, the only consequence being a replenishment of the amount of ash in the air, and darkness descends once more, forcing the process of clearing up to start all over again. Pliny and his mother ultimately return to the elder's estate, wandering through an empty, quiet, and gray home now covered everywhere in deep soot. They manage to find some refreshment and settle down to await news from Pliny the Elder and recover from what they had just lived through. Perhaps the young Pliny goes to his room and unburies some of the schoolwork his uncle gave him, anything to keep busy and kill time. The following day and night, however, are not peaceful. Tremor is continued underfoot, and with each one fear is renewed of another onslaught. But they are only the final shutters of a now exhausted Vesuvius. When the sun does return to Campania, glowing faintly through the ever-diminishing smoke, the landscape has been turned into a wasteland as far as you can see. Survivors at Mycenaeum, Baie, Puteoli, and Neapolis get their first glimpse at what had been happening inside the fallout zone, where once were rich crop fields and vineyards, gardens and wooded glades, is now a vast expanse of gray-white ash. Not a tree is standing. You may recall the thousands of acres of forest smeared flat by Mount St. Helens, but here they are completely buried. Beautiful Campania has become a featureless parking lot for 300 square kilometers, or almost 116 square miles, save for the dark, weary slopes of Vesuvius rising above everything, its top half completely erased. It is now a gaping ovular crater two miles wide from north to south and three miles wide east to west. Ash from the volcano would blow as far away as Egypt and Syria, blurring the sun for a time there too. I've seen similar sights of the sun veiled here in Illinois by forest fires as far away as Alberta, Canada, and that's hardly the atmospheric output of a volcanic eruption. The people of Pompeii lie under a 12 to 20 foot deep blanket of debris. The city itself, touching the coast just 24 hours before, is now more than a mile inland. The people of Herculaneum, who initially saw the least amount of ash from Vesuvius and had spent most of the time beyond the fallout, are buried under 75 feet of new earth. The shoreline pushed out a third of a mile. When you go down into Herculaneum nowadays and see the deposit wall looming overhead, even above the elevated streets of the Roman city, you know you are looking at what was once an open cliff-top view to the Mediterranean. It is now a solid wall of cemented ash. Over time, the weight of the deposit will push Herculaneum 4 meters or 13 feet deeper into the ground and below the water table of the Mediterranean. When Pliny the Younger and his mother finally receive word about the elder Pliny, perhaps from one of his slaves, an officer, or maybe from Pomponianus himself, the Younger doesn't specify, they finally learn that he didn't make it, dashing any hopes for his return. Whoever contacted them also relayed enough information of Pliny the Elder's journey 
for his nephew to remember and write down some 20 years later. The younger Pliny tells us that two days after the eruption, his uncle's body would be recovered precisely where the man was last seen, looking more asleep than dead. There is no real reason to doubt the younger on this matter, but interestingly a body was exhumed on the beach at Stabiae in 1900, leaning against a pillar that appears to be the remains of a military man, complete with sword and panoply, fitting the profile of Pliny the Elder. A more recent test on those original bones still in storage also matches approximate age, and some have tried to make the argument that it is indeed him. As of this recording, I have been unable to find any commentary comparing this discovery with the statement by Pliny the Younger about his uncle's body being recovered. I find it unlikely that a prefect of a Praetorian-class fleet would have been quickly reburied where he was found and wasn't given a proper funeral of cremation in the traditional Roman way. Nonetheless, the speculation is interesting. In the aftermath of the eruption, the reaction to it was enormous. Aid would come from all over the Mediterranean in what is one of humankind's earliest recorded humanitarian efforts. The Senate would pass immediate relief legislation. Even the Emperor Titus came down from Rome to see, if you will, ground zero for himself and help orchestrate recovery operations. Apart from the damage to southern Italy, he may have also been interested in the whereabouts of the old dear friend from his army days, Pliny the Elder. The emperor's devotion to the tragedy is spoken by the fact that he is still in Campania when a fire breaks out in Rome the following year. The capital city of the empire burns for three days, despite the existence of horse-drawn fire engines with twin piston water pumps operated by the city's firefighting brigade, called the Vigiles Urbani. Titus immediately goes to review the damage there, appointing two consuls to continue management of the reconstruction of Campania in his absence which included the laying down of new roads, presumably over the old ones, as best as one could tell. It has been said that no one could remember where whole cities once stood. This apparently was not entirely true. For one, Stabiae would be uncovered and resettled. The tallest buildings in Pompeii would also be exposed, and mining operations into those buildings, as well as the best guess where certain other structures would be, were undertaken to salvage what wealth could be used to finance reconstruction. These tunnels would be found during excavations centuries later, including the bodies of two men buried when one of the tunnels collapsed, perhaps during a tremor. Alongside them was the billows used to pump air into the shaft. Among the wall graffiti found in Pompeii are messages written by miners after the eruption declaring that the house had already been searched. It was often difficult for early modern excavators to tell the difference between actual victims of the eruption and those buried while trying to dig back down. By midday on October 25th, 79 AD, subterranean Pompeii is now a vast graveyard of people. Deep down below, an elderly couple lie buried in bed, hugging one another. The pregnant woman in her final trimester still lies on the sofa in the house of Julius Polybius, surrounded by her family. One of the older men holds the hand of one of the boys. They were never able to reunite with the toddler, older woman, and younger male, trapped on the other side of the wall. Another man, bent forward on his knees outside a laundromat that, according to the sign nearby, belonged to a small business owner named Stephanus, is frozen in time as he desperately clutches his face, trying not to breathe in the ash of the surge cloud. The last of his wealth is scattered on the ground beside him. Perhaps this is Stephanus himself, hoping to preserve what riches he had, his effort to escape coming all too late, like so many others. A small four-year-old boy, found in the corner of a house, is so perfectly preserved in shape that you can still see the folds and creases in his clothing, even the details of his fingernails. Photographs of the director of Pompeii's excavations lifting the toddler's body cast for testing in 2016 are particularly unsettling, a once real person whose original shape is now known only by stone, a concrete ghost. 
with the child's bones still locked inside, and the director holds him as if he were still alive. Near the toddler lie an older child and two adults, presumably the boy's family. The arms of the parents are coiled into a fighter's stance, an effect of the searing heat of the surge cloud on their muscles. On the floor of the house of Cryptoporticus is a pair of young people, the head of one nestled in the bosom of the other. For a long time, they were thought to be two females, but recent DNA tests reveal they are in fact two unrelated males, one roughly 18 years of age and the other 20. Some have speculated they were lovers, but that can only remain speculation. There is no way to know their story for sure, but there was certainly a friendship of sorts between them that they were together in the final moment. In the house of the centenary, another pair, an adult and a youth, are found together. DNA tests from their bones will later show they are in fact father and son. The youth, about 14 years old, died with his mouth ajar as he gasped for air, his head turned toward his father. They hold each other's hand with outstretched arms, fingers entwined. Just above their bodies, a wall painting shows a calm, lonely mountain swathed peacefully in trees and vines. They now lie entombed beneath that mountain's fury. But people are not the only victims. Animals, including horses, swine, and sheep have been uncovered in their pens. A dog, mangled in agony, was still tied to his leash in the backyard when his owners fled. He tried to stay above the growing collection of pumice all around him, but he was eventually stopped short by the length of his tether now stretching beneath him. The hailstorm would continue to pile higher than he was free to climb. He was slowly buried and suffocated to death. Among various insects, seed beetles have been found on the bean stalks they were chewing on. In one Pompeian bakery are the remains of a housefly. Bacteria, too, are victims. When the surge cloud made contact with the people of Pompeii, they were autoclaved while still alive, their lungs, trachea, and mouths sterilized by the heat. Only in the marrow of their bones and in the roots of their teeth do bacteria manage to survive where, deep underground, they will continue to eat until the food runs out some couple hundred years later. They will then go into suspended animation until forensic archaeologists revive them like zombies from the ancient past, reawakened in a time now of airplanes, internet, and space stations. However, not everyone below ground is dead. We do know of two individuals trapped inside Pompeii who actually lived beyond the eruption, a man and his dog. Their bodies will be found entombed below a two-story building that collapsed, but left enough of a protective space for them to survive. Judging from the amount of poop left by the man, he lived in this grave for roughly two weeks, air somehow getting down to him through the twelve or more feet of new earth above. In the complete darkness, he at least had his canine for companionship. If relief crews from Rome ever came near his location, it seems they failed to hear the man and the dog below their feet. Apparently, the man must have tapped into some water source because he did not die of thirst, which would have killed him sooner. We know, too, that the dog was special to him because, even as the man withered from starvation, he refused to kill and eat the animal. When he finally died, the dog was a little more pragmatic and began consuming its master's body, evident from tooth marks on his bones. Judging by the dog's own feces, the creature survived a few more weeks in total darkness beside the cadaver of its master, before it, too, died of starvation. As for Pliny the Younger, he will go to Rome the next year to start work as a defense lawyer at age 18 in the city's Centrumbral Court, a small claims court, and the proving ground for aspiring careerists in the practice of law. He would eventually become a senator, a respected poet, and even the personal overseas representative of the emperor. Twenty years after the eruption, the historian Cornelius Tacitus reached out to Pliny that he may share his experience of the catastrophe for use in what is now a lost work completed by the historian. Pliny responded with a description of his uncle's rescue effort, Tacitus was so moved by what he read that he insisted Pliny write about his own experience that day in Mycenaeum as well. 
which Pliny otherwise thought too unimportant for greater history. Thanks to Tacitus, we can still hear about the effects of the final surge cloud on Mycenum. Those letters would be rediscovered sometime in the 16th century, but Pliny's account would go unbelieved by many, all too fantastic to be real, until modern science would posthumously vindicate him on every single one of his details. What became of his widowed mother after the eruption, we don't know. His letters to Tacitus are the one and only time he ever mentions her in his otherwise abundant literature. It is also possible that we are aware of at least one other witness and survivor of the cataclysm. Above the doorway to the sanctuary of the Isis temple in Pompeii is a plaque. On that plaque is commemorated the name of Numerius Popidius Calcinus, a six-year-old boy who is singled out for having donated the funds to rebuild the temple after it collapsed during the earthquake of 62. Since a six-year-old is unlikely to himself have such gigantic funds, it is likely Calcinus's father, mentioned on the plaque as just Numerius, is the actual donor, and was possibly a freedman who could only make such a donation through his son's name. As an expression of gratitude to Numerius, the boy Calcinus was honorarily put on the city council. By the time Vesuvius erupted, Calcinus would have been in his early twenties, just a few years older than Pliny the Younger was at the time. It has been suggested by authors Alex Butterworth and Ray Lawrence that Calcinus managed to escape Pompeii, certainly before the surge clouds hit, because that same name, Numerius Popidius Calcinus, appears on the tomb of an army veteran uncovered in Spain. If indeed they are the same person, not only did Calcinus go on to serve in the legions, but he was also a Pompeii native who may have regaled his fellow soldiers with his experience of the Vesuvian apocalypse. By the way, it is the strange and often subtle ripple effect of history that Numerius's financing of the reconstruction of the Isis temple, albeit through his son, would have profound effect long after the finishing touches were made. When Mozart visited Pompeii in 1770 on a performance tour at the age of 13, he and his father Leopold stopped at the Temple of Isis, and it is believed that Mozart's memory of the place served as inspiration while writing his opera The Magic Flute. Without Numerius and Calcinus, perhaps Mozart would never have written The Magic Flute, or at least not in the way it manifested, nor any of the other innumerable cultural influences the temple had since its rediscovery in 1764. Much more is owed to these two individuals, and more than they themselves would know, than simply a pretty little temple. Over the next 2,000 years, Vesuvius would have a nearly ceaseless line of activity of varying degrees and intervals. Its next explosive eruption was in 203 AD, then 472, again sometime between 507 to 512, 685, 787, 968, 999, 1007, and 1037, among others. Over that time, a new cone would arise within the original 79 AD crater and gradually make its way down to cover the southern lip. This is the evolution from Mount Soma to Mount Vesuvius as we know it. After the eruption of 1139, however, the volcano goes stone cold. It may have coughed up a sprinkle of ash in 1500, but it effectively lay in dormancy for 450 years. It would reawake in 1631 in its most violent eruption since 79, an eruption that really deserves a podcast of its own. Though the 1631 event was not on the plinier eruption of 79 and is considered only subplinier, it did kill between 6,000 and 10,000 people with lava flows and pyroclastic currents. Vesuvius would then resume a moderate level of fairly frequent activity, as often as every few years, if not every decade, until its silence after 1944. While Vesuvius would continue to terrorize the world above, the Roman cities of Campania remained safely entombed below for over 1,500 years. Over that time, as governments came and went, peoples moved and removed, entire cultures and religions risen or fallen, and even Latin itself evolving away into languages a Roman would not understand, over that time, the memory of the cities evaporated into vague myth and hazy legend. 
medieval villagers unknowingly living above the location of Pompeii called the area La Citta, the city, though many did not know why. That's what it's been called since forever. Other echoes from below would come through. In the early 1500s, a sharp eye spotted an ancient Latin inscription on a stone of the altar steps in the church at Scafati, reading, Cuspius, son of Titus, Marcus Loreus, son of Marcus. In 1592, on the site of La Cita, architect Domenico Fontana was overseeing the construction of a canal when his crew uncovered more stones of human origin. The discovery was shrugged off. Little did Fontana know, he was digging just a few meters away from the 20,000-seat amphitheater of Pompeii. In 1607, the digging of another canal exposed a stone with the inscription Decurio Pompeius, a marker sign for the quarters of a detail, a decurion, of ten cavalrymen. For the first time since 79 AD, Pompeii throws up its own name for all to see, and it should have raised the alarm of what lie beneath. But since the marker, or any other relic yet found, was not valuable art or treasure, it drew little attention. And then, in 1709, a worker digging a well for the new palace of Prince Emmanuel of Elbeuf pulled up several statues, including one of Hercules and another three of women. Herculaneum had been rediscovered, and appropriately with a figure of its namesake. However, it won't be until 30 years later, in 1738, that King Charles of Bourbon takes enough interest to start the first official excavations into that city, much less for archaeological knowledge than for treasure digging. Ten years later, in 1748, workers would uncover columns and paintings in the area of La Cita, and Pompeii now followed Herculaneum in regaining its light to the world above. King Charles immediately ordered excavations to begin there as well. Two years after that, in 1750, the Villa of the Papyri, with its vast collection of scrolls next to Herculaneum, was found to much excitement. Most of the excavating would be concentrated on Pompeii, however, which was ideally suited on mostly open country and buried in soft ash and pumice that was inviting for the shovel. Herculaneum, on the other hand, was even deeper underground, clothed in glass-hard deposits. Moreover, it was directly below the town of Resina, and therefore could only be accessed by thin tunneling forays into the earth from the sides. It is unfortunate that the two cities were discovered before modern archaeological methods. Sites were ransacked of their riches and curiosities. Walls were knocked down. Any statues and jewelry that did not end up in the collections of the ruling elites were pilfered to anyone who might want their own piece of Roman history. Even human bones were distributed like holy relics. Hester Lynch Piozzi, visiting in 1786, recalled, Certain people want to take away the parts, something I too have done, in order to have in my small museum a bone that is more than 17 centuries old. I was observing a French gentleman when I saw him put a human bone in his pocket. Whoever this French gentleman actually was, he was not alone. Even Piozzi inculcates himself, and much has probably been lost forever during early excavations. Nonetheless, the discoveries of Pompeii and Herculaneum led to a renewed interest and fascination with the ancient world. Classical art, fashion, and architecture began to flourish once again, as well as ancient literature. Much of this renewed interest is still echoed in the founding of the United States. This obsession with ancient Rome, not just in the early United States, but among many educated and artistic individuals of the time, has its roots in the rediscovery of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Americans, among others, are direct beneficiaries of this. But it isn't until 1861 that something like modern archaeology begins on these sites. In that year, Giuseppe Fiorelli was made director of the excavations with a work team of some 500 men. He would introduce much more methodical methods to digging out and preserving the ruins. It is he who comes up with the idea to pour plaster into mysterious holes his crew were finding. This was first tried on four hollows, and, after the plaster dried and the surrounding deposits removed, Fiorelli and his workmen were stunned to discover the plaster had taken the shape of human forms. 
After the ash had hardened around the victims, their bodies decomposed and left behind empty pockets in the hard earth. In some cases, bones were still left behind and encased in the plaster casts. This method would become routine practice at Pompeii until the implementation in recent times of more advanced ways of preserving the remains of these ancient Romans, which continued to be among the most intriguing and fascinating relics in all of archaeology. In 79 AD, there was somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 people living in the Greater Bay of Naples area. Today, there are nearly 4 million, more than comparable to placing an explosive of nuclear proportions in the middle of Manhattan Island. Since the Middle Ages, the population of the area has continually grown, and since the 1944 eruption, that population has more than doubled in the brief span thereafter. During those 78 years as of this recording, the volcano has displayed no major or even minor sign of activity, its longest period of deep sleep since the 1631 eruption. When an active volcano lies inactive, it simply means that pressure is building. And the longer we have to wait, the more likely the next show of force will be explosive. Starting about 1970, a vast network of various instruments has been laid down all around the mountain to register even the smallest shift from Vesuvius, including seismographs, tidal gauges, gravity stations that measure rock density, and geochemical monitors. The observatory is on constant watch. Meanwhile, the Italian government has created evacuation plans and worked with experts to more accurately predict when the next eruption will occur. The area around the volcano in these plans has been divided into three zones. The immediate area is the red zone, followed by the outlying yellow zone, and a section on the northeast side of the volcano as the blue zone. Police and soldiers will execute the evacuation with a fleet of vehicles. The plans have been simulated through exercises in 1999, 2001, and again in October 2006. The latter, called Mesomex 2006, was the largest simulation coordinated by the Italian Civil Protection Department, incorporating 1,800 people from across the Red Zone. It included a diverse demography of participants, including nuns, single moms with their children, and young people posing as tourists on vacation. Pompeii alone receives about 3 million visitors a year, let alone Naples and the Amalfi Coast, and tourism is a huge part of the local economy and social life. The exercise went fairly well, but there were dozens of people, mostly from Pompeii and the town of Ercolano, which presently sits over Herculaneum, who were unable to complete the course because heavy rain that day slowed access to the main highways. And heavy rain stands in very well for, if not slightly falling short of, ash and pumice. As proven by just rain showers, no matter how well it sounds in theory, the reality of executing a plan could be a very different beast. For one, the red zone has about 600,000 people living in it. The yellow zone, which does not include Naples and extends mostly to the southeast, still has 1.1 million residents. The blue zone is an additional 180,000 people which alone is more than twice the amount of people living in the entire region 2,000 years ago. In the case of the Red Zone, over half a million men, women, and children are not only squeezed between the volcano and the Mediterranean, but are also directly in the pathway of pyroclastic currents. Half a million people are in the vice, and the logistics to move that many in a small amount of time are colossal. At the moment, the plan calls for 16,000 soldiers and police officers to move 80,000 people a day on 40 lines of train, 81 ships, and 4,000 vehicles, transporting the equivalent of a minor city to designated safe zones where emergency tent villages will have to be erected and sustenance provided. If the eruption threatens the yellow zone, that's an additional 1 million people. Even during a time of calm, such an evacuation is an organizational nightmare, and it's entirely betting that the local people will show discipline and cooperation in the face of danger. Do you think that's likely? To further complicate an already complicated scenario, there is the indifference of the population that sees the mountain as a beloved mascot. Most people take such issues as public services, 
trash collection, crime, unemployment, and traffic to be a greater concern than Vesuvius. A survey in 2013 asked local residents to identify a nearby active volcano and its latest year of activity. 89% correctly identified Vesuvius and 64% rightfully called out 1944 as its most recent date of eruption. This is good news, but 11%, or 1 in 10 people, still didn't know that Vesuvius is an active volcano and a third were unaware of the time of its most recent activity. This number is an increase from a similar survey conducted in 2008, just five years before. People are getting complacent and ignorant of their hostile neighbor, and there will always be more and more fresh generations to further forget about it. Moreover, there seems to be the belief that Vesuvius has gone extinct. This belief has also been helped by contractors who have illegally been allowed to raise new buildings and homes higher and higher up the volcano's slopes, and with whom there is a vested interest in propagating the lie that Vesuvius poses no threat to would-be buyers. Business overrules safety in Campania. Even if they don't believe the volcano is extinct, many people have instead a fatalistic attitude about Vesuvius that comes with the shrug of the shoulders. What can we really do about it? Additionally, as the population doubled in the post-war years, people who were lured in by government industrial projects and employment schemes were lodged in cheap, unattractive, and often illegally constructed apartment blocks that did not meet construction codes by any standard. Safeguards have been imposed since 1993 to turn this around, but there are still many, many buildings that are not only very old, but will surely fail to stand up to a powerful onslaught from Vesuvius, which includes earthquakes. Among so many concerns is the issue of false alarms. If an evacuation is conducted too early or without consequence from the volcano, people's patience to stay clear will extinguish rapidly, especially when their possessions are left unguarded. If conducted too late, fatalities will be blamed on government and scientific leadership. Even a moment's hesitation to evacuate, just to be sure it's the real thing, will be held equal to disregarding human life. It is the predictably fickle nature of humankind that no one can win over. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. For example, the American government, both federal and local, found it difficult in 2006, the same year as the Masomex drill, by the way, to persuade people to leave New Orleans before Katrina, a Category 5 Atlantic hurricane, made landfall. The thing to note about Category 5 hurricanes is that there's no Category 6. Many decided to remain, either not believing the threat, or had nowhere to go, or felt best to simply stay put with their property. Still others, like the elderly and handicapped, found themselves without the choice to flee. Additionally, then-mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagin, was worried the city would find itself in a lawsuit if a forced evacuation turned out to be unnecessary. These are the same worries that will trouble a forecast of a Vesuvian eruption. Weighing the costs of evacuation versus the benefits falls to a few individuals, and their decisions must be the result of flawless communication between experts, officials, and the media. Any misunderstanding or miscommunication can easily prompt reactions that will worsen the scenario. Scientific jargon can easily be lost in translation. Relations between Italian officials and Earth scientists are not always the warmest either. After an earthquake shook the city of L'Aquila in central Italy in 2009, killing 300 people while injuring a further 1,500 and rendering homeless more than 65,000 residents, six scientists whose guidance had been sought before the earthquake, were arrested and convicted of involuntary manslaughter. Their convictions were overturned in an appeals court in 2014, but the message was clear. Fail to get it right, and you will be punished. A meteorologist's worst nightmare. So not only are false alarms now a matter of personal preservation, but they will surely sow distrust between the population and officials if people are whisked away for nothing and at great financial cost. This cannot be afforded at all, because when the real thing does arrive, few people may give any heed to warnings or will believe that disaster will not strike their particular neighborhood. In the words of author Alwyn Scarth, when the crisis comes, they will be playing Russian roulette with the volcano, 
and it is not a game that volcanoes usually lose. So far, no further drills have happened since 2006, 16 years ago as of this recording. There are now kids in high school who have never seen a civil protection exercise. What will probably happen when Vesuvius awakes is panic. People will want to go to the nearest place of safety, which will surely be perceived as Naples. The city will swell with tens of thousands of frightened, wandering refugees with no place to go. Roads will become impassable with traffic jams, and in a place where many urban roads are only small two-lane streets. Not only will it impede escape, but it will prevent rescuers from quickly entering the red zone. Darkness from the fallout will exacerbate the panic and confusion, even more so when the electric grid fails. Cell phones will probably lose reception. Cars will have to be abandoned as pumice and ash smother engines and render driving impossible as it builds up on the asphalt. Trains will be overloaded with passengers cramming into the cars with their baggage, children, and pets. Looting may also be prominent as a gigantic swath of homes, hotels, and businesses are left undefended. People obediently waiting in queues at evacuation points may give it up and start the long trek on foot or try to catch a ride elsewhere. Similarly, one also has to wonder just how long police and soldiers will stay to keep order as the danger increases and their interest in guarding property or directing traffic wanes for the more pressing and instinctive urge to save themselves. One doesn't usually want to test just how far the time of safety will last, only to have crossed over and face assured annihilation by live burial or heat death. As we know, once the pyroclastic flows arrive, anyone still around will be asphyxiated, if not outright incinerated, for many square kilometers, conceivably thousands of people, even tens of thousands. And the aftermath may be just as chaotic, with hundreds of thousands now homeless, reconstruction could take many months, which means supporting and supplying a huge population of refugees with all the problems that logistics brings. A major effort to recover victims of the eruption will undoubtedly be underway on a surface area many times greater than what took place in the confined space of Lower Manhattan after September 11, 2001. There could also very well be clandestine corruption and profiteering in such a large-scale real estate effort. There's always money to be made from disasters and the unscrupulous characters happy to do it. Beside plans for evacuation, there have also been attempts to straight-up depopulate the area. It's easier to evacuate people if there's less of them. In 2003, the regional urban assessor, Marco Di Lelo, put into motion a decongestion plan to reduce the population of the red zone by 20%. This would be accomplished by giving a cash incentive between 20,000 and 30,000 euros to use as a down payment for new residents beyond the danger zone. In other words, we will pay you to leave. In its first two years, just over 5,600 families took up the offer, a number totaling 25,000 people, or just 4% of the red zone population. As to why so few, or at least much fewer than was hoped for, had responded to the incentive, perhaps the offer of 30,000 euros was too small, or that residents did not feel that Vesuvius is enough of a threat to warrant leaving the area. Marco Di Lelo originally believed the offer would appeal to young people, the older generation too entrenched to leave their lifelong homes. But it was mostly the older generations who responded, those who could remember Vesuvius as an active volcano. It didn't help either that at the same time, local administrations were offering grants for young couples to purchase homes in the area, a conflict of interest that has confused locals about regional priorities. It has also been suggested to build walls as barriers against pyroclastic flows. It will take such flows between 5 and 10 minutes to travel across the entire area, as we know from Pompeii and Herculaneum. A volcanic simulator developed by Flavio Dobran who had been trying to bring awareness to the danger, indicated it would take two walls, almost 100 feet high, to stop the downblast of a collapsing eruption column. One wall placed a mile and a half from the volcano, and the other at two and a half miles, both stretching across the entire red zone. 
Absurd as that might look, some have suggested instead that these Game of Thrones type walls are not needed at all, and that the density of the urban area itself would act as an impenetrable barrier with its many blocks of multi story buildings that go all the way to the coast. The irony is that buildings constructed for business and for families also serve the dual purpose of acting as impact absorbers. Flavio Dobran's volcanic simulator has also predicted an eruption at least on the magnitude of that which took place in 1631. Thus, evacuation plans are assuming a subplinear eruption. But Dobran predicts warning signs will begin only a week before the eruption, and not two to three weeks as needed by existing plans. Deadly as the 1631 event was, if the next activity happens to be a plinear eruption on the scale of 79 AD, the plan will be wholly insufficient. Stratigraphy tells us that Vesuvius has a plinear eruption roughly every 2,000 years, which means we are coming up on the due date. If the evacuation does not go as planned, or doesn't have enough time to get underway, it will easily be the worst disaster in human history thus far, and we are ticking closer to it every day. As a matter of trivia, 2079 will be the two millennium anniversary of Pompeii and Herculaneum, but it could be sooner than that. One model based on the intervals of eruption suggests 2040 as the nearest date of activity, though it could be delayed until 2064. Another based on seismic activity says 2030, and a third model based on the cumulative energy released after 1631 warns it could be as soon as 2023, one year from this recording. Volcanoes that begin a violent habit usually keep it, and the next eruption is going to be even better recorded than that of 1944, with satellites, news cameras, and cell phones by the hundreds of thousands to capture all of its horrors on live stream. A study into the eruption of 79 is a foreshadowing of what may very well occur in the near future. Because it's going to happen again, it's a geologic certainty. Many people today may not notice, let alone be able to read, a warning from the survivors of the 1631 eruption, which was commissioned on a tablet by the Count of Monterey that still stands at a street intersection in Portici. Written in Latin, it reads, This concerns you. One day carries a torch for another, and the day before yesterday for the day after tomorrow. Take note, twenty times since the creation of the sun, if history does not tell fables, Vesuvius has burned, always causing immense destruction to those who hesitate. I issue a warning, so that it may not catch people unawares henceforth. This mountain has a womb, pregnant with bitumen, alum, iron, sulfur, gold, silver, nitre, springs of water. Sooner or later, it will catch fire, and as the sea flows in, it will give birth. But beforehand, it goes into labor. It is shaken, and it shakes the ground. Flee while you may. It is on the point of bringing forth. It erupts. It spews out a lake mixed with fire. It rushes in a headlong flow and prevents tardy escape. If it catches you, it is all over. You are lost. In the year of salvation, 1631, December 17th, when Philip IV was king and Emmanuel Fonseca and Zunica, Count of Monterey, was viceroy, and when the disaster of earlier times was repeated, and when relief from the disaster was provided more humanely, if the mountain is feared, it saves. If it is scorned, it destroys the unwary and the greedy, for whom home and possessions are more important than life. You, if you are wise must listen to the stone that shouts. Ignore your homes. Ignore your belongings. Flee without delay. As of this recording, almost 1,200 bodies have been found in Pompeii. Nearly 400 have been exhumed at Herculaneum and various others around Campania. Though each has a story to tell, and I have tried to share as many as I could find, not a single one of them is known by name. Only a few have been inferred by names written on nearby walls, but it can't be certain. Roughly two-thirds of Pompeii's surface area has been excavated, leaving another third still locked in the ash that mummified it. And almost three-quarters of Herculaneum remains buried beneath modern high-rise buildings. 
unless some technology allows us to peer into the earth and see everything that lies below without having to dig, it is likely that part of the city will never see daylight again. Presumably, many more bodies lie interred within these areas, along with their stories, and possibly hundreds more, maybe even thousands, remain buried in the surrounding countryside, those who tried to flee but were undone by slow speed, or had become lost, or because of a late decision to leave. Volcanologist Harald Sigerson estimates as many as 18,000 fell victim to Vesuvius in 79 AD. It is likely these men, women, boys, and girls will never be found, and have joined the billions upon billions of people across time who are completely erased from historical memory and are no longer known to anyone, just as we shall be. At least the Vesuvius victims have the chance, albeit slim, but still the chance of re-emerging, assuming a bulldozer or a plow, doesn't finalize their elimination. New roadworks and construction projects occasionally reveal one or two of these unfortunate refugees. When author Charles Dickens visited Pompeii in February of 1845, he would instruct the reader to stand at the bottom of the great marketplace of Pompeii and look up the silent streets through the ruined temples of Jupiter and Isis, over the broken houses with their inmost sanctuaries open to the day, away to Mount Vesuvius, bright and snowy in the peaceful distance, and lose all count of time and heed of other things in the strange and melancholy sensation of seeing the destroyed and the destroyer making this quiet picture in the sun. Then see at every turn the little familiar tokens of human habitation and everyday pursuits, the chafing of the bucket rope in the stone rim of the exhausted well, the track of carriage wheels in the pavement of the street, the marks of drinking vessels on the stone counter of the wine shop, the amphorae in the private cellars, stored away so many hundred years ago and undisturbed to this hour. Every single body in Pompeii, in Herculaneum, and elsewhere in Campania has a life they could tell us, if somehow resurrected. These people were once as real as the people around us. The only difference is a difference in time. They were born then, and we are born now and people will be born after we ourselves are long gone, looking upon our bodies and our time just as we look and think upon these Romans, both disconnected yet connected. I remember being struck by the thought when I visited these sites that I was actually looking at Romans, real Romans. They knew of emperors, legions, swords, and gods no longer worshipped. If only we could return their muscle tissue, their flesh, and their personalities, to reanimate them. It's the closest I have ever been to seeing ghosts. Their world was somewhat different, but people remain the same, and we are only subject to our circumstances, which change only superficially. Clothing, languages, governments, religions, technology, and understanding will shift over time, but so far, in the end, we are still the people who clasp their beloved other cornered in a boathouse or the people who leave other humans in the detention center of a barracks, or the young woman who consoles another person's child when terror descends, or those who leave their dog to die bound to its chain, or he who refuses to kill his dog while they starve together. The thing about these ruins is they show everything about the human experience, the good, the bad, and everything in between. Nothing has really changed in 2,000 years, and one could feel as at home inside any one of these expensive villas or cheap apartments in these Roman cities as one might feel today. Some of them are so well preserved they could almost be marketed again for private residence. In 79 AD, you could go to the gym, or take your clothes to the laundromat, or sit down at a restaurant discussing politics or griping about family drama while you look over the menu. This is the simple human experience, and so it shall ever be. Thank you for joining me on this journey. Ruin spread throughout a city built within two miles of the volcano's peak and ignoring its tragic history. They move to safe havens, but they'll come back. Each generation seems to forget this horror, Though once in every century, the cycle of the volcano's activity seems certain to reach a period of unpredictable danger. The 
crater pours forth its blackish pall in giant clouds of lava dust. But it covers the land with precious ash that makes the earth fertile. And grapes will grow again to produce a wealth of wine. So the people will return and defiantly rebuild their homes on the slopes of the threatening volcano. They call the slopes the happy land. And all Italy prays that happier days will come once more with the end of this devastating